Story 129 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Boat Harbor, Houston, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Four Skillful Brothers. There was once a poor man who had four sons, and when they were grown up he said to them, My dear children, you must now go out into the world, for I have nothing to give you. So set out, and go to some distance, and learn a trade, and see how you can make your way. So the four brothers took their sticks, bade their father farewell, and went through the town gate together. When they had traveled for some time, they came to a crossway which branched off in four different directions. Then said the eldest, Here we must separate, but on this day four years we will meet each other again at this spot, and in the meantime we will seek our fortunes. Then each of them went his way, and the eldest met a man who asked him where he was going, and what was he intending to do. I want to learn a trade, he replied. Then the other said, Come with me and be a thief. No, he answered, that is no longer regarded as a reputable trade, and the end of it is that one has to swing on the gallows. Oh, said the man, you need not be afraid of the gallows. I will only teach you to get such things as no other man could ever lay hold of, and no one will ever detect you. So he allowed himself to be talked into it, and while with the man became an accomplished thief, and so dexterous that nothing was safe from him, if he once desired to have it. The second brother met a man who put the same question to him what he wanted to learn in the world. I don't know yet, he replied. Then come with me and be an astronomer. There is nothing better than that, for nothing is hid from you. He liked the idea, and became such a skillful astronomer, that when he had learnt everything, and was about to travel onwards, his master gave him a telescope, and said to him, With that you canst thou see whatsoever takes place either on earth or in heaven, and nothing can remain concealed from thee. A huntsman took the third brother into training, and gave him such excellent instruction in everything which related to huntsmanship, that he became an experienced hunter. When he went away, his master gave him a gun, and said, It will never fail you. Whatsoever you aim at, you are certain to hit. The youngest brother also met a man who spoke to him, and inquired what his intentions were. Would you not like to be a tailor? said he. Not that I know him, said the youth, sitting doubled up from morning till night, driving the needle and the goose backwards and forwards, is not to my taste. Oh, but you are speaking in ignorance, answered the man. With me you would learn a very different kind of tailoring, which is respectable and proper, and for the most part very honorable. So he let himself be persuaded, and went with the man, and learnt his art from the very beginning. When they parted, the man gave the youth a needle, and said, With this you can sew together whatever is given you whether it is as soft as an egg or as hard as steel it will all become one piece of stuff so that no seam will be visible when the appointed four years were over the four brothers arrived at the same time at the crossroads embraced and kissed each other and returned home to their father so now said he quite delighted the winds has blown you back again to me they told him of all that had happened to them, and that each had learned his own trade. Now they were sitting just in front of the house under a large tree, and the father said, I will put you all to the test and see what you can do. Then he looked up and said to his second son, Between two branches up at the top of this tree there is a chaffinch's nest. Tell me how many eggs are in it. The astronomer took his glass, looked up, and said, There are five. Then the father said to the eldest, Fetch the eggs down without disturbing the bird which is sitting hatching them. The skillful thief climbed up and took the five eggs from beneath the bird, which never observed what he was doing, and remained quietly sitting where she was, and brought them down to his father. The father took them and put one of them on each corner of the table, and the fifth in the middle, and said to the huntsman, With one shot thou shalt shoot me the five eggs in two, through the middle. The huntsman aimed and shot the eggs, all five as the father had desired, and that at one shot. 
He certainly must have had some of the power for shooting round corners. Now it's your turn, said the father of the fourth son. You shall sew the eggs together again, and the young birds that are inside them as well, and you must do it so that they are not hurt by the shot. The tailor brought his needle and sewed them as his father wished. When he had done this, the thief had to climb up the tree again and carry them to the nest, and put them back again under the bird without her being aware of it. The bird sat her full time, and after a few days the young ones crept out, and they had a red line round their necks where they had been sewn together by the tailor. Well, said the old man to his sons, I begin to think you are worth more than Breen Clover. You have used your time well and learnt something good. I can't say which of you deserves the most praise. That will be proved if you have but an early opportunity of using your talents. Not long after this, there was a great uproar in the country, for the king's daughter was carried off by a dragon. The king was full of trouble about it, both by day and night, and caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever brought her back should have her to wife. The four brothers said to each other, This would be a fine opportunity for us to show what we can do, and resolved to go forth together and liberate the king's daughter. I will soon know where she is, said the astronomer, and looked through his telescope and said, I see her already. She is far away from here on a rock in the sea, and the dragon is beside her watching her. Then he went to the king and asked for a ship for himself and his brothers, and sailed with them over the sea until they came to a rock. There the king's daughter was sitting, and the dragon was lying asleep on her lap. The huntsman said, I dare not fire. I should kill the beautiful maiden at the same time. Then I will try my art, said the thief, and he crept thither and stole her away from under the dragon, so quietly and dexterously that the monster never remarked it, but went on snoring. Full of joy, they hurried off with her on board ship and steered out into the open sea. But the dragon, who when he awoke found no princess there, followed them and came snorting angrily through the air. Just as he was circling above the ship and about to descend on it, the huntsman shouldered his gun and shot him in the heart. The monster fell down dead, but was so large and powerful that his fall shattered the whole ship. Fortunately, however, they laid hold of a couple of planks and swam about the wide sea. Then again they were in great peril, but the tailor, who was not idle, took his wondrous needle, and with a few stitches sewed the planks together, and they seated themselves upon them, and collected together all the fragments of the vessel. Then he sewed these so skillfully together, that in a very short time the ship was once more seaworthy, and they could go home again in safety. When the king once more saw his daughter, there were great rejoicings. He said to the four brothers, One of you shall have her to wife, but which of you it is to be you must settle among yourselves. Then a warm contest arose among them, for each of them preferred his own claim. The astronomer said, If I had not seen the princess, all your arts would have been useless, so she is mine. The thief said, What would have been the use of your seeing if I had not got her away from the dragon, so she is mine? The huntsman said, you and the princess, and all of you, would have been torn to pieces by the dragon if my ball had not hit him, so she is mine. The tailor said, And if I, by my art, had not sewn the ship together again, you would all of you have been miserably drowned, so she is mine. Then the king uttered to the saying, Each of you has an equal right, and as all of you cannot have the maiden, none of you shall have her, but I will give to each of you a, as a reward half a kingdom. The brothers were pleased with this decision, and said, It is better thus than that we should be at variance with each other. Then each of them received half a kingdom, and they lived with their father in the greatest happiness, as long as it pleased God. End of story 129「Story 130 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. One Eye, Two Eyes, and Three Eyes. There was once a woman who had three daughters, 
the eldest of whom was called One-Eye because she had only one eye in the middle of her forehead, and the second, Two Eyes, because she had two eyes like other folks, and the youngest, Three Eyes, because she had three eyes and her third eye was also in the center of her forehead. However, as Two Eyes saw just as other human beings did, her sisters and her mother could not endure her. They said to her, Thou with thy two eyes art no better than the common people. Thou dost not belong to us. They pushed her about and threw old clothes to her and gave her nothing to eat but what they left and did everything they could to make her unhappy. It came to pass that two eyes had to go out into the fields and tend the goat, but she was still quite hungry because her sisters had given her so little to eat. So she sat down on a ridge and began to weep and so bitterly that two streams ran down from her eyes. And once, when she looked up in her grief, a woman was standing beside her, who said, Why art thou weeping, little Two Eyes? Two Eyes answered, Have I not reason to weep, when I have two eyes like other people, and my sisters and mother hate me for it, and push me from one corner to another, throw old clothes at me, and give me nothing to eat but the scraps they leave? Today they have given me so little that I am still quite hungry. Then the wise woman said, Wipe away thy tears, two eyes, and I will tell thee something to stop thee ever suffering from hunger again. Just say to thy goat, Bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat. And then a clean, well-spread little table will stand before thee, with the most delicious food upon it, of which thou mayst eat as much as thou art inclined for. And when thou hast had enough, and hast no more need of the little table, just say, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And then it will vanish again from thy sight. Hereupon the wise woman departed. But two eyes thought, I must instantly make a trial, and see if what she said is true, for I am far too hungry. And she said, Bleat, my little goat, bleat, cover the table with something to eat. And scarcely had she spoken the words than a little table covered with a white cloth was standing there, and on it was a plate with a knife and fork and a silver spoon, and the most delicious food was there also, warm and smoking as if it had just come out of the kitchen. Then Two Eyes said the shortest prayer she knew, Lord God, be with us always, Amen, and helped herself to some food and enjoyed it. And when she was satisfied, she said, as the wise woman had taught her, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And immediately the little table and everything on it was gone again. That is a delightful way of keeping house, thought Two Eyes, and was quite glad and happy. In the evening, when she went home with her goat, she found a small earthenware dish with some food, which her sisters had set ready for her, but she did not touch it. Next day, she again went out with her goat, and left the few bits of broken bread which had been handed to her, lying untouched. The first and second time that she did this, her sisters did not remark it at all, but as it happened every time, they did observe it, and said, There was something wrong about Two Eyes. She always leaves her food untasted, and she used to eat up everything that was given her. She must have discovered other ways of getting food. In order that they might learn the truth, they resolved to send one eye with two eyes when she went to drive her goat to the pasture, to observe what two eyes did when she was there, and whether any one brought her anything to eat and drink. So when two eyes set out the next time, one eye went to her and said, I will go with you to the pasture and see that the goat is well taken care of, and driven where there is food. But two eyes knew what was in one eye's mind, and drove the goat into high grass and said, Come, One Eye, we will sit down, and I will sing something to you. One Eye sat down, and was tired with the unaccustomed walk and the heat of the sun, and Two Eyes sang constantly, One Eye, wakest thou? One Eye, sleepest thou? Until One Eye shut her one eye, and fell asleep, and as soon as Two Eyes saw that One Eye was fast asleep and could discover nothing, she said, Bleat, my little goat, bleat, cover the table with something to eat and seated herself at her table, and ate and drank until she was satisfied, and then she again cried, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And in an instant all was gone. Two eyes now awakened one eye, and said, One eye, you want to take care of the goat, and go to sleep while you are doing it, 
and in the meantime the goat might run all over the world. Come, let us go home again. So they went home, and again two eyes let her little dish stand untouched, and one eye could not tell her mother why she would not eat it, and to excuse herself said, I fell asleep when I was out. Next day the mother said to three eyes, This time thou shalt go and observe if two eyes eats anything when she is out, and if any one fetches her food and drink, for she must eat and drink in secret. So three eyes went to two eyes and said, I will go with you and see if the goat is taken proper care of and driven where there is food. But two eyes knew what was in three eyes' mind and drove the goat into high grass and said, We will sit down and I will sing something to you, three eyes. Three eyes sat down and was tired with the walk and with the heat of the sun, and two eyes began the same song as before and sang, Three eyes, are you waking? But then, instead of singing, Three eyes, are you sleeping? As she ought to have done, she thoughtlessly sang, Two eyes, are you sleeping? And sang all the time, Three eyes, are you waking? Two eyes, are you sleeping? Then two of the eyes which three eyes had shut and fell asleep, but the third, as it had not been named in the song, did not sleep. It is true that three eyes shut it, but only in her cunning to pretend it was asleep too, but it blinked and could see everything very well, and when two eyes thought that three eyes was fast asleep, she used her little charm. Bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat. And ate and drank as much as her heart desired, and then ordered the table to go away again. Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And three eyes had seen everything. Then two eyes came to her, waked her, and said, Have you been asleep, three eyes? You are a good caretaker. Come, we will go home. And when they got home, two eyes again did not eat, and three eyes said to the mother, Now I know why that high-minded thing there does not eat. When she is out, she says to the goat, Bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat. And then a little table appears before her, covered with the best of food, much better than any we have here, and when she has eaten all she wants, she says, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And all disappears. I watched everything closely. She put two of my eyes to sleep by using a certain form of words, but luckily the one in my forehead kept awake. Then the envious mother cried, Dost thou want to fare better than we do? The desire shall pass away. And she fetched a butcher's knife and thrust it into the heart of the goat, which fell down dead. When two eyes saw that, she went out full of trouble, seated herself on the ridge of grass at the edge of the field, and wept bitter tears. Suddenly the wise woman once more stood by her side and said, Two eyes, why art thou weeping? Have I not reason to weep, she answered. The goat which covered the table for me every day when I spoke your charm has been killed by my mother, and now I shall again have to bear hunger and want. The wise woman said, Two eyes, I will give thee a piece of good advice. Ask thy sisters to give thee the entrails of the slaughtered goat, and bury them in the ground in front of the house, and thy fortune will be made. Then she vanished, and two eyes went home and said to her sisters, Dear sisters, do give me some part of my goat. I do not wish for what is good, but give me the entrails. Then they laughed and said, If that is all you want, you can have it. So two eyes took the entrails and buried them quietly in the evening in front of the house door, as the wise woman had counseled her to do. Next morning, when they all awoke and went to the house door, there stood a strangely magnificent tree, with leaves of silver and fruit of gold hanging among them, so that in all the wide world there was nothing more beautiful or precious. They did not know how the tree could have come there during the night, but two eyes saw that it had grown up out of the entrails of the goat, for it was standing on the exact spot where she had buried them. Then the mother said to one eye, Climb up, my child, and gather some of the fruit of the tree for us. One eye climbed up, but when she was about to get hold of one of the golden apples, the branch escaped from her hands, and that happened each time, so that she could not pluck a single apple, let her do what she might. Then said the mother, Three eyes, do you climb up? You, with your three eyes, can look about you better than one eye. 
One eye slipped down and three eyes climbed up. Three eyes was not more skillful and might search as she liked, but the golden apples always escaped her. At length the mother grew impatient and climbed up herself, but could get hold of the fruit no better than one eye and three eyes, for she always clutched empty air. Then said two eyes, I will just go up, perhaps I may succeed better. The sisters cried, You indeed with your two eyes, what can you do? But two eyes climbed up, and the golden apples did get out of her way, but came into her hand of their own accord, so that she could pluck them one after the other, and brought a whole apron full down with her. The mother took them away from her, and instead of treating poor two eyes any better for this, she and one eye and three eyes were only envious, because two eyes alone had been able to get the fruit, and they treated her still more cruelly. It so befell that once, when they were all standing together by the tree, a young knight came up. "'Quick, two eyes!' cried the two sisters. "'Creep under this, and don't disgrace us!' and with all speed they turned an empty barrel which was standing close by the tree over poor two eyes, and they pushed the golden apples which she had been gathering under it too. When the knight came nearer, he was a handsome lord, who stopped and admired the magnificent gold and silver tree, and said to the two sisters, To whom does this fine tree belong? Any one who would bestow one branch of it on me might in return for it ask whatsoever he desired. Then one eye and three eyes replied that the tree belonged to them, and that they would give him a branch. They both took great trouble, but they were not able to do it, for the branches and fruit both moved away from them every time. Then, said the knight, it is very strange that the tree should belong to you, and that you should still not be able to break a piece off. They again asserted that the tree was their property. Whilst they were saying so, two eyes rolled out a couple of golden apples from under the barrel to the feet of the knight, for she was vexed with one eye and three eyes for not speaking the truth. When the knight saw the apples, he was astonished and asked where they came from. One eye and three eyes answered that they had another sister, who was not allowed to show herself, for she had only two eyes, like any common person. The knight, however, desired to see her and cried, Two eyes, come forth. Then two eyes, quite comforted, came from beneath the barrel, and the knight was surprised at her great beauty, and said, Thou, two eyes, canst certainly break off a branch from the tree for me? Yes, replied two eyes, that I certainly shall be able to do, for the tree belongs to me. And she climbed up, and with the greatest ease, broke off a branch with beautiful silver leaves and golden fruit, and gave it to the knight. Then said the knight, Two eyes, what shall I give thee for it? Alas, answered two eyes, I suffer from hunger and thirst, grief and want, from early morning till late night. If you would take me with you, and deliver me from these things, I should be happy. So the knight lifted two eyes on to his horse, and took her home with him to his father's castle, and there he gave her beautiful clothes, and meat and drink to her heart's content, and as he loved her so much, he married her and the wedding was solemnized with great rejoicing. When Two Eyes was thus carried away by the handsome knight, her two sisters grudged her good fortune in downright earnest. The wonderful tree, however, still remains with us, thought they, and even if we can gather no fruit from it, still every one will stand still and look at it and come to us and admire it. Who knows what good things may be in store for us? But next morning the tree had vanished, and all their hopes were at an end. And when Two Eyes looked out of the window of her own little room, to her great delight it was standing in front of it, and so it had followed her. Two Eyes lived a long time in happiness. Once two poor women came to her in her castle and begged for alms. She looked in their faces and recognized her sisters, one eye and three eyes, who had fallen into such poverty that they had to wander about and beg their bread from door to door. Two eyes, however, made them welcome, and was kind to them, and took care of them, so that they both, with all their hearts, repented the evil that they had done their sister in their youth. End of story 130「Story 131 of Household Tales」。This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rocktie. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Fair Katrinelle and Piff Paff Poultry. Good day, Father Rolente. Many thanks, Piff Paff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your daughter? Oh, yes, if Mother Malcho, Milch Cow, Brother High and Mighty, Sister Käsetraut and Fair Katrinelle are willing, you can have her. Where is Mother Malcho then? She's in the cow house, milking the cow. Good day, Mother Malcho. Many thanks, Piff Puff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your daughter? Oh, yes, if Father Holente, Brother High and Mighty, Sister Käsetraut and Fair Katrinelle are willing, you can have her. Where is Brother High and Mighty, then? He's in the room, chopping some wood. Good day, Brother High and Mighty. Many thanks, Piff Puff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your sister? Oh, yes, if Father Holente, Mother Malcho, Sister Käsetraut and Fair Katrinelle are willing, you can have her. Where is Sister Käsetraut, then? She's in the garden, cutting cabbages. Good day, Sister Käsetraut. Many thanks, Piff Puff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your sister? Oh, yes, if Father Holente, Mother Malcho, Brother High and Mighty and Fair Katrinelle are willing, you may have her. Where is Fair Katrinelle, then? She's in the room counting out her farthings. Good day, Fair Katrinelle. Many thanks, Piff Puff Poultry. Wilt thou be my bride? Oh, yes, if Father Holente, Mother Malcho, Brother High and Mighty, and Sister Käsetraut are willing, I am ready. Fair Katrinelle, how much dowry do hast thou? Fourteen farthings in ready money, three and a half groschen owing to me, half a pound of dried apples, a handful of fried bread, and a handful of spices. And many other things are mine. Have I not a dowry fine? Piff puff poultry, what is thy trade? Art thou a tailor? Something better. A shoemaker? Something better. A husbandman? Something better. A joiner? Something better. A smith? Something better. A miller? Something better. Perhaps a broommaker? Yes, that's what I am. Is it not a fine trade? End of story 131。Story 132 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Fox and the Horse. A peasant had a faithful horse, which had grown old and could do no more work. So his master would no longer give him anything to eat, and said, I can certainly make no more use of thee, but still I mean well by thee. If thou provest thyself still strong enough to bring me a lion here, I will maintain thee. But now take thyself away out of my stable. And with that he chased him into the open country. The horse was sad, and went to the forest to seek a little protection there from the weather. Then the fox met him and said, why dost thou hang thy head so, and go about all alone? Alas, replied the horse, avarice and fidelity do not dwell together in one house. My master has forgotten what services I have performed for him for so many years, and because I can no longer plough well, he will give me no more food, and has driven me out. "'Without giving thee a chance?' asked the fox. "'The chance was a bad one. "'He said, if I were still strong enough to bring him a lion, "'he would keep me. "'But he well knows that I cannot do that.' "'The fox said, "'I will help thee. "'Just lay thyself down. "'Stretch thyself out, as if thou were dead, 
and do not stir. The horse did as the fox desired, and the fox went to the lion, who had his den not far off, and said, A dead horse is lying outside there. Just come with me. Thou canst have a rich meal. The lion went with him, and when they were both standing by the horse, the fox said, After all, it is not very comfortable for thee here. I tell thee what, I will fasten it to thee by the tail, and then thou canst drag it into thy cave, and devour it in peace. This advice pleased the lion. He lay down, and in order that the fox might tie the horse fast to him, he kept quite quiet. But the fox tied the lion's legs together with the horse's tail, and twisted and fastened all so well, and so strongly, that no strength could break it. When he had finished his work, he tapped the horse on the shoulder and said, Pull, white horse, pull! Then up sprang the horse at once, and drew the lion away with him. The lion began to roar, so that all the birds in the forest flew out in terror, but the horse let him roar, and drew him and dragged him over the country to his master's door. When the master saw the lion, he was of a better mind, and said to the horse, Thou shalt stay with me, and farewell. And he gave him plenty to eat, until he died. End of story 132「Story 133 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Shoes That Were Danced to Pieces. There was once upon a time a king who had twelve daughters, each one more beautiful than the other. They all slept together in one chamber in which their beds stood side by side, and every night when they were in them the king locked the door and bolted it. But in the morning when he unlocked the door, he saw that their shoes were worn out with dancing, and no one could find out how that had come to pass. Then the king caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever could discover where they danced at night should choose one of them for his wife and be king after his death, but that whosoever came forward and had not discovered it within three days and nights should have forfeited his life. It was not long before a king's son presented himself and offered to undertake the enterprise. He was well received and in the evening was led into a room adjoining the princess's sleeping chamber. His bed was placed there, and he was to observe where they went and danced, and in order that they might do nothing secretly or go away to some other place, the door of their room was left open. But the eyelids of the prince grew heavy as lead, and he fell asleep, and when he awoke in the morning all twelve had been to the dance, for their shoes were standing there with holes in the soles. On the second and third nights it fell out just the same, and then his head was struck off without mercy. Many others came after this and undertook the enterprise, but all forfeited their lives. Now it came to pass that a poor soldier, who had a wound and could serve no longer, found himself on the road to the town where the king lived. There he met an old woman who asked him where he was going. I hardly know myself, answered he, and added in jest, I had half a mind to discover where the princesses danced their shoes into holes and thus become king. That is not so difficult, said the old woman. You must not drink the wine which will be brought to you at night, and must pretend to be sound asleep. With that she gave him a little cloak and said, If you put on that, you will be invisible, and then you can steal after the twelve. When the soldier had received this good advice, he went into the thing in earnest, took heart, went to the king, and announced himself as a suitor. He was as well received as the others, and royal garments were put upon him. He was conducted that evening at bedtime into the antechamber, and as he was about to go to bed, the eldest came and brought him a cup of wine. But he had tied a sponge under his chin and let the wine run down into it, without drinking a drop. Then he lay down, and when he had lain a while, 
he began to snore as if in the deepest sleep the twelve princesses heard that and laughed and the eldest said he too might as well have saved his life with that they got up opened wardrobes presses cupboards and brought out pretty dresses dressed themselves before the mirrors sprang about and rejoiced at the prospect of the dance only the youngest said i know not how it is you are very happy but i feel very strange some misfortune is certainly about to befall us thou art a goose who art always frightened said the eldest hast thou forgotten how many kings sons have already come here in vain i had hardly any need to give the soldier a sleeping draught in any case the clown would not have wakened when they were all ready they looked carefully at the soldier but he had closed his eyes and did not move or stir so they felt themselves quite secure the eldest then went to her bed and tapped it it immediately sank into the earth and one after the other they descended through the opening the eldest going first the soldier who had watched everything tarried no longer put on his little cloak and went down last with the youngest halfway down the steps he just trod a little on her dress she was terrified at that and cried out what is that who is pulling my dress don't be so silly said the eldest you have caught it on a nail then they went all the way down and when they were at the bottom they were standing in a wonderfully pretty avenue of trees all the leaves of which were of silver and shone and glistened the soldier thought i must carry a token away with me and broke off a twig from one of them on which the tree cracked with a loud report the youngest cried out again something is wrong did you hear that crack but the eldest said it is a gun fired for joy because we have got rid of our prince so quickly after that they came into an avenue where all the leaves were of gold and lastly into a third where they were of bright diamonds he broke off a twig from each which made such a crack each time that the youngest started back in terror but the eldest still maintained that they were salutes they went on and came to a great lake whereon stood twelve little boats and in every boat sat a handsome prince all of whom were waiting for the twelve and each took one of them with him but the soldier seated himself by the youngest then her prince said i can't tell why the boat is so much heavier today i shall have to row with all my strength if i am to get it across what should cause that said the youngest but the warm weather i feel very warm too on the opposite side of the lake stood a splendid brightly lit castle from whence resounded the joyous music of trumpets and kettle drums they rode over there entered and each prince danced with the girl he loved but the soldier danced with them unseen and when one of them had a cup of wine in her hand he drank it up so that the cup was empty when she carried it to her mouth the youngest was alarmed at this but the eldest always made her be silent they danced there till three o'clock in the morning when all the shoes were danced into holes and they were forced to leave off the princes rowed them back again over the lake and this time the soldier seated himself by the eldest on the shore they took leave of their princes and promised to return the following night when they reached the stairs the soldier ran on in front and lay down in his bed and when the twelve had come up slowly and warily he was already snoring so loudly that they could all hear him and they said so far as he is concerned we are safe they took off their beautiful dresses laid them away put the worn-out shoes under the bed and lay down next morning the soldier was resolved not to speak but to watch the wonderful goings-on and again went with them then everything was done just as it had been done the first time and each time they danced till their shoes were worn to pieces but the third time he took a cup away with him as a token when the hour had arrived for him to give his answer he took the three twigs and the cup and went to the king but the twelve stood behind the door and listened for what he was going to say when the king put the question where have my twelve daughters danced their shoes into pieces in the night he answered in an underground castle with twelve princes and related how it had come to pass and brought out the tokens the king then summoned his daughters and asked them if the soldier had told the truth and when they saw that they were betrayed and that falsehood would be of no avail they were obliged to confess all 
Thereupon the king asked which of them he would have to wife. He answered, I am no longer young, so give me the eldest. Then the wedding was celebrated on the selfsame day, and the kingdom was promised him after the king's death. But the princes were bewitched for as many days as they had danced nights with the twelve. End of story 133《There lived an aged queen who was a sorceress, and her daughter was the most beautiful maiden under the sun. The old woman, however, had no other thought than how to lure mankind to destruction, and when a wooer appeared, she said that whosoever wished to have her daughter must first perform a task or die. Many had been dazzled by the daughter's beauty and had actually risked this, but they never could accomplish what the old woman enjoined them to do, and then no mercy was shown. They had to kneel down, and their heads were struck off. A certain king's son, who had also heard of the maiden's beauty, said to his father, Let me go there. I want to demand her in marriage. Never, answered the king. If you were to go, it would be going to your death. On this the son lay down and was sick unto death, and for seven years he lay there, and no physician could heal him. When the father perceived that all hope was over, with a heavy heart he said to him, Go thither and try your luck, for I know no other means of curing you. When the son heard that, he rose from his bed and was well again and joyfully set out on his way. And it came to pass that as he was riding across a heath, he saw from afar something like a great heap of hay lying on the ground, and when he drew nearer, he could see that it was the stomach of a man who had laid himself down there, but the stomach looked like a small mountain. When the fat man saw the traveller, he stood up and said, "'If you are in need of any one, take me into your service.' The prince answered, "'What can I do with such a great big man?' "'Oh,' said the stout one, "'this is nothing. When I stretch myself out, well, I am three thousand times fatter.' "'If that's the case,' said the prince, "'I can make use of thee. Come with me.' So the stout one followed the prince, and after a while they found another man, who was lying on the ground with his ear laid to the turf." "'What art thou doing there?' asked the king's son. "'I am listening,' replied the man. "'What art thou listening to so attentively?' "'I am listening to what is just going on in the world, "'for nothing escapes my ears. "'I even hear the grass growing.' "'Tell me,' said the prince, "'what thou hearest at the court of the old queen "'who has the beautiful daughter.' "'Then he answered,' I hear the whizzing of the sword that is striking off a wooer's head. The king's son said, I can make use of thee, come with me. They went onwards and then saw a pair of feet lying and a part of a pair of legs, but could not see the rest of the body. When they had walked on for a great distance, they came to the body and at last to the head also. Why, said the prince, what a tall rascal thou art. Oh, replied the tall one, that is nothing at all yet. When I really stretch out my limbs, I am three thousand times as tall, and taller than the highest mountain on earth. I will gladly enter your service, if you will take me. Come with me, said the prince, I can make use of thee. They went onwards and found a man sitting by the road, who had bound up his eyes. The prince said to him, 
Hast thou weak eyes that thou canst not look at the light? No, replied the man, but I must not remove the bandage, for whatsoever I look at with my eyes splits to pieces. My glance is so powerful. If you can use that, I shall be glad to serve you. Come with me, replied the king's son. I can make use of thee. They journeyed onwards and found a man who was lying in the hot sunshine, trembling and shivering all over his body, so that not a limb was still. "'How canst thou shiver when the sun is shining so warm?' said the king's son. "'Alack!' replied the man. "'I am of quite a different nature. The hotter the sun is, the colder I am, and the frost pierces through all my bones, and the colder it is, the hotter I am. In the midst of ice I cannot endure the heat, nor in the midst of fire the cold.' "'Thou art a strange fellow,' said the prince. "'But if thou wilt enter my service, follow me.' They travelled onwards and saw a man standing who made a long neck and looked about him and could see over all the mountains. "'What art thou looking at so eagerly?' said the king's son. The man replied, "'I have such sharp eyes that I can see into every forest and field and hill and valley.' all over the world. The prince said, Come with me if thou wilt, for I am still in want of such an one. And now the king's son and his six servants came to the town where the aged queen dwelt. He did not tell her who he was, but said, If you will give me your beautiful daughter, I will perform any task you set me. The sorceress was delighted to get such a handsome youth as this into her net and said, I will set thee three tasks, and if thou art able to perform them all, thou shalt be husband and master of my daughter. What is the first to be? Thou shalt fetch me my ring which I have dropped into the Red Sea. So the king's son went home to his servants and said, The first task is not easy. A ring is to be got out of the Red Sea. Come, find some way of doing it. Then the man with the sharp sight said, I will see where it is lying, and looked down into the water and said, It is sticking there on a pointed stone. The tall one carried them thither and said, I would soon get it out if I could only see it. Oh, is that all? cried the stout one and lay down and put his mouth to the water, on which all the waves fell into it, just as if it had been a whirlpool, and he drank up the whole sea till it was dry as a meadow. The tall one stooped down a little and brought out the ring with his hand. Then the king's son rejoiced when he had the ring and took it to the old queen. She was astonished and said, "'Yes, it is the right ring.' Thou hast safely performed the first task, but now comes the second. Dost thou see the meadow in front of my palace? Three hundred fat oxen are feeding there, and these must thou eat, skin, hair, bones, horns, and all, and down below in my cellar lie three hundred casks of wine, and these thou must drink up as well, and if one hair of the oxen or one little drop of the wine is left, Thy life will be forfeited to me. May I invite no guests to this repast? inquired the prince. No dinner is good without some company. The old woman laughed maliciously and replied, Thou mayst invite one for the sake of companionship, but no more. The king's son went to his servants and said to the stout one, Thou shalt be my guest today, and shalt eat thy fill. Hereupon the stout one stretched himself out and ate the three hundred oxen without leaving one single hair, and then he asked if he was to have nothing but his breakfast. He drank the wine straight from the casks without feeling any need of a glass, and he licked the last drop from his finger nails. When the meal was over, the prince went to the old woman and told her that the second task also was performed. She wondered at this and said, 
No one has ever done so much before, but one task still remains. And she thought to herself, Thou shalt not escape me, and wilt not keep thy head on thy shoulders. This night, said she, I will bring my daughter to thee in thy chamber, and thou shalt put thine arms round her. But when you are sitting there together, beware of falling asleep. When twelve o'clock is striking, I will come, and if she is then no longer in thine arms, thou art lost. The prince thought, the task is easy. I will most certainly keep my eyes open. Nevertheless, he called his servants, told them what the old woman had said, and remarked, Who knows what treasury lurks behind this? Foresight is a good thing. Keep watch and take care that the maiden does not go out of my room again. When night fell, the old woman came with her daughter and gave her into the prince's arms, and then the tall one wound himself round the two in a circle, and the stout one placed himself by the door so that no living creature could enter. There the two sat, and the maiden spoke never a word, but the moon shone through the window on her face, and the prince could behold her wondrous beauty. He did nothing but gaze at her, and was filled with love and happiness, and his eyes never felt weary. This lasted until eleven o'clock, when the old woman cast such a spell over all of them that they fell asleep, and at the self-same moment the maiden was carried away. Then they all slept soundly until a quarter to twelve, when the magic lost its power and all awoke again. "'Oh, misery and misfortune!' cried the prince. "'Now I am lost!' The faithful servants also began to lament, but the listener said, Be quiet, I want to listen. Then he listened for an instant and said, She is on a rock three hundred leagues from hence, bewailing her fate. Thou alone, tall one, canst help her. If thou wilt stand up, thou wilt be there in a couple of steps. Yes, answered the tall one, but the one with the sharp eyes must go with me, that we may destroy the rock. Then the tall one took the one with the bandaged eyes on his back, and in the twinkling of an eye they were on the enchanted rock. The tall one immediately took the bandage from the other's eyes, and he did but look round, and the rock shivered into a thousand pieces. Then the tall one took the maiden in his arms, carried her back in a second, then fetched his companion with the same rapidity, and before it struck twelve they were all sitting as they had sat before, quite merrily and happily. When twelve struck, the aged sorceress came stealing in with a malicious face, which seemed to say, Now he is mine, for she believed that her daughter was on the rock three hundred leagues off, but when she saw her in the prince's arms, she was alarmed and said, Here is one who knows more than I do. She dared not make any opposition and was forced to give him her daughter, but she whispered in her ear, It is a disgrace to thee to have to obey common people, and that thou art not allowed to choose a husband to thine own liking. On this the proud heart of the maiden was filled with anger, and she meditated revenge. Next morning she caused three hundred great bundles of wood to be got together, and said to the prince that, though the three tasks were performed, she would still not be his wife until some one was ready to seat himself in the midst of the wood and bear the fire. She thought that none of his servants would let themselves be burned for him, and that out of love for her he himself would place himself upon it, and then she would be free. But the servants said, Every one of us has done something except the frosty one. He must set to work. And they put him in the middle of the pile and set fire to it. Then the fire began to burn and burned for three days, until all the wood was consumed, and when the flames had burnt out, the frosty one was standing amid the ashes, trembling like an aspen leaf, and saying, I never felt such a frost during the whole course of my life. 
if it had lasted much longer, I should have been benumbed. As no other pretext was to be found, the beautiful maiden was now forced to take the unknown youth as a husband. But when they drove away to church, the old woman said, I cannot endure this disgrace, and sent her warriors after them with orders to cut down all who opposed them and bring back her daughter. But the listener had sharpened his ears and heard the secret discourse of the old woman. What shall we do? said he to the stout one. But he knew what to do, and spat out once or twice behind the carriage some of the sea water which he had drunk, and a great sea arose in which the warriors were caught and drowned. When the sorceress perceived that, she sent her mailed knights, but the listener heard the rattling of their armor and undid the bandage from one eye of sharp eyes who looked for a while rather fixedly at the enemy's troops on which they all sprang to pieces like glass then the youth and the maiden went on their way undisturbed and when the two had been blessed in church the six servants took leave and said to their master your wishes are now satisfied you need us no longer we will go our way and seek our fortunes Half a league from the palace of the prince's father was a village near which a swineherd tended his herd. And when they came thither, the prince said to his wife, Do you know who I really am? I am no prince but a herder of swine, and the man who is there with that herd is my father. We too shall have to set to work also and help him. Then he alighted with her at the inn and secretly told the innkeepers to take away her royal apparel during the night. So when she awoke in the morning she had nothing to put on, and the innkeeper's wife gave her an old gown and a pair of worsted stockings, and at the same time seemed to consider it a great present and said, If it were not for the sake of your husband, I should have given you nothing at all. Then the princess believed that he really was a swineherd, and tended the herd with him, and thought to herself, I have deserved this for my haughtiness and pride. This lasted for a week, and then she could endure it no longer, for she had sores on her feet. And now came a couple of people who asked if she knew who her husband was. Yes, she answered, he is a swineherd and has just gone out with cords and ropes to try to drive a little bargain. But they said, Just come with us, and we will take you to him. And they took her up to the palace, and when she entered the hall, there stood her husband in kingly raiment. But she did not recognize him until he took her in his arms, kissed her, and said, I suffered much for thee and now thou too hast had to suffer for me. And then the wedding was celebrated, and he who has told you all this wishes that he too had been present at it. End of story 134。Story 135 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The White Bride and the Black One. A woman was going about the unenclosed land with her daughter and her stepdaughter cutting fodder. When the Lord came walking towards them, in the form of a poor man, and asked, Which is the way into the village? If you want to know, said the mother, seek it for yourself. And the daughter added, If you are afraid, you will not find it. Take a guide with you. But the stepdaughter said, Poor man, I will take you there. Come with me. Then God was angry with the mother and daughter, and turned his back on them, and wished that they should become as black as night, and ugly as sin. To the poor stepdaughter, however, God was gracious, and went with her. And when they were near the village, he said a blessing over her, and spake, 
Choose three things for thyself, and I will grant them to thee. Then said the maiden, I should like to be as beautiful and fair as the sun, and instantly she was white and fair as day. Then I should like to have a purse of money which would never grow empty. That the Lord gave her also, but he said, Do not forget what is best of all, said she, for my third wish I desire after my death to inhabit the eternal kingdom of heaven. That also was granted unto her, and then the Lord left her. When the stepmother came home with her daughter, and they saw that they were both as black as coal and ugly, but that the stepdaughter was white and beautiful, wickedness increased still more in their hearts, and they thought of nothing else but how they could do her an injury. The stepdaughter, however, had a brother called Regener, whom she loved very much, and she told him all that had happened. Once on a time, Regener said to her, Dear sister, I will take thy likeness, that I may continually see thee before mine eyes, for my love for thee is so great that I should like always to look at thee. Then she answered, But I pray thee, let no one see the picture. So he painted his sister and hung up the picture in his room. He, however, dwelt in the king's palace, for he was coachman. Every day he went and stood before the picture, and thanked God for the happiness of having such a dear sister. Now it happened that the king whom he served had just lost his wife, who had been so beautiful that no one could be found to compare with her, and on this account the king was in deep grief. The attendants about the court, however, remarked that the coachman stood daily before this beautiful picture, and they were jealous of him, so they informed the king. Then the latter ordered the picture to be brought to him, and when he saw that it was like his lost wife in every respect, except that it was still more beautiful, he fell mortally in love with it. He caused the coachman to be brought before him, and asked whom the portrait represented. The coachman said it was his sister, so the king resolved to take no one but her as his wife, and gave him a carriage and horses, and splendid garments of cloth of gold and sent him forth to fetch his chosen bride. When Regener came on this errand, his sister was glad, but the black maiden was jealous of her good fortune, and grew angry above all measure, and said to her mother, Of what use are all your arts to us now, when you cannot procure such a piece of luck for me? Be quiet, said the old woman, I will soon divert it to you and by her arts of witchcraft she so troubled the eyes of the coachman that he was half blind, and she stopped the ears of the white maiden so that she was half deaf. Then they got into the carriage, first the bride in her noble royal apparel, then the stepmother with her daughter, and Regener sat on the box to drive. When they had been on the way for some time, the coachman cried, "'Cover thee well, my sister dear,' that the rain may not wet thee, that the wind may not load thee with dust, that thou mayest be fair and beautiful when thou appearest before the king. The bride asked, What is my dear brother saying? Ah, said the woman, he says that you ought to take off your golden dress and give it to your sister. And she took it off and put it on the black maiden, who gave her in exchange for it a shabby gray gown. They drove onwards, and a short time afterwards the brother cried again, Cover thee well, my sister dear, that the rain may not wet thee, that the wind may not load thee with dust, that thou mayest be fair and beautiful when thou appearest before the king. The bride asked, What is my dear brother saying? Ah, said the old woman, he says that you ought to take off your golden hood and give it to your sister. So she took off the hood and put it on her sister, and sat with her own head uncovered, and they drove on farther. After a while, the brother once more cried, Cover thee well, my sister dear, that the rain may not wet thee, that the wind may not load thee with dust, that thou mayest be fair and beautiful when thou appearest before the king. The bride asked, What is my dear brother saying? Ah, said the old woman, he says you must look out of the carriage. They were, however, 
just on a bridge which crossed deep water. When the bride stood up and leant forward out of the carriage, they both pushed her out, and she fell into the middle of the water. At the same moment that she sank, a snow-white duck arose out of the mirror-smooth water and swam down the river. The brother had observed nothing of it, and drove the carriage on until they reached the court. Then he took the black maiden to the king as his sister, and thought she really was so, because his eyes were dim, and he saw the golden garments glittering. When the king saw the boundless ugliness of his intended bride, he was very angry, and ordered the coachman to be thrown into a pit which was full of adders and nests of snakes. The old witch, however, knew so well how to flatter the king and deceive his eyes by her arts that he kept her and her daughter until she appeared quite endurable to him and he really married her one evening when the black bride was sitting on the king's knee a white duck came swimming up the gutter to the kitchen and said to the kitchen boy boy light a fire that i may warm my feathers the kitchen boy did it, and lighted a fire on the hearth. Then came the duck, and sat down by it, and shook herself, and smoothed her feathers to rights with her bill. When she was thus sitting and enjoying herself, she asked, What is my brother Regener doing? The scullery boy replied, He is imprisoned in the pit with adders and with snakes. Then she asked, What is the black witch doing in the house? The boy answered, she is loved by the king and happy. May God have mercy on him, said the duck, and swam forth by the sink. The next night she came again and put the same questions, and the third night also. Then the kitchen boy could bear it no longer, and went to the king and discovered all to him. The king, however, wanted to see it for himself, and next evening went thither, and when the duck thrust her head in through the sink, he took his sword and cut through her neck, and suddenly she changed into a most beautiful maiden, exactly like the picture which her brother had made of her. The king was full of joy, and as she stood there quite wet, he caused splendid apparel to be brought and had her clothed in it. Then she told how she had been betrayed by cunning and falsehood and at last thrown into the water and her first request was that her brother should be brought forth from the pit of snakes. And when the king had fulfilled this request, he went into the chamber where the old witch was, and asked, What does she deserve who does this and that? And related what had happened. Then was she so blinded that she was aware of nothing and said, She deserves to be stripped naked and put into a barrel with nails, and that a horse should be harnessed to the barrel, and the horse sent all over the world, all of which was done to her, and to her black daughter. But the king married the white and beautiful bride, and rewarded her faithful brother, and made him a rich and distinguished man. End of story 135STORY 136 OF HOUSEHOLD TALES This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Walberg. HOUSEHOLD TALES by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Iron John there was once on a time a king who had a great forest near his palace, full of all kinds of wild animals. One day he sent out a huntsman to shoot him a roe, but he did not come back. Perhaps some accident has befallen him, said the king, and the next day he sent out two more huntsmen who were to search for him, but they too stayed away. Then on the third day he sent for all his huntsmen and said, Scour the whole forest through and do not give up until ye have found all three. But of these also none came home again, and of the pack of hounds which they had taken with them, none were seen more. From that time forth no one would any longer venture into the forest, 
and it lay there in deep stillness and solitude, and nothing was seen of it, but sometimes an eagle or a hawk flying over it. This lasted for many years, when a strange huntsman announced himself to the king as seeking a situation, and offered to go to the dangerous woods. The king, however, would not give his consent, and said, It is not safe in there. I fear it would fare with thee no better than with the others, and thou wouldst never come out again. The huntsman replied, Lord, I will venture it at my own risk, of fear I know nothing. The huntsman therefore betook himself with his dog to the forest. It was not long before the dog fell in with some game on the way, and wanted to pursue it. But hardly had the dog run two steps when it stood before a deep pool and could go no farther, and a naked arm stretched itself out of the water, seized it, and drew it under. When the huntsman saw that, he went back and fetched three men to come with buckets and bail out the water. When they could see the bottom, there lay a wild man, whose body was brown like rusty iron, and whose hair hung over his face down to his knees. They bound him with cords and led him away to the castle. There was great astonishment over the wild man. The king, however, had him put in an iron cage in his courtyard, and forbade the door to be opened on pain of death and the queen herself was to take the key into her keeping. And from this time forth, everyone could go into the forest again with safety. The king had a son of eight years, who was once playing in the courtyard, and while he was playing, his golden ball fell into the cage. The boy ran thither and said, Give me back my ball. Not till thou hast opened the door for me, answered the man. No, said the boy. I will not do that. The king has forbidden it, and ran away. The next day, again he went and asked for his ball. The wild man said, Open my door, but the boy would not. On the third day, the king had ridden out hunting, and the boy went once more and said, I cannot open the door even if I wished, for I have not the key. Then the wild man said, it lies under thy mother's pillow. Thou canst get it there. The boy, who wanted to have his ball back, cast all thought to the winds, and brought the key. The door opened with difficulty, and the boy pinched his fingers. When it was open, the wild man stepped out, gave him the golden ball, and hurried away. The boy had become afraid. He called and cried after him, O oh, wild man, do not go away, or I shall be beaten. The wild man turned back, took him up, set him on his shoulder, and went with hasty steps into the forest. When the king came home, he observed that the cage was empty, and asked the queen how that had happened. She knew nothing about it, and sought the key, but it was gone. She called the boy, but no one answered. The king sent out people to seek for him in the fields, but they did not find him. Then he could easily guess what had happened, and much grief reigned in the royal court. When the wild man had once more reached the dark forest, he took the boy down from his shoulder and said to him, Thou wilt never see thy father and mother again, but I will keep thee with me, for thou hast set me free, and I have compassion on thee. If thou dost all I bid thee, thou shalt fare well. Of treasure and gold I have enough, and more than any one in the world. He made a bed of moss for the boy on which he slept, and the next morning the man took him to a well and said, Behold, the gold well is as bright and clear as crystal. Thou shalt sit beside it and take care that nothing falls into it or it will be polluted. I will come every evening to see if thou hast obeyed my order. The boy placed himself by the margin of the well and often saw a golden fish or a golden snake show itself therein, and took care that nothing fell in. As he was thus sitting, his finger hurt him so violently that he involuntarily put it in the water. He drew it quickly out again, but saw that it was quite gilded, and whatsoever pains he took to wash the gold off again, all was to no purpose. In the evening, Iron John came back, looked at the boy, and said, what has happened to the well? Nothing, he answered, and held his finger behind his back, that the man might not see it. 
but he said, Thou hast dipped thy finger into the water. This time it may pass, but take care that dost now again let anything go in. By daybreak the boy was already sitting by the well and watching it. His finger hurt him again, and he passed it over his head, and then unhappily a hair fell down into the well. He took it quickly out, but it was already quite gilded. Iron John came and already knew what had happened. Thou hast let a hair fall into the well, he said. I will allow thee to watch it once more, but if this happens for the third time, then the well is polluted, and thou canst no longer remain with me. On the third day, the boy sat by the well and did not stir his finger, however much it hurt him. But the time was long to him, and he looked at the reflection of his face on the surface of the water. And as he still bent down more and more while he was doing so, and trying to look straight into the eyes, his long hair fell down from his shoulders into the water. He raised himself up quickly, but the whole of the hair of his head was already golden and shone like the sun. You may imagine how terrified the poor boy was. He took his pocket handkerchief and tied it round his head in order that the man might not see it. When he came, he already knew everything and said, Take the handkerchief off. Then the golden hair streamed forth and let the boy excuse himself as he might. It was of no use. Thou hast not stood the trial and canst not stay here no longer. Go forth into the world. There thou wilt learn what poverty is. But as thou hast not a bad heart, and as I mean well by thee, there is one thing I will grant thee. If thou fallest into any difficulty, come to the forest and cry, Iron John, and then I will come and help thee. My power is great, greater than thou thinkest, and I have gold and silver in abundance. Then the king's son left the forest and walked by beaten and unbeaten paths ever onwards until at length he reached a great city. There he looked for work, but could find none, and he had learnt nothing by which he could help himself. At length he went to the palace and asked if they would take him in. The people about court did not at all know what use they could make of him, but they liked him and told him to stay. At length the cook took him into his service and said he might carry wood and water and rake the cinders together. Once, when it so happened that no one else was at hand, the cook ordered him to carry the food to the royal table, but as he did not like to let his golden hair be seen, he kept his little cap on. Such a thing as that had never yet come under the king's notice, and he said, When thou comest to the royal table, thou must take thy hat off. He answered, Ah, Lord, I cannot. I have a bad sore place on my head. Then the king had the cook called before him and scolded him, and asked how he could take such as a boy as that into his service and that he was to turn him off at once. The cook, however, had pity on him, and exchanged him for the gardener's boy. And now the boy had to plant and water the garden, and hoe and dig and bear the wind and bad weather. Once in summer he was working alone in the garden. The day was so warm he took his little cap off that the air might cool him. As the sun shone on his hair it glittered and flashed so that the rays fell into the bedroom of the king's daughter, and up she sprang to see what that could be. Then she saw the boy and cried to him, Boy, bring me a wreath of flowers. He put his cap on with all haste and gathered wild field flowers and bound them together. When he was ascending the stairs with them, the gardener met him and said, How canst thou take the king's daughter a garland of such common flowers? Go quickly and get another and seek out the prettiest and the rarest. Oh, no, replied the boy. The wild ones have more scent, and will please her better. When he got into the room, the king's daughter said, Take thy cap off. It is not seemly to keep it on in my presence. He said again, I may not. I have a sore head. She, however, caught at his cap and pulled it off, and then his golden hair rolled down his shoulders, and it was splendid to behold. He wanted to run out, but she held him by the arm and gave him a handful of ducats. With those he departed but he cared nothing for the gold pieces. He took them to the gardener and said, I present them to thy children. They can play with them. The following day, the king's daughter again called to him that he was to bring her a wreath of field flowers. And when he went in with it, she instantly snatched at his cap and wanted to take it away from him. 
but he held it fast with both hands. She again gave him a handful of ducats, but he would not keep them, and gave them to the gardener for playthings for his children. On the third day things went just the same. She could not get his cap away from him, and he would not have her money. Not long afterwards the country was overrun by war. The king gathered together his people, and did not know whether or not he could offer any opposition to the enemy, who was superior in strength and had a mighty army. Then said the gardener's boy, I am grown up, and will go to the wars also. Only give me a horse. The others laughed and said, Seek one for thyself when we are gone. We will leave one behind us in the stable for thee. When they had gone forth, he went into the stable and got the horse out. It was lame of one foot and limped hobbledy-jig, hobbledy-jig. Nevertheless, he mounted it and rode away to the dark forest. When he came to the outskirts, he called, Iron John, three times so loudly that it echoed through the trees. Thereupon, the wild man appeared immediately and said, What dost thou desire? I want a strong steed, for I am going to the wars. That thou shalt have, and still more than thou asks for. Then the wild man went back into the forest, and it was not long before a stable boy came out of it, who led a horse that snorted with its nostrils, and could hardly be restrained, and behind them followed a great troop of soldiers, entirely equipped in iron, and their swords flashed in the sun. The youth made over his three-legged horse to the stable boy, mounted the other, and rode at the head of the soldiers. When he got near the battlefield, a great part of the king's men had already fallen, and little was wanting to make the rest give way. Then the youth galloped thither with his iron soldiers, broke like a hurricane over the enemy, and beat down all who opposed him. They began to fly, but the youth pursued and never stopped, until there was not a single man left. Instead, however, of returning to the king, he conducted his troop by byways back to the forest, and called forth Iron John. "'What dost thou desire?' asked the wild man. "'Take back thy horse and thy troops, and give me my three-legged horse again.' All that he asked was done, and soon he was riding on his three-legged horse. When the king returned to his palace, his daughter went to meet him, and wished him joy of his victory. "'I am not the one who carried away the victory,' said he, "'but a stranger knight who came to my assistance with his soldiers.' The daughter wanted to hear who the strange knight was, but the king did not know, and said, He followed the enemy, and I did not see him again. She inquired of the gardener where his boy was, but he smiled and said, He has just come home on his three-legged horse, and the others have been mocking him, crying, Here comes our hobbledy jig back again. They asked, too, Under what hedge hast thou been sleeping all the time? He, however, said, I did the best of all, and it would have gone badly without me and then he was still more ridiculed. The king said to his daughter, I will proclaim a great feast that shall last for three days, and thou shalt throw a golden apple. Perhaps the unknown will come to it. When the feast was announced, the youth went out to the forest and called Iron John. What dost thou desire? asked he. That I may catch the king's daughter's golden apple. It is as safe as if thou hast it already, said Iron John. Thou shalt likewise have a suit of red armor for the occasion, and ride on a spirited chestnut horse. When the day came, the youth galloped to the spot, took his place amongst the knights, and was recognized by no one. The king's daughter came forward and threw a golden apple to the knights, but none of them caught it but he. As soon as he had it, he galloped away. On the second day, Iron John equipped him as a white knight and gave him a white horse. Again, he was the only one who caught the apple, and he did not linger an instant, but galloped off with it. The king grew angry and said, That is not allowed. He must appear before me and tell his name. He gave the order that if the knight who caught the apple should go away again, they should pursue him, and if he would not come back willingly, they were to cut him down and stab him. On the third day, he received from Iron John a suit of black armor and a black horse and again he caught the apple. But when he was riding off with it, the king's attendants pursued him, and one of them got so near him that he wounded the youth's leg with the point of his sword. The youth nevertheless escaped from them, but his horse leapt so violently 
that the helmet fell from the youth's head, and they could see he had golden hair. They rode back and announced this to the king. The following day, the king's daughter asked the gardener about his boy. He is at work in the garden. The queer creature has been at the festival, too. He only came home yesterday evening. He has likewise shown my children three golden apples, which he has won. The king had him summoned into his presence, and he came and again had his little cap on his head. But the king's daughter went up to him and took it off, and his golden hair fell down over his shoulders. And he was so handsome that all were amazed. Art thou the knight who came every day to the festival, always in different colors, and who caught the three golden apples? asked the king. Yes, answered he, and here the apples are and he took them out of his pocket and returned them to the king. If you desire further proof, you may see the wound which your people gave me when they followed me, but I am likewise the knight who helped you to your victory over your enemies. If thou canst perform such deeds as that, thou art no gardener's boy. Tell me, who is thy father? My father is a mighty king, and gold I have in plenty as great as I require. I well see, said the king, that I owe thanks to thee, can I do anything to please thee? Yes, answered he, that indeed you can. Give me your daughter to wife. The maiden laughed and said, He does not much stand on ceremony, but I have already seen by his golden hair that he was no gardener's boy. And then she went and kissed him. His father and mother came to the wedding and were in great delight, for they had given up all hope of ever seeing their dear son again. And as they were sitting at the marriage feast, the music suddenly stopped, the doors opened, and a stately king came in with a great retinue. He went up to the youth, embraced him, and said, I am Iron John, and was by enchantment a wild man, but thou hast set me free, and all the treasures which I possess shall be thy property. End of story 136《Story 137 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Three Black Princesses East India was besieged by an enemy who would not retire until he had received six hundred dollars. Then the townsfolk caused it to be proclaimed by beat of drum that whosoever was able to procure the money should be burgomaster. Now there was a poor fisherman who fished on the lake with his son, and the enemy came and took the son prisoner, and gave the father six hundred dollars for him. So the father went and gave them to the great men of the town, and the enemy departed, and the fisherman became burgomaster. Then it was proclaimed that whosoever did not say, Mr. Burgomaster, should be put to death on the gallows. The sun got away again from the enemy, and came to a great forest on a high mountain. The mountain opened, and he went into a great enchanted castle, wherein chairs, tables, and benches were all hung with black. Then came three young princesses who were entirely dressed in black, but had a little white on their faces. They told him he was not to be afraid. They would not hurt him, and that he could deliver them. He said he would gladly do that, if he did but know how. At this they told him he must for a whole year not speak to them, and also not look at them, and what he wanted to have he was just to ask for, and if they dared give him an answer they would do so. When he had been there for a long while he said he should like to go to his father, and they told him he might go. He was to take with him this purse with money put on this coat, and in a week he must be back there again. Then he was caught up, and was instantly in East India. He could no longer find his father in the fisherman's hut, and asked the people where the poor fisherman could be, and they told him he must not say that, or he would come to the gallows. Then he went to his father and said, Fisherman, how hast thou got here? Then the father said, Thou must not say that. The great men of the town knew of that. Thou wouldst come to the gallows. He, however, would not stop, and was brought to the gallows. When he was there, he said, Oh, my masters, just give me leave to go to the old fisherman's hut. 
Then he put on his old smock frock, and came back to the great men, and said, Do ye not now see? Am I not the son of the poor fisherman? Did I not earn bread for my father and mother in this dress? Hereupon his father knew him again, and begged his pardon, and took him home with him. And then he related all that had happened to him, and how he had got into a forest on a high mountain, and the mountain had opened, and he had gone into an enchanted castle, where all was black, and three young princesses had come to him, who were black except a little white on their faces. And they had told him not to fear, and that he could deliver them. Then his mother said that might very likely not be a good thing to do, and that he ought to take a holy water vessel with him, and drop some boiling water on their faces. He went back again, and he was in great fear, and he dropped the water on their faces as they were sleeping, and they all turned half white. Then all the three princesses sprang up, and said, Thou accursed dog, our blood shall cry for vengeance on thee. Now there is no man born in the world, nor will any ever be born who can set us free. We have still three brothers who are bound by seven chains. They shall tear thee to pieces. Then there was a loud shrieking all over the castle, and he sprang out of the window and broke his leg, and the castle sank into the earth again. The mountain shut to again, and no one knew where the castle had stood. End of story 137story 138 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jason in panama household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt noist and his three sons between Verl and Soist there lived a man whose name was Noist, and he had three sons. One was blind, the other lame, and the third stark naked. Once on a time they went into a field, and there they saw a hare. The blind one shot it, the lame one caught it, the naked one put it in his pocket. Then they came to a mighty big lake, on which there were three boats. One sailed, one sank, the third had no bottom to it. They all three got into the one with no bottom to it. Then they came to a mighty big forest in which there was a mighty big tree. In the tree there was a mighty big chapel. In the chapel was a sexton made of beechwood and a boxwood parson, who dealt out holy water with cudgels. How truly happy is that one who can from holy water run! End of Story 138 Story 139 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Maid of Brackle. A girl from Brackle once went to St. Anne's Chapel at the foot of the Hinnenberg and as she wanted to have a husband, and thought there was no one else in the chapel, she sang, O oh, holy Saint Anne, help me soon to a man, thou know'st him right well, by Sutmer Gate does he dwell, his hair it is golden, thou know'st him right well. The clerk, however, was standing behind the altar, and heard that, so he cried in a very gruff voice, Thou shalt not have him, thou shalt not have him. The maiden thought that the child Mary, who stood by her mother Anne, had called out that to her, and was angry, and cried, Fiddle-dee-dee, conceited thing, hold your tongue, and let your mother speak. End of Story 139 Story 140 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. 
translated by margaret hunt domestic servants whither goest thou to valp i to valp thou to valp so so together we'll go hast thou a man what is his name cham my man cham thy man cham i to valp thou to valp so so together we'll go hast thou a child how is he styled wild my child wild thy child wild my man cham thy man cham i to valp thou to valp so so together we'll go hast thou a cradle how callest thou thy cradle hippodadle my cradle hippodadle my child wild thy child wild my man cham thy man cham i to valp thou to valp so so together we'll go hast thou also a drudge what name has thy drudge from thy work do not budge my drudge from thy work do not budge my child wild thy child wild my man cham thy man cham i to valp thou to valp so so together we'll go end of story 140「Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Lambkin and the Little Fish There was once a little brother and a little sister, who loved each other with all their hearts. Their own mother was, however, dead, and they had a stepmother, who was not kind to them, and secretly did everything she could to hurt them. It so happened that the two were playing with other children in a meadow before the house, and there was a pond in the meadow which came up to one side of the house. The children ran about it, and caught each other, and played at counting out. Anniki Benniki, let me live, and I to thee my bird will give. The little bird its straw shall seek, the straw I'll give to the cow to eat. The pretty cow shall give me milk, the milk I'll to the baker take. The baker he shall bake a cake. The cake I'll give unto the cat. The cat shall catch some mice for that. The mice I'll hang up in the smoke. And then you'll see the snow. They stood in a circle while they played this. And the one to whom the word snow fell had to run away. And all the others ran after him and caught him. As they were running about so merrily, the stepmother watched them from the window and grew angry and as she understood arts of witchcraft she bewitched them both and changed the little brother into a fish and the little sister into a lamb then the fish swam here and there about the pond and was very sad and the lambkin walked up and down the meadow and was miserable and could not eat or touch one blade of grass thus passed a long time and then strangers came as visitors to the castle the false stepmother thought this is a good opportunity and called the cook and said to him go and fetch the lamb from the meadow and kill it we have nothing else for the visitors then the cook went away and got the lamb and took it into the kitchen and tied its feet and all this it bore patiently when he had drawn out his knife and was wetting it on the doorstep to kill the lamb he noticed a little fish swimming backwards and forwards in the water in front of the kitchen sink and looking up at him this however was the brother for when the fish saw the cook take the lamb away it followed them and swam along the pond to the house then the lamb cried down to it ah brother in the pond so deep how sad is my poor heart 
even now the cook he wets his knife to take away my tender life the little fish answered ah little sister up on high how sad is my poor heart while in this pond i lie when the cook heard that the lambkin could speak and said such sad words to the fish down below he was terrified and thought this could be no common lamb but must be bewitched by the wicked woman in the house then said he be easy i will not kill thee and took another sheep and made it ready for the guests and conveyed the lambkin to a good peasant woman to whom he related all that he had seen and heard the peasant was however the very woman who had been foster-mother to the little sister and she suspected at once who the lamb was and went with it to a wise woman then the wise woman pronounced a blessing over the lambkin and the little fish by means of which they regained their human forms and after this she took them both into a little hut in a great forest where they lived alone but were contented and happy end of story 141「Household Tales by Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm and translated by Margaret Hunt Simeli Mountain there were once two brothers, the one rich, the other poor. The rich one, however, gave nothing to the poor one, and he gained a scanty living by trading in corn, and often did so badly that he had no bread for his wife and children. Once when he was wheeling a barrow through the forest, he saw, on one side of him, a great, bare, naked-looking mountain, and as he had never seen it before, he stood still and stared at it with amazement. While he was thus standing, he saw twelve great wild men coming towards him, and as he believed they were robbers, he pushed his barrow into the thicket, climbed up a tree, and waited to see what would happen. The twelve men, however, went to the mountain and cried, Semsi Mountain, Semsi Mountain, open! And immediately the barren mountain opened down the middle, and the twelve went into it, and as soon as they were within, it shut after a short time however it opened again and the men came forth carrying heavy sacks on their shoulders and when they were all once more in the daylight they said semsi mountain semsi mountain shut thyself then the mountain closed together and there was no longer any entrance to be seen to it and the twelve went away when they were quite out of sight, the poor man got down from the tree and was curious to know what really was secretly hidden in the mountain. So he went up to it and said, Semsi Mountain, Semsi Mountain, open! And the mountain opened to him also. Then he went inside, and the whole mountain was a cavern full of silver and gold, and behind lay great piles of pearls and sparkling jewels heaped up like corn. The poor man hardly knew what to do, and whether he might take any of these treasures for himself or not. But at last he filled his pockets with gold, but he left the pearls and precious stones where they were. When he came out again, he also said, Semsi Mountain, Semsi Mountain, shut thyself! And the mountain closed itself, and he went home with his barrow. And now he had no more cause for anxiety, but could buy bread for his wife and children with his gold and wine into the bargain. He lived joyously and uprightly, gave help to the poor, and did good to everyone. When, however, the money came to an end, he went to his brother, borrowed a measure that held a bushel, and brought himself some more, but did not touch any of the most valuable things. When for the third time he wanted to fetch something, he again borrowed the measure of his brother. 
The rich man had, however, long been envious of his brother's possessions and of the handsome way of living which he had set on foot, and could not understand from whence the riches came, and what his brother wanted with the measure. Then he thought of a cunning trick, and covered the bottom of the measure with pitch, and when he got the measure back a piece of money was sticking in it. He at once went to his brother and asked him, what hast thou been measuring in the bushel measure? Corn and barley, said the other. Then he showed him the piece of money, and threatened that if he did not tell the truth, he would accuse him before a court of justice. The poor man then told him everything, just as it happened. The rich man, however, ordered his carriage to be made ready, and drove away, resolved to use the opportunity better than his brother had done, and to bring back with him quite different treasures. When he came to the mountain, he cried, Semsi Mountain, Semsi Mountain, open! The mountain opened, and he went inside it. There lay the treasures all before him, and for a long time he did not know which to clutch at first. At length he loaded himself with as many precious stones as he could carry. He wished to carry his burden outside, but as his heart and soul were entirely full of the treasures, he had forgotten the name of the mountain and cried, Semeli Mountain, Semeli Mountain, open! That, however, was not the right name, and the mountain never stirred, but remained shut. Then he was alarmed, but the longer he thought about it, the more his thoughts confused themselves, and his treasures were no more of any use to him. In the evening the mountain opened, and the twelve robbers came in, and when they saw him they laughed and cried out, Bird, we have caught thee at last. Didst thou think we had never noticed that thou hadst been in here twice? We could not catch thee then. This third time thou shalt not get out again. Then he cried, It was not I, it was my brother. But let him beg for his life and say what he would, they cut his head off. End of story 142
by which stood a knacker who was cutting up a horse the youth said good morning god have pity on the poor soul what dost thou say thou ill-tempered knave and the knacker gave him such a box on the ear that he could not see out of his eyes what am i to say then thou must say there lies the carrion in the pit so he walked on and always said there lies the carrion in the pit there lies the carrion in the pit and he came to a cart full of people so he said good morning there lies the carrion in the pit then the cart pushed him into a hole and the driver took his whip and cracked it upon the youth till he was forced to crawl back to his mother and as long as he lived he never went out a travelling again End of Story 143「once upon a time there lived a king and a queen who were rich and had everything they wanted but no children the queen lamented over this day and night and said i am like a field on which nothing grows at last god gave her her wish but when the child came into the world it did not look like a human child but a little donkey when the mother saw that her lamentations and outcries began in a real earnest. She said she would far rather have no child at all than have a donkey, and that they were to throw it into the water that the fishes might devour it. But the king said, No, since God has sent him, he shall be my son and heir and after my death sit on the royal throne and wear the kingly crown. The donkey therefore was brought up and grew bigger, and his ears grew up beautifully high and straight. He was, however, of merry disposition, jumped about, played, and had a special pleasure in music, so that he went to a celebrated musician and said, Teach me thine art that I may play the lute as well as thou hast does. Ah, my dear little master, answered the musician, that would come very hard for you. Your fingers are certainly not suited to it, and are far too big. I am afraid the strings would not last. No excuses were of any use. The donkey was determined to play the lute. He was persevering and industrious, and at last learned to do as well as the master himself. The young lording once went out walking, full of thought, and came to a well. He looked into it, in the mirror clear water, saw his donkey's form. He was so distressed about it that he went out into the wide world and took only with him one faithful companion. They traveled up and down and at last they came into a kingdom where an old king reigned, who had an only but wonderfully beautiful daughter. The donkey said, Here we will stay, knocked at the gate, and cried, A guest is without open, that he may enter. As, however, the gate was not opened, he sat down, took his lute, and played in the most delightful manner, with his two four feet. Then the doorkeeper opened his eyes most wonderfully wide and ran to the king and said, Outside the gate sits a young donkey which plays the lute as well as an experienced master. Then let the musician come to me, said the king. When, however, a donkey came in, everyone began to laugh at the lute player and now the donkey was asked to sit down and eat with the servants. He, however, was unwilling and said, 
I am no common stable ass. I am a noble one. Then they said, If that is what thou art, sit thyself with the men of war. No, he said, I will sit by the king. The king smiled and said good-humouredly, Yes, it shall be as thou wilt. Little ass, come here to me. Then he asked, Little ass, how does my daughter please thee? The donkey turned his head towards her, looked at her, nodded, and said, I like her above measure. I have never yet seen any one so beautiful as she is. Well then, thou shalt sit next to her said the king. That is exactly what I wish, said the donkey, and he placed himself by her side, ate and drank, and knew how to behave himself daintily and cleanly. When the noble beast had stayed a long time at the king's court, he thought, What good does all this do me? I shall still have to go home again? Let his head hang sadly and went to the king and asked for his dismissal. But the king had grown fond of him, and said, Little ass, what ails thee? Thou lookest as sour as a jug of vinegar. I will give thee what thou hast wantest. Dost thou want gold? No, said the donkey, and shook his head. Dost thou want jewels and rich dress? No, dost thou wish for half my kingdom indeed no then the king said if i did but know what would make thee content wilt thou have my pretty daughter to wife ah yes said the ass i should indeed like her and all at once he became quite merry and full of happiness for that was exactly what he was wishing for so a great and splendid wedding was held. In the evening, when the bride and bridegroom were led into their bedroom, the king wanted to know if the ass would behave well, and ordered a servant to hide himself there. When they were both within, the bridegroom bolted the door, looked around, and as he believed they were quite alone, he suddenly threw off his ass's skin and stood there in the form of a handsome royal youth. Now, he said, thou seest who I am, and seest also that I am not unworthy of thee. Then the bride was glad, and kissed him, and loved him dearly. When morning came, he jumped up, put his animal skin on again, and no one could have guessed what kind of form was hidden beneath. Soon came the old king. Ah, cried he, is the little ass merry? But surely thou art sad, said to his daughter, that thou has not got a proper man for thy husband. Oh, no, dear father, I love him as well as if he were the handsomest in the world, and I will keep him as long as I live. The king was surprised. But the servant, who had concealed himself, came and revealed everything to him. The king said, That cannot be true. Then watch yourself the next night, and you will see it with your own eyes. And hark you, Lord King, if you were to take his skin away and throw it in the fire, he would be forced to show himself in his true shape. Thy advice is good, said the king and at night, when they were asleep, he stole in, and when he got to the bed, he saw by the light of the moon a noble-looking youth lying there, and his skin lay stretched on the ground. So he took it away, and had a great fire lighted outside, and threw the skin into it, and remained by itself until it was all burnt to ashes. As, however, he was anxious to know how the robbed man would behave himself. He stayed awake the whole night and watched. 
When the youth had slept his sleep out, he got up by the first light of the morning and wanted to put on the ass's skin, but it was not to be found. On this he was alarmed and full of grief and anxiety, said, Now I shall have to contrive to escape. But when he went out, there stood the king, who said, My son, whither away in such haste? What haste thou in mind? Stay here. Thou art such a handsome man. Thou shalt not go away from me. I will now give thee half my kingdom, and after my death thou shalt have the whole of it. Then I hope that what begins so well may end well, and I will stay with you, said the youth. And the old man gave him half the kingdom, and in a year's time when he died, the youth had the whole, and after the death of his father, he had another kingdom as well, and lived in all magnificence. End of 144 Story 145 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Ungrateful Son. A man and his wife were once sitting by the door of their house, and they had a roasted chicken set before them, and were about to eat it together. Then the man saw that his aged father was coming, and hastily took the chicken and hid it, for he would not permit him to have any of it. The old man came, took a drink, and went away. Now the son wanted to put the roasted chicken on the table again, but when he took it up, it had become a great toad, which jumped into his face and sat there, and never went away again. And if anyone wanted to take it off, it looked venomously at him, as if it would jump in his face, so that no one would venture to touch it. And the ungrateful son was forced to feed the toad every day, or else it fed itself on his face. And thus he went about the world, without knowing rest. End of Story 145 Story 146 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Turnip There were once two brothers, who both served as soldiers. One of them was rich, and the other poor. Then the poor one, to escape his poverty, put off his soldier's coat, and turned farmer. He dug and hoed his bit of land, and sowed it with turnip seed. The seed came up, and one turnip grew there which became large and vigorous, and visibly grew bigger and bigger, and seemed as if it would never stop growing. So it might have been called the Princess of Turnips, for never was such an one seen before, and never will such an one be seen again. At length it was so enormous, that by itself it filled a whole cart, and two oxen were required to draw it, and the farmer had not the least idea what he was to do with the turnip, or whether it would be a fortune to him or a misfortune. At last he thought, If thou sellest, what wilt thou get for it that is of any importance, and if thou eatest it, 
thyself, why the small turnips would do thee just as much good. It would be better to take it to the king and make a present of it. So he placed it on a cart, harnessed two oxen, took it to the palace and presented it to the king. What strange thing is this? said the king. Many wonderful things have come before my eyes, but never such a monster as this. From what seed can this have sprung, or are you a luck child, and have met with it by chance? Oh, no, said the farmer. No luck child am I. I am a poor soldier who, because he could no longer support himself, hung his soldier's coat on a nail and took to farming land. I have a brother who is rich and well known to you, Lord King, but I, because I have nothing, am forgotten by everyone. Then the king felt compassion for him and said, Thou shalt be raised from thy poverty, and shalt have gifts from me, that thou shalt be equal to thy rich brother. Then he bestowest on him much gold and lands and meadows and herds, and made him immensely rich so that the wealth of the other brother could not be compared with his. When the rich brother heard what the poor one had gained for himself with one single turnip, he envied him and thought in every way how he could get hold of a similar piece of luck. He would, however, set about it in much wiser way, and took gold and horses and carried them to the king, and made certain the king would give him a much larger present in return. If his brother had got so much for one turnip, what would he not carry away with him in return for such beautiful things as these? The king accepted his present and said he had nothing to give him in return that was more rare and excellent than the great turnip. So the rich man was obliged to put his brother's turnip in a cart and have it taken to his home. When there, he did not know on whom to vent his rage and anger, until bad thoughts came to him, and he resolved to kill his brother. He hired murderers who were to lie in ambush, and then went to his brother and said, Dear brother, I know of a hidden treasure. We will dig it up together and divide it between us. The other agreed to this, and then accompanied him without suspicion. While they were on their way, however, the murderers fell on him, bound him, and would have hanged him to a tree. But just as they were doing this, loud singing, and the sound of a horse's feet were heard in the distance. On this their hearts were filled with terror, and they pushed their prisoner head first, into the sack, hung it on a branch, and took to flight. He, however, worked up there until he had made a hole in the sack, through which he could put his head. The man who was coming by was no other than a traveling student, a young fellow who rode on his way through the wood, joyously singing his song. When he who was aloft saw that someone was passing below him, he cried, Good day! You have come at a lucky time. The student looked around at every side, but did not know whence the voice came. At last he said, Who calls me? Then an answer came from the top of the tree. Raise your eyes! Here I sit aloft in the sack of wisdom. In a short time have I learnt great things. Compared with this, all schools are a jest. In a very short time I shall have learnt everything, and shall descend wiser than all other men. I understand the stars, and the signs of the zodiac, and the tracks of the winds, and the sand of the sea, and the healing of illness, and the virtues of all herbs, birds, and stones. If you were once within it, you would feel what noble things issue forth from the sack of knowledge. The student when he heard all of this, was astonished and said, Blessed be the hour in which I have found thee. May not I enter the sack for a while? He who was above replied, as if unwillingly, For a short time 
I will let you get into it, if you reward me and give me good words. But you must wait an hour longer, for one thing remains, which I must learn before I do it. When the student had waited a while, he became impatient and begged to be allowed to get in at once. His thirst for knowledge was so very great, so he who was above pretended at last to yield and said, In order that I may come forth from the house of knowledge, you must let it down by the rope, and then you shall enter it. So the student let the sack down, untied it, and set him free, and then cried, Now draw me up at once, and was about to get into the sack. Halt! said the other. That won't do, and took him by the head and put him upside down into the sack, fastened it, and drew the disciple of wisdom up the tree by the rope. Then he swung him in the air and said, How goes it with thee, my dear fellow? Behold, already thou feelest wisdom coming and art gaining valuable experience. Keep perfectly quiet until thou becomest wiser. Thereupon he mounted the student's horse and rode away, but in an hour's time he sent someone to let the student out again. End of story 146。147 Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Old Man Made Young Again In the time when our Lord still walked this earth, he and St. Peter stopped one evening at a smith's and received free quarters. Then it came to pass that a poor beggar, hardly pressed by age and infirmity, came to this house and begged alms of the smith. St. Peter had compassion on him and said, Lord and Master, if it please thee, cure his torments that he may be able to win his own bread. The Lord said kindly, Smith, lend me thy forge and put on some coals for me, and then I will make this ailing old man young again. The smith was quite willing, and St. Peter blew the bellows, and when the coal fire sparkled up large and high, our Lord took the little old man, pushed him in the forge in the midst of the red-hot fire, so that he glowed like a rose-bush, and praised God with a loud voice. After that, the Lord went to the quenching tub, put the glowing little man into it, so that the water closed over him, and after he had carefully cooled him, gave him his blessing, when, behold, the little man sprang nimbly out, looking fresh, straight, healthy, and as if he were but twenty. The smith, who had watched everything closely and attentively, invited them all to supper. He, however, had an old, half-blind, crooked mother-in-law, who went to the youth, and with great earnestness asked if the fire had burnt him much. He answered that he had never felt more comfortable, and that he had sat in the red heat as if he had been in cool dew. The youth's words echoed in the ears of the old woman all night long, and early next morning, when the Lord had gone on his way again, and had heartily thanked the smith, the latter thought he might make his old mother-in-law young again likewise, as he had watched everything so carefully, and it lay in the province of his trade. So he called to ask her if she, too, would like to go bounding about like a girl of eighteen. She said, With all my heart, as the youth has come out of it so well. 
so the smith made a great fire and thrust the old woman into it and she writhed about this way and that and uttered terrible cries of murder sit still why art thou screaming and jumping about so cried he and as he spoke he blew the bellows again until all her rags were burnt the old woman cried without ceasing and the smith thought to himself i have not quite the right art and took her out and threw her into the cooling tub then she screamed so loudly that the smith's wife upstairs and her daughter-in-law heard and they both ran downstairs and saw the old woman lying in a heap in the quenching tub howling and screaming with her face wrinkled and shriveled and all out of shape thereupon the two who were both with child were so terrified that that very night two boys were born who were not made like men but apes and they ran into the woods and from them sprang the race of apes End of Story 147「Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Lord's Animals and the Devils The Lord God had created all animals, and had chosen out the wolf to be his dog. But he had forgotten the goat. Then the devil made ready, and began to create also, and created goats with fine long tails. Now when they went to pasture, they generally remained caught in the hedges by their tails. Then the devil had to go there and disentangle them with a great deal of trouble. This enraged him at last, and he went and bit off the tail of every goat, as may be seen to this day by the stump. Then he let them go to pasture alone. But it came to pass that the Lord God perceived how, at one time, they gnawed away at a fruitful tree at another injured the noble vines, or destroyed other tender plants. This distressed him, so that in his goodness and mercy he summoned his wolves, who soon tore in pieces the goats that went there. When the devil observed this, he went before the Lord and said, Thy creatures have destroyed mine. The Lord answered, Why didst thou create things to do harm? The devil said, I was compelled to do it, inasmuch as my thoughts run on evil what i create can have no other nature and thou must pay me heavy damages i will pay thee as soon as the oak leaves fall come then thy money will then be ready counted out when the oak leaves had fallen the devil came and demanded what was due to him but the lord said in the church of constantinople stands a tall oak tree which still has all its leaves. With raging and curses, the devil departed, and went to seek the oak, wandered in the wilderness for six months before he found it, and when he returned, all the oaks had in the meantime covered themselves again with green leaves. Then he had to forfeit his indemnity, and in his rage he put out the eyes of all the remaining goats, and put his own in instead. That is why all goats have devil's eyes, and their tails bitten off, and why he likes to assume their shape. End of Story 148 Story 149 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording 
by greg giordano newport ritchie florida household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the beam there was once an enchanter who was standing in the midst of a great crowd of people performing his wonders he had a cock brought in which lifted a heavy beam and carried it as if it were as light as a feather but a girl was present who had just found a bit of four-leaved clover and had thus become so wise that no deception could stand out against her and she saw that the beam was nothing but a straw so she cried you people do you not see that it is a straw that the cock is carrying and no beam immediately the enchantment vanished and the people saw what it was and drove the magician away in shame and disgrace he however full of inward anger said i will soon revenge myself after some time the girl's wedding day came and she was decked out and went in a great procession over the fields to the place where the church was all at once she came to a stream which was very much swollen and there was no bridge and no plank to cross it then the bride nimbly took her clothes up and wanted to wade through it and just as she was thus standing in the water a man and it was the enchanter cried mockingly close beside her aha where are thine eyes that thou takest that for water then her eyes were opened and she saw that she was standing with her clothes lifted up in the middle of a field that was blue with the flowers of blue flax then all the people saw it likewise and chased her away with ridicule and laughter End of Story 149story one fifty of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the old beggar woman and the three sluggards the old beggar woman there was once an old woman but thou hast surely seen an old woman go a-begging before now this woman begged likewise and when she got anything she said may god reward you the beggar woman came to a door and there by the fire a friendly rogue of a boy was standing warming himself the boy said kindly to the poor old woman as she was standing shivering thus by the door come old mother and warm yourself she came in but stood too near the fire so that her old rags began to burn and she was not aware of it the boy stood and saw that but he ought to have put the flames out is it not true that he ought to have put them out and if he had not any water then should he have wept all the water in his body out of his eyes and that would have supplied two pretty streams with which to extinguish them the three sluggards a certain king had three sons who were all equally dear to him and he did not know which of them to appoint as his successor after his own death when the time came when he was about to die he summoned them to his bedside and said dear children i have been thinking of something which i will declare unto you whichsoever of you is the laziest shall have the kingdom the eldest said then father the kingdom is mine for i am so idle that if i lie down to rest and a drop falls in my eye i will not open it that i may sleep the second said father the kingdom belongs to me for i am so idle that when i am sitting by the fire warming myself i would rather let my heel be burnt off than draw back my leg 
The third said, Father, the kingdom is mine, for I am so idle that if I were going to be hanged, and had the rope already round my neck, and anyone put a sharp knife into my hand with which I might cut the rope, I would rather let myself be hanged than raise my hand to the rope. When the father heard that, he said, Thou hast carried it the farthest, and shalt be king. End of Story 150「Story 151 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Twelve Idle Servants Twelve servants who had done nothing all the day would not exert themselves at night either, but laid themselves on the grass and boasted of their idleness. The first one said, oh, What is your laziness to me? I have to concern myself about mine own. The care of my body is my principal work. I eat not a little and drink still more. When I have had four meals, I fast a short time, until I feel hunger again. And that suits me best. To rise betimes is not for me, when it is getting near midday. I already seek out a resting place for myself. If the master call, I do exactly as if I had not heard him. And if he call for the second time, I wait a while before I get up, and go to him very slowly. In this way, life is endurable. The second one said, I have a horse to look after, but I leave the bit in his mouth, and if I do not want to do it, I give him no food, and I say he has had it already. I, however, lay myself in the oat chest, and sleep for four hours. After this I stretch out one foot, and move it a couple of times over the horse's body, and then he is combed and cleaned. Who is going to make a great business of that? Nevertheless, service is too toilsome for me. The third said, Why plague oneself with work? Nothing comes of it. I laid myself in the sun and fell asleep. It began to rain a little, but why should I get up? I let it rain on in God's name. At last came a splashing shower, so heavy indeed, that it pulled the hair out of my head and washed it away, and I got a hole in the skull. I put a plaster on it, and then it was all right. I have already had several injuries of the kind. The fourth said, If I am to undertake a piece of work, I first loiter about for an hour, that I may save up my strength. After that, I begin quite slowly, and ask if no one is there who could help me. Then I let him do the chief of the work and in reality only look on. But that also is still too much for me. The fifth said, What does that matter? Just think, I am to take away the manure for the horse's stable, and load the cart with it. I let it go on slowly, and if I have taken anything on the fork, I only half raise it up, and then I just rest a quarter of an hour, until I quite throw it in. It is enough and to spare if I take out a cartful in the day. I have no fancy for killing myself with work. The sixth said, Shame on ye! I am afraid of no work. But I lie down for three weeks, and never once take my clothes off. What is the use of buckling your shoes on, 
for aught I care, they may fall off my feet. It is no matter. If I am going up some steps, I drag one foot slowly after the other onto the first step, and then I count the rest of them, that I may know where I must rest. The seventh said, oh, That will not do with me. My master looks after my work. Only he is not at home the whole day, but I neglect nothing. I run as fast as it is possible to do when one crawls. If I am to get on, four sturdy men must push me with all their might. I came where six men were lying, sleeping on a bed beside each other. I lay down by them and slept too. There was no wakening me again, and when they wanted to have me home, they had to carry me. The eighth said, I see plainly that I am the only active fellow. If a stone lie before me, I do not give myself the trouble to raise my legs and step over it. I lay myself down on the ground, and if I am wet and covered with mud and dirt, I stay lying until the sun has dried me again. At the very most, I only turn myself so that it can shine on me. The ninth said, That is the right way. Today the bread was before me, but I was too idle to take it, and nearly died of hunger. Moreover, a jug stood by it, but it was so big and heavy that I did not like to lift it up, and preferred bearing thirst. Just to turn myself round was too much for me. I remained lying like a log the whole day. The tenth said, Laziness has brought misfortune on me, a broken leg and swollen calf. Three of us were lying in the road, and I had my leg stretched out. Someone came with a cart, and the wheels went over me. I might indeed have drawn my legs back, but I did not hear the cart coming, for the midges were humming about my ears and creeping in at my nose and out again at my mouth. Who can take the trouble to drive the vermin away? The eleventh said, I gave up my place yesterday. I had no fancy for carrying the heavy books to my master any longer, or fetching them away again. There was no end of it all day long. But to tell the truth, he gave me my dismissal, and would not keep me any longer, for his clothes, which I had left lying in the dust, were all moth-eaten, and I am very glad of it. The twelfth said, Today I had to drive the cart into the country, and made myself a bed of straw on it, and had a good sleep. The reins slipped out of my hand, and when I awoke, the horse had nearly torn itself loose. The harness was gone. The strap which fastened the horse to the shafts was gone, and so were the collar, the bridle, and bit. Someone had come by, who had carried it all off. Besides this, the cart had got into a quagmire and stuck fast. I left it standing and stretched myself on the straw again. At last the master came himself and pushed the cart out. And if he had not come, I should not be lying here, but there, and sleeping in full tranquility. End of Story 151「Story No. 152 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Turner of Huntsville, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Shepherd Boy there was once on a time a shepherd boy whose fame spread far and wide because of the wise answers which he gave to every question the king of the country heard of it likewise but did not believe it and sent for the boy 
Then he said to him, If thou canst give me an answer to three questions which I will ask thee, I will look on thee as my own child, and thou shalt dwell with me in my royal palace. The boy said, What are the three questions? The king said, The first is, How many drops of water are there in the ocean? The shepherd boy answered, Lord king, if you will have all the rivers on earth dammed up so that not a single drop runs from them into the sea until I have counted it, I will tell you how many drops there are in the sea. The king said, The next question is, How many stars are there in the sky? The shepherd boy said, Give me a great sheet of white paper. And then he made so many fine points on it with a pen that they could scarcely be seen. And it was all but impossible to count them. Any one who looked at them would have lost his sight. Then he said, There are as many stars in the sky as there are points on the paper. Just count them. But no one was able to do it. The king said, The third question is, How many seconds of time are there in eternity? Then said the shepherd boy, In lower Pomerania is the Diamond Mountain, which is two miles and a half high, two miles and a half wide, and two miles and a half in depth. Every hundred years a little bird comes and sharpens his beak on it, and when the whole mountain is worn away by this, then the first second of eternity will be over. The king said, Thou hast answered the three questions like a wise man, and shalt henceforth dwell with me in my royal palace, and I will regard thee as my own child. End of story number 152「Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Star Money There was once on a time a little girl whose father and mother were dead, and she was so poor that she no longer had any little room to live in or bed to sleep in, and at last she had nothing else but the clothes she was wearing, and a little bit of bread in her hand, which some charitable soul had given her. She was, however, good and pious, and as she was thus forsaken by all the world, she went forth into the open country, trusting in the good God. Then a poor man met her who said, Ah, give me something to eat, I am so hungry. She reached him the whole of her piece of bread and said, May God bless it to thy use, and went onwards. Then came a child who moaned and said, My head is so cold, give me something to cover it with. So she took off her hood and gave it to him, and when she had walked a little farther, she met another child who had no jacket and was frozen with cold. Then she gave it her own. And a little farther on, one begged for a frock, and she gave away that also. At length she got into a forest, and it had already become dark, and there came yet another child, and asked for a little shirt. And the good little girl thought to herself, It is a dark night, and no one sees thee. Thou canst very well give thy little shirt away, and took it off, and gave away that also. And as she so stood, and had not one single thing left, suddenly some stars from heaven fell down, and they were nothing else but hard, smooth pieces of money. And although she had just given her little shirt away, she had a new one, which was of the very finest linen. Then she gathered together the money into this, and was rich all the days of her life. End of Story 153
Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Stolen Farthings. A father was one day sitting at dinner with his wife and his children, and a good friend who had come on a visit was with them. And as they thus sat, and it was striking twelve o'clock, the stranger saw the door open, and a very pale child, dressed in snow white clothes, came in. It did not look around, and it did not speak, but went straight into the next room. Soon afterwards it came back, and went out at the door again in the same quiet manner. On the second and on the third day, it came also exactly in the same way. At last the stranger asked the father, to whom the beautiful child that went into the next room every day at noon belonged. I have never seen it, said he. Neither did he know to whom it could belong. The next day, when it again came, the stranger pointed it out to the father, who, however, did not see it. And the mother and the children also saw nothing. On this the stranger got up, went to the room door, opened it a little, and peeped in. Then he saw the child sitting on the ground, and digging and seeking about industriously amongst the crevices between the boards of the floor. But when it saw the stranger, it disappeared. He now told what he had seen, and described the child exactly. And the mother recognized it, and said, Ah, it is my dear child who died a month ago. They took up the boards and found two farthings, which the child had once received from its mother, that it might give them to a poor man. It, however, had thought, Thou canst buy thyself a biscuit for that, and it kept the farthings, and hidden them in the openings between the boards. And therefore it had had no rest in its grave, and had come every day at noon to seek for these farthings. The parents gave the money at once to a poor man, and after that the child was never seen again. End of Story 154「Story 155 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Brides on their trial. There was once a young shepherd who wished much to marry, and was acquainted with three sisters, who were all equally pretty, so that it was difficult to him to make a choice, and he could not decide to give the preference to any one of them. Then he asked his mother for advice, and she said, Invite all three, and set some cheese before them, and watch how they eat it. The youth did so. The first, however, swallowed the cheese with the rind on. The second hastily cut the rind off the cheese, but she cut it so quickly that she left much good cheese with it, and threw that away also. The third peeled the rind off carefully, and cut neither too much nor too little. The shepherd told all this to his mother, who said, Take the third for thy wife. This he did, and lived contentedly and happily with her. End of Story 155 Story 156 of 
Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Odds and Ends There was once on a time a maiden who was pretty, but idle and negligent. When she had to spin, she was so out of temper that if there was a little knot in the flax, she at once pulled out a whole heap of it and strewed it about on the ground beside her. Now she had a servant who was industrious and gathered together the bits of flax which were thrown away, cleaned them, spanned them fine, and had a beautiful gown made out of them for herself. A young man had wooed the lazy girl, and the wedding was to take place. On the eve of the wedding, the industrious one was dancing merrily about in her pretty dress, and the bride said, Ah, how that girl does jump about! dressed in my odds and ends. The bridegroom heard that, and asked the bride what she meant by it. Then she told him that the girl was wearing a dress, made of the flax which she had thrown away. When the bridegroom heard that, and saw how idle she was, and how industrious the poor girl was, he gave her up, and went to the other, and chose her as his wife. End of Story 156
Yes, father, said the son. But when the stable boys make traps and fix their gins and snares in the straw, many a one is caught fast. Where hast thou seen that? said the old bird. At court, among the stable boys. Oh, my son, court boys are bad boys. If thou hast been to court and among the lords, and hast left no feathers there, thou hast learned a fair amount, and wilt know very well how to go about the world. But look around thee and above thee, for the wolves devour the wisest dogs. The father examined the third also. Where didst thou seek thy safety? I have broken up tubs and ropes on the cart roads and highways, and sometimes met with a grain of corn or barley. That is indeed dainty fare, said the father. But take care what thou art about, and look carefully around, especially when thou seest any one stooping and about to pick up a stone. There is not much time to stay then. That is true, said the son. But what if any one should carry a bit of rock or ore ready beforehand in his breast or pocket? Where hast thou seen that? Amongst the mountaineers, dear father, when they go out, they generally take little bits of ore with them. Mountain folks are working folks and clever folks. If thou hast been among mountain lads, thou hast seen and learned something. But when thou goest thither, beware, for many a sparrow has been brought to a bad end by a mountain boy. At length the father came to the youngest son. Thou, my dear chirping nestling, wert always the silliest and weakest. Stay with me. The world has many rough, wicked birds, which have crooked beaks and long claws, and lie in wait for poor little birds and swallow them. Keep with those of thine own kind, and pick up little spiders and caterpillars from the trees or the house, and then thou wilt live long in peace. My dear father, he who feeds himself without injury to other people fares well, and no sparrow-hawk, eagle, or kite will hurt him if he specially commits himself and his lawful food, evening and morning, faithfully to God, who is the creator and preserver of all forest and village birds, who likewise heareth the cry and prayer of the young ravens, for no sparrow or wren ever falls to the ground except by his will. Where hast thou learnt this? The son answered, When the great blast of wind tore me away from thee, I came to a church, and there during the summer I have picked up the flies and spiders from the windows, and heard this discourse preached. The father of all sparrows fed me all the summer through, and kept me from all mischance, and from ferocious birds. In sooth, my dear son, if thou takest refuge in the churches, and helpest to clear away spiders and buzzing flies, and cries unto God like the young ravens, and commendest thyself to the eternal Creator, all will be well with thee, and that even if the whole world were full of wild malicious birds. He who to God commits his ways, in silence suffers, waits, and prays, preserves his faith and conscience pure. He is of God's protection, sure. End of 157。Story 158 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Story of Schlaraffenland. In the time of Schlaraffen, I went there and saw Rome and the Lateran hanging by a small silken thread, and a man without feet, who outran a swift horse, and a keen, sharp sword that cut through a bridge. 
there i saw a young ass with a silver nose which pursued two fleet hares and a lime tree that was very large on which hot cakes were growing there i saw a lean old goat which carried about a hundred cartloads of fat on his body and sixty loads of salt have i not told enough lies there i saw a plough ploughing without horse or cow and a child of one year threw four millstones from Ratisbon to Trevese, and from Trevese to Strasbourg, and a hawk swam over the Rhine, which he had a perfect right to do. There I heard some fishes begin to make such a disturbance with each other that it resounded as far as heaven, and sweet honey flowed like water from a deep valley at the top of a high mountain and these were strange things there were two crows which were mowing a meadow and i saw two gnats building a bridge and two doves tore a wolf to pieces two children brought forth two kids and two frogs threshed corn together there i saw two mice consecrating a bishop and two cats scratching out a bear's tongue then a snail came running up and killed two furious lions there stood a barber and shaved a woman's beard off and two sucking children bade their mother hold her tongue there i saw two greyhounds which brought a mill out of the water and a sorry old horse was beside it and said it was right and four horses were standing in the yard threshing corn with all their might and two goats were heating the stove and a red cow shot the bread into the oven then a cock crowed cock a doodle doo the story is all told cock a doodle doo end of Story 158story 159 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida household tales by jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, translated by Margaret Hunt. The Ditmarsh Tale of Wonders. I will tell you something. I saw two roasted fowls flying. They flew quickly and had their breasts turned to heaven and their backs to hell. And an anvil and a millstone swam across the Rhine prettily, slowly and gently and a frog sat on the ice at Whitsuntide, and ate a plowshare. Three fellows who wanted to catch a hare went on crutches and stilts. One of them was deaf, the second blind, the third dumb, and the fourth could not stir a step. Do you want to know how it was done? First, the blind man saw the hare running across the field. The dumb one called to the lame one, and the lame one seized it by the neck. There were certain men who wished to sail on dry land, and they set their sails in the wind, and sailed away over great fields. Then they sailed over a high mountain, and there they were miserably drowned. A crab was chasing a hare, which was running away at full speed, and high up on the roof lay a cow who had climbed up there, in that country the flies are as big as the goats are here open the window that the lies may fly out end of story 159 story 160 of 
Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. A Riddling Tale. Three women were changed into flowers which grew in the field, but one of them was allowed to be in her own home at night. Then, once when day was drawing near, and she was forced to go back to her companions in the field and become a flower again, she said to her husband, If thou wilt come this afternoon and gather me, I shall be set free, and henceforth stay with thee. And he did so. Now the question is, how did her husband know her? For the flowers were exactly alike, and without any difference. Answer. As she was at her home during the night, and not in the field, no dew fell on her, as it did on the others, and by this her husband knew her. End of Story 160「Household Tales」by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Snow White and Rose Red There was once a poor widow who lived in a lonely cottage. In front of the cottage was a garden, wherein stood two rose trees, one of which bore white and the other red roses. She had two children who were like the two rose trees, and one was called Snow White and the other Rose Red. They were good and happy, as busy and cheerful as ever two children in the world were. Only Snow White was more quiet and gentle than Rose Red. Rose Red liked better to run about in the meadows and fields, seeking flowers and catching butterflies. But Snow White sat at home with her mother and helped her with the housework or read to her when there was nothing to do. The two children were so fond of each other that they always held each other by the hand when they went out together. And when Snow White said, We will not leave each other, Rose Red answered, Never, so long as we live. And their mother would add, What one has she must share with the other. They often ran about the forest alone and gathered red berries, and no beasts did them any harm, but came close to them trustfully. The little hare would eat a cabbage leaf out of their hands, and the roe grazed by their side, the stag leapt merrily by them, and the birds sat still upon the boughs and sang whatever they knew. No mishap overtook them. If they had stayed too late in the forest and night came on, they laid themselves down near one another upon the moss and slept until morning came, and their mother knew this and had no distress on their account. Once, when they had spent the night in the wood and the dawn had roused them, they saw a beautiful child in a shining white dress sitting near their bed. He got up and looked quite kindly at them, but said nothing and went away into the forest. And when they looked round, they found that they had been sleeping quite close to a precipice, and would certainly have fallen into it in the darkness if they had gone only a few paces further. And their mother told them that it must have been an angel who watches over good children. Snow White and Rose Red kept their mother's little cottage so neat that it was a pleasure to look inside it. In the summer, Rose Red took care of the house, and every morning laid a wreath of flowers by her mother's bed before she awoke, in which there was a rose from each tree. In the winter, Snow White lit the fire and hung the kettle on the Rican. The kettle was of copper and shone like gold, so brightly was it polished. In the evening, when the snowflakes fell, the mother said, Go, Snow White, and bolt the door. And then they sat round the hearth, and the mother took her spectacles and read aloud out of a large book, and the two girls listened as they sat and span. And close by them lay a lamb upon the floor, and behind them upon a perch sat a white dove with its head hidden beneath its wings. One evening, as they were thus sitting comfortably together, someone knocked at the door as if he wished to be let in. The mother said, Quick, Rose Red, open the door, it must be a traveller who is seeking shelter. Rose Red went and pushed back the bolt, thinking that it was a poor man, 
but it was not it was a bear that stretched his broad black head within the door rose red screamed and sprang back the lamb bleated the dove fluttered and snow white hid herself behind her mother's bed but the bear began to speak and said do not be afraid i will do you no harm i am half frozen and only want to warm myself a little beside you poor bear said the mother lie down by the fire only take care that you do not burn your coat then she cried snow white rose red come out the bear will do you no harm he means well so they both came out and by and by the lamb and the dove came nearer and were not afraid of him the bear said here children knock the snow out of my coat a little so they brought the broom and swept the bear's hide clean and he stretched himself by the fire and growled contentedly and comfortably it was not long before they grew quite at home and played tricks with their clumsy guest they tugged his hair with their hands put their feet upon his back and rolled him about or they took a hazel switch and beat him and when he growled they laughed but the bear took it all in good part only when they were too rough he called out leave me alive children snowy white rosy red will you beat your lover dead when it was bedtime and the others went to bed the mother said to the bear you can lie there by the hearth and then you will be safe from the cold and the bad weather as soon as day dawned the two children let him out and he trotted across the snow into the forest henceforth the bear came every evening at the same time laid himself down by the hearth and let the children amuse themselves with him as much as they liked and they got so used to him that the doors were never fastened until their black friend had arrived when spring had come and all outside was green the bear said one morning to snow white now i must go away and cannot come back for the whole summer where are you going then dear bear asked snow white i must go into the forest and guard my treasures from the wicked dwarfs in the winter when the earth is frozen hard they are obliged to stay below and cannot work their way through but now when the sun has thawed and warmed the earth they break through it and come out to pry and steal and what once gets into their hands and in their caves does not easily see daylight again snow white was quite sorry for his going away and as she unbolted the door for him and the bear was hurrying out he caught against the vault and a piece of his hairy coat was torn off and it seemed to snow white as if she had seen gold shining through it but she was not sure about it the bear ran away quickly and was soon out of sight behind the trees a short time afterwards the mother sent her children into the forest to get firewood there they found a big tree which lay felled on the ground and close by the trunk something was jumping backwards and forwards in the grass but they could not make out what it was when they came nearer they saw a dwarf with an old withered face and a snow-white beard a yard long the end of the beard was caught in the crevice of the tree and the little fellow was jumping backwards and forwards like a dog tied to a rope and did not know what to do he glared at the girls with fiery red eyes and cried why do you stand there can you not come here and help me what are you about there little man asked rose red you stupid prying goose answered the dwarf i was going to split the tree to get a little wood for cooking the little bit of food that one of us wants gets burned up directly with thick logs we do not swallow so much as you coarse greedy folk i had just driven the wedge safely in and everything was going as i wished but the wretched wood was too smooth and suddenly sprang asunder and the tree closed so quickly that i could not pull out my beautiful white beard so now it is tight in and i cannot get away and the sleek silly milk-faced things laugh ah how odious you are the children tried very hard but they could not pull the beard out it was caught too fast i will run and fetch someone said rose red you senseless goose snarled the dwarf why should you fetch someone you are already too too many for me can you not think of something better don't be impatient said snow white i will help you and she pulled her scissors out of her pocket and cut off the end of the beard as soon as the dwarf felt himself free he laid hold of a bag which lay among the roots of the tree and which was full of gold and lifted it up grumbling to himself uncouth people to cut off a piece of my fine beard bad luck to you and then he swung the bag upon his back and went off without even once looking at the children some time after that snow white and rose red went to catch a dish of fish as they came near the brook they saw something like a large grasshopper jumping towards the water as if it were going to leap in they ran to it and found it was the dwarf where are you going said rose red you surely don't want to go into the water i am not such a fool cried the dwarf don't you see that the accursed fish wants to pull me in 
the little man had been sitting there fishing and unluckily the wind had twisted his beard with the fishing line just then a big fish bit and the feeble creature had not strength to pull it out the fish kept the upper hand and pulled the dwarf towards him he held on to all the reeds and rushes but it was of little good he was forced to follow the movements of the fish and was in urgent danger of being dragged into the water the girls came just in time they held him fast and tried to free his beard from the line but all in vain beard and line were entangled fast together nothing was left but to bring out the scissors and cut the beard whereby a small part of it was lost when the dwarf saw that he screamed out is that civil you toadstool to disfigure one's face was it not enough to clip off the end of my beard now you have cut off the best part of it i cannot let myself be seen by my people i wish you had been made to run the soles off your shoes then he took out a sack of pearls which lay in the rushes and without saying a word more he dragged it away and disappeared behind a stone it happened that soon afterwards the mother sent the two children to the town to buy needles and thread and laces and ribbons the road led them across a heath upon which huge pieces of rock lay strewn here and there now they noticed a large bird hovering in the air flying slowly round and round above them it sank lower and lower and at last settled on a rock not far off directly afterwards they heard a loud piteous cry they ran up and saw with horror that the eagle had seized their old acquaintance the dwarf and was going to carry him off the children full of pity at once took tight hold of the little man and pulled against the eagle so long that at last he let his booty go as soon as the dwarf had recovered from his first fright he cried with his shrill voice could you have not done it more carefully you dragged at my brown coat so that it is all torn and full of holes you helpless clumsy creatures then he took up a sack full of precious stones and slipped away again under a rock into his hole. The girls, who by this time were used to his thanklessness, went on their way and did their business in the town. As they crossed the heath again on their way home, they surprised the dwarf, who had emptied out his bag of precious stones in a clean spot, and had not thought that anyone would come there so late. The evening sun shone upon the brilliant stones. They glittered and sparkled with all colours so beautifully that the children stood still and looked at them. "'Why do you stand gaping there?' cried the dwarf, and his ashen-grey face became copper-red with rage. He was going on with his bad words when a loud growling was heard, and a black bear came trotting towards them out of the forest. The dwarf sprang up in a fright, but he could not get to his cave, for the bear was already close. Then, in the dread of his heart, he cried, "'Dear Mr. Bear, spare me. I will give you all my treasures. Look, the beautiful jewels lying there. Grant me my life. What do you want with such a slender little fellow as I? You would not feel me between your teeth. Come, take these two wicked girls. They are tender morsels for you, fat as young quails. For mercy's sake, eat them!' The bear took no heed of his words, but gave the wicked creature a single blow with his paw, and he did not move again. The girls had run away, but the bear called to them, snow white and rose red do not be afraid wait i will come with you then they knew his voice and waited and when he came up to them suddenly his bear skin fell off and he stood there a handsome man clothed all in gold i am a king's son he said and i was bewitched by that wicked dwarf who had stolen my treasures i have had to run about the forest as a savage bear until i was freed by his death now he has got his well-deserved punishment snow white was married to him and rose red to his brother and they divided between them the great treasure which the dwarf had gathered together in his cave the old mother lived peacefully and happily with her children for many years she took the two rose trees with her and they stood before her window and every year bore the most beautiful roses white and red end of story 161《is the master and how well all goes in his house when he has a wise servant who listens to his orders and does not obey them but prefers following his own wisdom 
A clever John of this kind was once sent out by his master to seek a lost cow. He stayed away a long time, and the master thought, Faithful John does not spare any pains over his work. As, however, he did not come back at all, the master was afraid lest some misfortune had befallen him, and set out himself to look for him. He had to search a long time, but at last he perceived the boy who was running up and down a large field. Now, dear John, said the master when he had got up to him, hast thou found the cow which I sent thee to seek? No, master, he answered. I have not found the cow, but then I have not looked for it. Then what hast thou looked for, John? Something better, and that luckily I have found. What is that, John? Three blackbirds, answered the boy. And where are they? asked the master. I see one of them, I hear the other, and I'm running after the third, answered the wise boy. Take example by this. Do not trouble yourselves about your masters or their orders, but rather do what comes into your head and pleases you, and then you will act just as wisely as prudent John. End of story 162。「Household Tales」by Jacob and Willem Graham Translated by Margaret Hunt The Glass Coffin Let no one ever say that a poor tailor cannot do great things and win high honors. All that is needed is that he should go to the right smithy, and what is of most consequence, that he should have good luck. A civil adroit tailor's apprentice once went out traveling and came into a great forest, and as he did not know the way, he lost himself. Night fell, and nothing was left for him to do but to seek a bed in this painful solitude. He might certainly have found a good bed on the soft moss, but the fear of wild beasts let him have no rest there, and at last he was forced to make up his mind to spend the night in a tree. He sought out a high oak, climbed up to the top of it, and thanked God that he had his goose with him, for otherwise the wind which blew over the top of the tree would have carried him away. After he had spent some hours in the darkness, not without fear and trembling, he saw at a very short distance the glimmer of a light, and as he thought that a human habitation might be there, where he would be better off than on the branches of a tree, he got carefully down and went towards the light. It guided him to a small hut that was woven together of reeds and rushes. He knocked boldly. The door opened, and by the light which came forth, he saw a little hoary old man who wore a coat made of bits of colored stuff sewn together. "'Who are you, and what do you want?' asked the man in a grumbling voice. "'I am a poor tailor,' he answered, "'whom night has surprised here in the wilderness, "'and I earnestly beg you to take me into your hut until morning.' "'Go on your way,' replied the old man in a surly voice. I will have nothing to do with runagates. Seek for yourself a shelter elsewhere. After these words he was about to slip into his hut again, but the tailor held him so tightly by the corner of his coat, and pleaded so piteously, that the old man, who was not so ill-natured as he wished to appear, was at last softened, and took him into the hut with him, where he gave him something to eat, and then pointed out to him a very good bed in a corner. The weary tailor needed no rocking, but slept sweetly till morning, but even then would not have thought of getting up if he had not been aroused by a great noise. A violent sound of screaming and roaring forced its way through the thin walls of the hut. The tailor, full of unwanted courage, jumped up, 
put his clothes on in haste and hurried out. Then, close by the hut, he saw a great black bull and a beautiful stag, which were just preparing for a violent struggle. They rushed at each other with such extreme rage that the ground shook with their trampling, and the air resounded with their cries. For a long time it was uncertain which of the two would gain the victory. At length the stag thrust his horns into his adversary's body, whereupon the bull fell to the earth with a terrific roar and was thoroughly dispatched by a few strokes from the stag. The tailor, who had watched the fight with astonishment, was still standing there motionless, when the stag in full career bounded up to him and before he could escape caught him up in his great horns. He had not much time to collect his thoughts, for it went in a swift race over stock and stone, mountain and valley, wood and meadow. He held on with both hands to the tops of the horns and resigned himself to his fate. It seemed, however, to him just as if he were flying away. At length the stag stopped in front of a wall of rock and gently let the tailor down. The tailor, more dead than alive, required a longer time than that to come to himself. When he had in some degree recovered, the stag, which had remained standing by him, pushed its horns with such force against a door which was in the rock that it sprang open. Flames of fire shot forth, after which followed a great smoke, which hid the stag from his sight. The tailor did not know what to do, or whither to turn, in order to get out of this desert and back to human beings again. Whilst he was standing thus undecided, a voice sounded out of the rock, which cried at him, Enter without fear, no evil shall befall you thee. He hesitated, but driven by a mysterious force, he obeyed the voice and went through the iron door into a large spacious hall, whose ceiling, walls, and floor were made of shining, polished square stones, and on each of which were cut letters, which were unknown to him. He looked at everything full of admiration, and was on the point of going out again, when he once more heard the voice which said to him, Step on the stone which lies in the middle of the hall, and great good fortune awaits thee. His courage had already grown so great that he obeyed the order. The stone began to give way under his feet, and sank slowly down into the depths. When it was once more firm, and the tailor looked around, he found himself in a hall which in size resembled the former. Here, however, there was more to look at and more to admire. Hollow places were cut in the walls, in which stood vases of transparent glass, which were filled with colored spirit or with a bluish vapor. On the floor of the hall, two great glass chests stood opposite to each other, which at once excited his curiosity. When he went to one of them, he saw inside it a handsome structure, like a castle surrounded by farm buildings, stables and barns, and a quantity of other good things. Everything was small, but exceedingly carefully and delicately made, and seemed to be cut out by a dexterous hand with the greatest exactitude. He might not have turned away his eyes from the consideration of this rarity for some time, if the voice had not once more made itself heard. It ordered him to turn round, and look at the glass chest which was standing opposite. How his admiration increased when he saw therein a maiden of the greatest beauty! She lay as if asleep, and was wrapped in her long fair hair, as in a precious mantle. Her eyes were closely shut, but the brightness of her complexion, and a ribbon which her breathing moved to and fro, left no doubt that she was alive. The tailor was looking at the beauty with beating heart, when she suddenly opened her eyes and stared up at the sight of him in joyful terror. Just heaven, cried she, my deliverance is at hand. Quick, quick, help me out of my prison. If thou pushest back the bolt on this glass coffin, then I shall be free. 
The tailor obeyed without delay, and she immediately raised up the glass lid, came out and hastened into the corner of the hall, where she covered herself with a large cloak. Then she seated herself on a stone, ordered the young man to come to her, and after she had imprinted a friendly kiss on his lips, she said, My long-desired deliverer, kind heaven has guided thee to me, and put an end to my sorrows. On the self-same day, when they end, shall thy happiness begin. Thou art the husband chosen for me by heaven, and shalt pass thy life in unbroken joy, loved by me, and rich to overflowing in every earthly possession. Seat thyself, and listen to the story of my lie. I am the daughter of a rich count. My parents died when I was still in my tender youth, and recommended me in their last will to my elder brother, by whom I was brought up. We loved each other so tenderly, and were so alike in our way of thinking and in our inclinations, that we both embraced the resolution never to marry, but to stay together to the end of our lives. In our house there was no lack of company. Neighbors and friends visited us often, and we showed the greatest hospitality to every one. So it came to pass one evening that a stranger came riding to our castle, and, under pretext of being not able to get on to the next place, begged for shelter for the night. We granted his request with ready courtesy, and he entertained us in the most agreeable manner during supper by conversation intermingled with stories. My brother liked the stranger so much that he begged him to spend a couple of days with us, to which, after some hesitation, he consented. We did not rise from the table until late at night. The stranger was shown to room, and I hastened, as I was tired, to lay my limbs in my soft bed. Hardly had I slept for a short time when the sound of faint and delightful music awoke me. As I could not conceive from whence it came, I wanted to summon my waiting maid, who slept in the next room. But to my astonishment, I found that speech was taken away from me by an unknown force. I felt as if a mountain were weighing down my breast, and was unable to make the very slightest sound. In the meantime, by the light of my night lamp, I saw the stranger enter my room through two doors which were fast bolted. He came to me and said that by magic arts, which were at his command, he had caused the lovely music to sound in order to awaken me, and that he now forced his way through all fastenings with the intention of offering me his hand and heart. My repugnance to his magic arts was, however, so great that I vouchsafed him no answer. He remained for a time standing without moving, apparently with the idea of waiting for a favorable decision. But as I continued to keep silence, he angrily declared he would revenge himself and find means to punish my pride, and left the room. I passed the night in the greatest disquietude, and only fell asleep towards morning. When I awoke, I hurried to my brother, but did not find him in his room, and the attendants told me that he had ridden forth with the stranger to the chase by daybreak. I at once suspected nothing good. I dressed myself quickly, ordered my palfrey to be saddled, and accompanied only by one servant, rode full gallop to the forest. The servant fell with his horse and could not follow me, for the forest had broken its foot. I pursued my way without halting, and in a few minutes I saw the stranger coming towards me with a beautiful stag, which he led by a cord. I asked him where he had left my brother and how he had come by this stag, out of whose great eyes I saw tears flowing. Instead of answering me, he began to laugh loudly. I fell into a great rage at this, pulled out a pistol, and discharged it at the monster. But the ball rebounded from his breast and went into my horse's head. I fell to the ground, and the stranger muttered some words which deprived me of consciousness. When I came to my senses again, I found myself in this underground cave, 
in a glass coffin. The magician appeared once again and said he had changed my brother into a stag. My castle, with all that belonged to it, diminished in size by his arts, and he had shut up in the other glass chest, and my people, who were all turned into smoke, he had confined in glass bottles. He told me that if I would now comply with his wish, it was an easy thing for him to put everything back in its former state, as he had nothing to do but open the vessels, and everything would return once more to its natural form. I answered him as little as I had done the first time. He vanished and left me in my prison, in which a deep sleep came on me. Amongst the visions which passed before my eyes, that was the most comforting in which a young man came and set me free. And when I opened my eyes today, I saw thee, and beheld my dream fulfilled. Help me to accomplish the other things which happened in those visions. The first is that we lift the glass chest in which my castle is enclosed on to that broad stone, and as the stone was laden, it began to rise up on high with the maiden and the young man, and mounted through the opening of the ceiling into the upper hall, from whence they then could easily reach the open air. Here the maiden opened the lid, and it was marvellous to behold how the castle the houses and the farm buildings which were enclosed stretched themselves out and grew to their natural size with the greatest rapidity after this the maiden and the tailor returned to the cave beneath the earth and had the vessels which were filled with smoke carried up by the stone the maiden had scarcely opened the bottles when the blue smoke rushed out and changed itself into living men in whom she recognized her servants and her people her joy was still more increased when her brother, who had killed a magician in the form of a bull, came out of the forest towards them in his human form, and on the selfsame day the maiden, in accordance with her promise, gave her hand at the altar to the lucky tailor. End of Story 163《Story 164 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Lazy Harry. Harry was lazy and although he had nothing else to do but drive his goat daily to pasture, he nevertheless groaned when he went home after his day's work was done. It is indeed a heavy burden, said he, and a wearisome employment to drive a goat into the field this way year after year till late into the autumn. If one could but lie down and sleep, but no, one must have one's eyes open lest it hurts the young trees or squeezes itself through the hedge into a garden or runs away altogether how can one have any rest or peace for one's life he seated himself collected his thoughts and considered how he could set his shoulders free from this burden for a long time all thinking was to no purpose but suddenly it was as if scales fell from his eyes. I know what I will do, he cried. I will marry fat Trina, who also has a goat, and can take mine out with hers, and then I shall have no more need to trouble myself. So Harry got up, set his weary legs in motion, and went right across the street, for it was no farther to where the parents of fat Trina lived, and asked for their industrious and virtuous daughter in marriage. The parents did not reflect long. Birds of a feather flocked together, they thought, and consented. So fat Trina became Harry's wife and led out both the goats. Harry had a good time of it and had no work that he required to rest from but his own idleness. He only went out with her now and then and said, I merely do it that I may afterwards enjoy rest more, otherwise one loses all feeling for it. But fat Trina was no less idle. Dear Harry, said she one day, 
why should we make our lives so toilsome when there was no need for it and thus ruin the best days of our youth would it not be better for us to give the two goats which disturb us every morning in our sweetest sleep with their bleeding to our neighbour and he will give us a beehive for them we will put the beehive in a sunny place behind the house and trouble ourselves no more about it bees do not require to be taken care of or driven into the field they fly out and find the way home again for themselves and collect honey without giving the very least trouble thou hast spoken like a sensible woman replied harry we will carry out thy proposal without delay and besides all that honey tastes better and nourishes one better than goat's milk and it can be kept longer too the neighbor willingly gave a beehive for the two goats the bees flew in and out from early morning till late evening without ever tiring and filled the hive with the most beautiful honey so that in autumn harry was able to take a whole pitcherful out of it they placed the jug on a board which was fixed to the wall of their bedroom and as they were afraid that it might be stolen from them or that the mice might find it trina brought in a stout hazel stick and put it beside her bed so that without unnecessary getting up she might reach it with her hand and drive away the uninvited guests lazy harry did not like to leave his bed before noon he who rises early said he wastes his substance one morning when he was still lying amongst the feathers in broad daylight resting after his long sleep he said to his wife women are fond of sweet things and thou art always tasting the honey in private it will be better for us to exchange it for a goose with a young gosling before thou eatest up the whole of it but answered trina not before we have a child to take care of them am i to worry myself with the little geese and spend all my strength on them to no purpose dost thou think said harry that the youngster will look after geese nowadays children no longer obey they do according to their own fancy because they consider themselves cleverer than their parents just like that lad who was sent to seek the cow and chased three blackbirds oh replied trina this one shall fare badly if he does not do what i say i will take a stick and belabor his skin for him with more blows than i can count look harry she cried in her zeal and seized the stick which she had to drive the mice away with look this is the way i will fall on him she reached her arm out to strike but unhappily hit the honey pitcher above the bed the pitcher struck against the wall and fell down in fragments and the fine honey streamed down on the ground there lie the goose and the young gosling said harry and want no looking after but it is lucky that the pitcher did not fall on my head we all have reason to be satisfied with our lot and then as he saw that there was still some honey in one of the fragments he stretched out his hand for it and said quite gaily the remains my wife we will still eat with a relish and we will rest a little after the fright we have had what matters if we do get up a little later the day is always long enough yes answered trina we shall always get to the end of it at the proper time dost thou know that the snail was once asked to a wedding and set out to go but arrived at the christening in front of the house it fell over the fence and said speed does no good end of story 164《Story 165 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee.《Household Tales》by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Griffin. There was once upon a time a king, but where he reigned and what he was called, I do not know. He had no son, but an only daughter who had always been ill, and no doctor had been able to cure her. Then it was foretold to the king that his daughter should eat herself well with an apple. So 
he ordered it to be proclaimed throughout the whole of his kingdom that whosoever brought his daughter an apple with which she could eat herself well should have her to wife and be king this became known to a peasant who had three sons and he said to the eldest go out into the garden and take a basket full of those beautiful apples with the red cheeks and carry them to the court perhaps the king's daughter will be able to eat herself well with them and then thou wilt marry her and be king the lad did so and set out when he had gone a short way he met a little iron man who asked him what he had there in the basket to which replied yuli for so was he named frog's legs on this the little man said well so shall it be and remain and went away at length yuli arrived at the palace and made it known that he had brought apples which would cure the king's daughter if she ate them this delighted the king hugely and he caused yuli to be brought before him but alas when he opened the basket instead of having apples in it he had frog legs which were still kicking about on this the king grew angry and had him driven out of the house when he got home he told his father how it had fared with him then the father sent the next son who was called simi but all went with him just as it had gone with yuli he also met the little iron man who asked what he had there in the basket simi said hogs bristles and the iron man said well so shall it be and remain when simi got to the king's palace and said he brought apples with which the king's daughter might eat herself well they did not want to let him go in and said that one fellow had already been there and had treated them as if they were fools simi however had maintained that he certainly had the apples and that they ought to let him go in at length they believed him and led him to the king but when he uncovered the basket he had but hogs bristles this enraged the king most terribly so he caused simi to be whipped out of the house when he got home he related all that had befallen him then the youngest boy whose name was hans but who was always called stupid hans came and asked his father if he might go with some apples oh said the father thou wouldst be just the right fellow for such a thing if the clever ones can't manage it what canst thou do the boy however did not believe him and said indeed father i wish to go just get away you stupid fool thou must wait till thou art wiser said the father to that and turned his back hans however pulled at the back of his smock frock and said indeed father i wish to go well then so far as i am concerned thou mayest go but thou wilt soon come home again replied the old man in a spiteful voice the boy however was tremendously delighted and jumped for joy well act like a fool thou growest more stupid every day said the father again hans however did not care about that and did not let it spoil his pleasure but as when it was night he thought he might wait until the morrow for he could not get to court that day all night long he could not sleep in his bed and if he did doze for a moment he dreamed of beautiful maidens of palaces of gold and of silver and all kinds of things of that sort early in the morning he went forth on his way and directly afterwards the little shabby-looking man in his iron clothes came to him and asked what he was carrying in the basket hans gave him the answer that he was carrying apples with which the king's daughter was to eat herself well then said the little man so shall they be and remain but at the court they would none of them let hans go in for they said two had already been there who had told them that they were bringing apples and one of them had frog legs and the other hogs bristles hans however resolutely maintained that he most certainly had no frog legs but some of the most beautiful apples in the whole kingdom as he spoke so pleasantly the doorkeeper thought he could not be telling a lie and asked him to go in and he was right for when hans uncovered his basket in the king's presence golden yellow apples came tumbling out the king was delighted and caused some of them to be taken to his daughter and then waited in anxious expectation until news should be brought to him of the effect they had 
But before much time had passed by, news was brought to him. But who do you think it was who came? It was his daughter herself. As soon as she had eaten of those apples, she was cured and sprang out of her bed. The joy the king felt cannot be described. But now he did not want to give his daughter in marriage to Hans, and said he must first make him a boat, which would go quicker on dry land than on water. Hans agreed to the conditions, and went home and related how it had fared with him. Then the father sent Yuli into the forest to make a boat of that kind. He worked diligently and whistled all the time. At midday, when the sun was at its highest, came the little iron man and asked what he was making. Yuli gave him for answer wooden bowls for the kitchen. The iron man said, So shall it be and remain. By evening, Yuli thought he had now made the boat, but when he wanted to get in it, he had nothing but wooden bowls. The next day, Simi went into the forest, but everything went with him just as it had done with Yuli. On the third day, stupid Hans went. He worked away most industriously, so that the whole forest resounded with heavy strokes, and all the while he sang and whistled right merrily. At midday, when it was the hottest, the little man came again and asked what he was making. A boat, which will go quicker on dry land than on the water, replied Hans, and when I have finished it, I am to have the king's daughter for my wife. Well, said the little man, such an one shall it be, and remain. In the evening, when the sun had turned into gold, Hans finished his boat, and all that was wanted for it. He got into it, and rowed to the palace. The boat went as swiftly as the wind. The king saw it from afar, but would not give his daughter to Hans yet, and said he must first take a hundred hares out to pasture from early morning until late evening and if one of them got away, he should not have his daughter. Hans was contented with this, and the next day went with his flock to the pasture, and took great care that none of them ran away. Before many hours had passed, came a servant from the palace and told Hans that he must give her a hare instantly, for some visitors had come unexpectedly. Hans, however, was very well aware what that meant and he said he would not give her one. The king might set some hair soup before his guest next day. The maid, however, would not believe in his refusal, and at last she began to get angry with him. Then Hans said that, if the king's daughter came herself, he would give her a hair. The maid told this in the palace, and the daughter did go herself. In the meantime, however, the little man came to Hans, and asked him what he was doing there. He said he had to watch over a hundred hares and see that none of them ran away, and then he might marry the king's daughter and be king. Good, said the little man. There is a whistle for thee, and if one of them runs away, just whistle with it, and then it will come back again. When the king's daughter came, Hans gave her hair into her apron, but when she had gone about a hundred steps with it, he whistled, and the hare jumped out of the apron, and before she could turn round, was back to the flock again. When the evening came, the hare herd whistled once more, and looked to see if all were there, and then drove them to the palace. The king wondered how Hans had been able to take a hundred hares to graze without losing any of them. He would, however, not give Hans his daughter yet, and said he must now bring him a feather from the griffin's tail. Hans set out at once, and walked straight forwards. In the evening he came to a castle, and there he asked for a night's lodging, for at that time there were no inns. The lord of the castle promised him that with much pleasure, and asked where he was going. Hans answered, To the griffin. Oh, the griffin! They tell me he knows everything, and I have lost the key of an iron money chest. So you might be so good as to ask him where it is. Yes, indeed, said Hans. I will do that. Early the next morning he went onwards, and on his way arrived at another castle, in which he again stayed the night. When the people who lived there learnt that he was going to the griffin, they said they had in the house a daughter who was ill, 
and that they had already tried every means to cure her, but none of them had done her any good, and he might be so kind as to ask the griffin what would make their daughter healthy again. Hans said he would willingly do that, and went onwards. Then he came to a lake, and instead of a ferry boat, a tall, tall man was there, who had to carry everybody across. The man asked Hans whether he was journeying. To the griffin, said Hans. Then, when you get to him, said the man, just ask him why I am forced to carry everybody over the lake. Yes, indeed, most certainly I'll do that, said Hans. Then the man took him up on his shoulders and carried him across. At length Hans arrived at the griffin's house, but the wife only was at home, and not the griffin himself. Then the woman asked him what he wanted. Thereupon he told her everything, that he had to get a feather out of the griffin's tail, and that there was a castle where they had lost the key to their money chest, and he was to ask the griffin where it was, that in another castle the daughter was ill, and he was to learn what would cure her. And then, not far from thence, there was a lake and a man beside it, who was forced to carry people across it, and he was very anxious to learn why the man was obliged to do it. Then said the woman, But look here, my good friend, no Christian can speak to the griffin. He devours them all. But if you like, you can lie down under his bed, and in the night, when he is quite fast asleep, you can reach out and pull a feather out of his tail. And as for those things which you are to learn, I will ask about them myself. Hans was quite satisfied with this. He got under the bed, and in the evening... The griffin came home, and as soon as he had entered the room, said, Wife, I smell a Christian. Yes, said the woman, one was here today, but he went away again, and on that the griffin said no more. In the middle of the night, when the griffin was snoring loudly, Hans reached out and plucked a feather from his tail. The griffin woke up instantly and said, Wife, I smell a Christian and it seems to me that somebody was pulling at my tail. His wife said, Thou hast certainly been dreaming, and I told thee before that a Christian was here today, but that he went away again. He told me all kinds of things, that in one castle they had lost the key to their money chest, and could find it nowhere. Oh, the fools, said the griffin, the key lies in the woodhouse, under a log of wood behind the door. And then he said, that in another castle the daughter was ill, and they knew no remedy that would cure her. Oh, the fools, said the griffin. Under the cellar steps a toad has made its nest of her hair, and if she got her hair back, she would be well. And then he also said that there was a place where there was a lake, and a man beside it who was forced to carry everybody across. Oh, the fools, said the griffin. If he only put one man down in the middle, he would never have to carry another across. Early the next morning, the griffin got up and went out. Then Hans came forth from under the bed, and he had a beautiful feather, and had heard what the griffin had said about the key, and the daughter, and the ferryman. The griffin's wife repeated it all once more to him, that he might not forget it, and then he went home again. First he came to the man by the lake who asked him what the griffin had said. But Hans replied that he must first carry him across, and then he would tell him. So the man carried him across, and when he was over, Hans told him that all he had to do was to set one person down in the middle of the lake, and then he would never have to carry over any more. The man was hugely delighted, and told Hans that, out of gratitude, he would take him once more across, and back again. But Hans said no, he would save him the trouble. He was quite satisfied already, and pursued his way. Then he came to the castle where the daughter was ill. He took her on his shoulders, for she could not walk, and carried her down the cellar steps, and pulled out the toad's nest from beneath the lowest step, and gave it to her hand, and she sprang off his shoulder 
and up the steps before him, and was quite cured. Then were the father and mother beyond measure rejoiced, and they gave Hans gifts of gold and of silver, and whatsoever else he wished for, that they gave him. And when he went to the other castle, he went at once into the wood house, and found the key under the log of wood behind the door, and took it to the lord of the castle. He also was not a little pleased, and gave Hans as a reward much of the gold that was in the chest, and all kinds of things besides, such as cows and sheep and goats. When Hans arrived before the king, with all these things, with the money, and the gold, and the silver, and the cows, sheep, and goats, the king asked him how he had come by them. Then Hans told him that the griffin gave every one whatsoever he wanted. So the king thought he himself could make such things useful, and set out on his way to the griffin. But when he got to the lake, it happened that he was the very first who had arrived there after Hans, and the man put him down in the middle of it and went away, and the king was drowned. Hans, however, married the daughter and became king. End of story 165story 166 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by melvin lee household tales by jacob and willem grimm translated by margaret hunt strong hans there were once a man and a woman who had only one child, and lived quite alone in a solitary valley. It came to pass that the mother once went into the woods to gather branches of fir, and took with her little Hans, who was just two years old. As it was springtime, and the child took pleasure in the many-colored flowers, she went still further onwards with him into the forest. Suddenly two robbers sprang out of the thicket, seized the mother and child, and carried them far away into the black forest where no one ever came from one year's end to the other. The poor woman urgently begged the robbers to set her and her child free. But their hearts were made of stone. They would not listen to her prayers and entreaties, and drove her on farther by force. After they had worked their way through the bushes and briars for about two miles, they came to a rock, where there was a door, at which the robbers knocked, and it opened at once. They had to go through a long, dark passage, and at last came into a great cavern, which was lighted by a fire which burnt on the hearth. On the wall hung swords, sabers, and other deadly weapons which gleamed in the light, and in the midst stood a black table, at which four other robbers were sitting gambling, and the captain sat at the head of it. As soon as he saw the woman, he came and spoke to her, and told her to be at ease and have no fear. They would do nothing to hurt her, but she must look after the housekeeping, and if she kept everything in order, she should not fare ill with them. Thereupon they gave her something to eat, and showed her a bed where she might sleep with her child. The woman stayed many years with the robbers, and Hans grew tall and strong. His mother told him stories, and taught him to read an old book of tales about knights, which she found in the cave. When Hans was nine years old, he made himself a strong club out of a branch of fir, hid it behind the bed, and then went to his mother and said, Dear mother, pray tell me who is my father. I must and will know. His mother was silent and would not tell him, that he might not become homesick. Moreover, she knew that the godless robbers would not let him go away, but it almost broke her heart that Hans should not go to his father. In the night, when the robbers came home from their robbing expedition, Hans brought out his club, stood before the captain, and said, I now wish to know who is my father, and if thou dost not at once tell me, I will strike thee down. Then the captain laughed, and gave Hans such a box on the ear that he rolled under the table. Hans got up again, held his tongue, and thought, I will wait another year, and then try again. Perhaps I shall do better then. When the year was over, he brought out his club again, rubbed the dust off it, looked at it well, and said, 
It is a stout, strong club. At night the robbers came home, drank one jug of wine after another, and their heads began to be heavy. Then Hans brought out his club, placed himself before the captain, and asked him who was his father. But the captain again gave him such a vigorous box on the ear that Hans rolled under the table. But it was not long before he was up again and beat the captain and the robbers so with his club that they could no longer move either their arms or their legs. His mother stood in a corner full of admiration of his bravery and strength. When Hans had done his work, he went to his mother and said, Now I have shown myself to be in earnest, but now I must also know who is my father. Dear Hans, answered the mother, come, we will go and seek him until we find him. She took from the captain the key to the entrance door, and Hans fetched a great meal sack, and packed into it gold and silver, and whatsoever else he could find that was beautiful, until it was full, and then he took it on his back. They left the cave, but how Hans did open his eyes when he came out of the darkness into daylight, and saw the green forest and the flowers and the birds, and the morning sun in the sky. He stood there and wondered at everything, just as if he had not been very wise. His mother looked for the way home, and when they had walked for a couple of hours, they got safely into their lonely valley and to their little house. The father was sitting in the doorway. He wept for joy when he recognized his wife and heard that Hans was his son, for he had long regarded them both as dead. But Hans, although he was not twelve years old, was a head taller than his father. They went into the little room together, but Hans had scarcely put his sack on the bench by the stove than the whole house began to crack. The bench broke down, and then the floor, and the heavy sack fell through into the cellar. God save us, cried the father. What's that? Now thou hast broken our little house to pieces. Don't grow any gray hairs about that, dear father, answered Hans. There in that sack is more than is wanting for a new house. The father and Hans at once began to build a new house, and to buy cattle and land, and to keep a farm. Hans plowed the fields, and when he followed the plow and pushed it into the ground, the bullocks had scarcely any need to draw. The next spring Hans said, Keep all the money, and get a walking stick that weighs a hundred weight, made for me that I may go a-traveling. When the wished-for stick was ready, he left his father's house, went forth, and came to a deep, dark forest. There he heard something crunching and cracking, looked round and saw a fir-tree, which was wound round like a rope, from the bottom to the top, and when he looked upwards, he saw a great fellow who had laid hold of the tree, and was twisting it like a willow-wand. Hello, cried Hans. What art thou doing up there? The fellow replied, I got some faggots together yesterday, and am twisting a rope for them. That is what I like, thought Hans. He has some strength. And he called to him, Leave that alone and come with me. The fellow came down, and he was taller by a whole head than Hans, and Hans was not little. Thy name is Fertwister, said Hans to him. Thereupon they went further and heard something knocking and hammering with such force that the ground shook at every stroke. Shortly afterwards they came to a mighty rock, before which a giant was standing and striking great pieces of it away with his fist. When Hans asked what he was about, he answered, At night, when I want to sleep, bears, wolves, and other vermin of that kind come, which sniff and snuffle about me, and won't let me rest. So I want to build myself a house, and lay myself inside it, so that I may have some peace. Oh, indeed, thought Hans, I can make use of this one also. And said to him, Leave thy house building alone, and go with me. Thou shalt be called Rock Splitter. The man consented, and they all three roamed through the forest. And wherever they went, the wild beasts were terrified, and ran away from them. In the evening they came to an old deserted castle went up into it, and laid themselves down in the hall to sleep. The next morning Hans went into the garden. It had run quite wild, 
and was full of thorns and bushes, and as he was thus walking round about, a wild boar rushed at him. He, however, gave it such a blow with his club that it fell directly. He took it on his shoulders and carried it in, and they put it on a spit, roasted it, and enjoyed themselves. Then they arranged that each day in turn two should go out hunting, and one should stay at home, and cook nine pounds of meat for each of them. Fur Twister stayed at home the first, and Hans and Rock Splitter went out hunting. When Fur Twister was busy cooking, a little shriveled-up old mannequin came to him in the castle and asked for some meat. Be off, sly hypocrite, he answered. Thou needest no meat. But how astonished Fur Twister was when the little insignificant dwarf sprang up at him and belabored him so with his fists that he could not defend himself but fell on the ground and gasped for breath. The wharf did not go away until he had thoroughly vented his anger on him. When the two others came home from hunting, Fur Twister said nothing to them of the old mannequin and of the blows which he himself had received, and thought, when they stay at home, they may just try their chance with a little scrubbing brush, and the mere thought of that gave him pleasure already. The next day Rock Splitter stayed at home, and he fared just as Fur Twister had done. He was very ill-treated by the dwarf because he was not willing to give him any meat. When the others came home in the evening, Fur Twister easily saw what he had suffered, but both kept silence and thought, Hans also must taste some of that soup. Hans, who had to stay at home the next day, did his work in the kitchen as it had been done, and as he was standing skimming the pan, a dwarf came and without more ado had demanded a bit of meat. And Hans thought, He is a poor wretch. I will give him some of my share, that the others may not run short, and handed him a bit. When the dwarf had devoured it, he again asked for some meat, and good-natured Hans gave it to him and told him it was a handsome piece, and that he was to be content with it. But the dwarf begged again for the third time. Thou shameless, said Hans, and gave him none. Then the malicious dwarf wanted to spring on him and treat him as he had treated Fur Twister and Rock Splitter, but he had got to the wrong man. Hans, without exerting himself much, gave him a couple of blows, which made him jump down the castle steps. Hans was about to run after him, but fell right over him, for he was tall. When he rose up again, the dwarf had got the start of him. Hans hurried after him as far as the forest, and saw him slip into a hole in the rock. Hans now went home, but he had marked the spot. When the two others came back, they were surprised that Hans was so well. He told them what had happened, and then they no longer concealed how it had fared with them. Hans laughed and said, It served you quite right. Why were you so greedy with your meat? It is a disgrace that you, who are so big, should have let yourself be beaten by the dwarf. Thereupon they took a basket and a rope, and all three went to the hole in the rock into which the dwarf had slipped, and let Hans and his club down in the basket. When Hans had reached the bottom, he found a door, and when he opened it, a maiden was sitting there who was lovely as any picture, nay, so beautiful that no words can express it and by her side sat the dwarf and grinned at hans like a sea-cat she however was bound with chains and looked so mournfully at him that hans felt great pity for her and thought to himself thou must deliver her out of the power of the wicked dwarf and gave him such a blow with his club that he fell down dead immediately the chains fell from the maiden and Hans was enraptured with her beauty. She told him she was a king's daughter, whom a savage count had stolen away from her home, and imprisoned her there among the rocks, because she would have nothing to say to him. The count had, however, set the dwarf as a watchman, and he had made her bear misery and vexation enough. And now Hans placed the maiden in the basket, and had her drawn up, the basket came down again, but Hans did not trust his two companions and thought, They have already shown themselves to be false, and told me nothing about the dwarf, 
who knows what design they may have against me so he put his club in the basket and it was lucky he did for when the basket was halfway up they let it fall again and if hans had really been sitting in it he would have been killed but now he did not know how he was to work his way out of the depths and when he turned it over and over in his mind he found no counsel it is indeed sad said he to himself that i have to waste away down here and as he was thus walking backwards and forwards he once more came to the little chamber where the maiden had been sitting and saw that the dwarf had a ring on his finger which shone and sparkled then he drew it off and put it on and when he turned it round on his finger he suddenly heard something rustle over his head and he looked up and saw spirits of the air hovering above he told him he was their master and asked what his desire might be hans was at first struck dumb but afterwards he said that they were to carry him above again they obeyed instantly and it was just as if he had flown up himself when however he was above again he found no one in sight fir twister and rock splitter had hurried away and had taken the beautiful maiden with them but hans turned the ring and the spirits of the air came and told him that the two were on the sea hans ran and ran without stopping until he came to the seashore and there far far out on the water he perceived a little boat in which his faithless comrades were sitting and in fierce anger he leapt without thinking what he was doing but the club which weighed a hundred weight dragged him deep down until he was all but drowned then in the very nick of time he turned his ring and immediately the spirits of the air came and bore him as swift as lightning into the boat he swung his club and gave his wicked comrades the reward they merited and threw them into the water and then he sailed with the beautiful maiden who had been in the greatest alarm and whom he delivered for the second time home to her father and mother and married her and all rejoiced exceedingly End of story 166Story 167 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. And translated by Margaret Hunt. The Peasant in Heaven once on a time a poor pious peasant died and arrived before the gate of heaven at the same time a very rich rich lord came there who also wanted to get into heaven then saint peter came with the key and opened the door and let the great man in but apparently did not see the peasant and shut the door again and now the peasant outside heard how the great man was received in heaven with all kinds of rejoicing and how they were making music and singing within. At length all became quiet again, and St. Peter came and opened the gate of heaven, and let the peasant in. The peasant, however, expected that they would make music and sing when he went in also, but all remained quite quiet. He was received with great affection, it is true, and the angels came to meet him, but no one sang. Then the peasant asked St. Peter, how it was that they did not sing for him as they had done when the rich man went in and said that it seemed to him that there in heaven things were done with just as much partiality as on earth then said st peter by no means thou art just as dear to us as any one else and wilt enjoy every heavenly delight that the rich man enjoys but poor fellows like thee come to heaven every day but a rich man like this does not come more than once in a hundred years. End of story 167 Story 168 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Lean Lisa. Lean Lisa was of a very different way of thinking from Lazy Harry and Fat Trina, who never let anything disturb their peace. She scoured everything with ashes, from morning till evening, and burdened her husband, Long Lawrence, with so much work that he had heavier weights to carry than an ass with three sacks. It was, however, all to no purpose. They had nothing, and came to nothing. One night, as she lay in bed, and could hardly move one limb for weariness, she still did not allow her thoughts to go to sleep. She thrust her elbows into her husband's side, and said, Listen, Lenz, to what I have been thinking. If I were to find one florin, and one was given to me, I would borrow another to put to them, and thou too shouldst give me another, and then as soon as I had got the four florins together, I would buy a young cow. This pleased the husband right well. It is true, said he, that I do not know where I am to get the florin which thou wantst as a gift from me, but if thou canst get the money together, and canst buy a cow with it, thou wilt do well to carry out thy project. I shall be glad, he added, if the cow has a calf, and then I shall often get a drink of milk to refresh me. The milk is not for thee, said the woman. We must let the calf suck, that it may become big and fat, and we may be able to sell it well. Certainly, replied the man, but still we will take a little milk. That will do no harm. Who has taught thee to manage cows? said the woman. Whether it does harm or not, I will not allow it. And even if thou wert to stand on thy head for it, thou shouldst not have a drop of the milk. Dost thou think, because there is no satisfying thee, long Lawrence, that thou art to eat up what I earn with so much difficulty? Wife, said the man, be quiet, or I will give thee a blow on thy mouth. What? cried she. Thou threatenest me, thou glutton, thou rascal, thou lazy hairy. She was just laying hold of his hair, but long Lawrence got up, seized both leanly swithered arms in one hand, and with the other he pressed down her head into the pillow, let her scold, and held her until she fell asleep for very weariness. Whether she continued to wrangle when she awoke next morning, or whether she went out to look for the florin which she wanted to find, that I know not. End of story 168Story 169 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Hut in the Forest. A poor woodcutter lived with his wife and three daughters in a little hut on the edge of a lonely forest. One morning, as he was about to go to his work, he said to his wife, Let my dinner be brought into the forest to me by my eldest daughter, or I shall never get my work done. And in order that she may not miss her way, he added, I will take a bag of millet with me, and strew the seeds on the path. When, therefore, the sun was just above the center of the forest, the girl set out on her way with a bowl of soup, but the field sparrows and wood sparrows, larks and finches, blackbirds and siskins, had picked up the millet long before, and the girl could not find the track. Then, trusting to chance, she went on and on, until the sun sank and night began to fall. The trees rustled in the darkness, the owls hooted, and she began to be afraid. Then in the distance she perceived a light which glimmered between the trees. There ought to be some people living there who can take me in for the night, she thought, and went up to the light. It was not long before she came to a house, the windows of which were all lighted up. She knocked, and a rough voice from inside cried, Come in. 
The girl stepped into the dark entrance and knocked at the door of the room. Just come in, cried the voice, and when she opened the door, an old gray-haired man was sitting at the table, supporting his face with both hands, and his white beard fell down over the table, almost as far as the ground. By the stove lay three animals, a hen, a cock, and a brindled cow. The girl told her story to the old man and begged for shelter for the night. The man said, Pretty little hen, pretty little cock, and pretty brindled cow. What say ye to that? Ducks, answered the animals, and that must have meant we are willing. For the old man said, Here you shall have shelter and food. Go to the fire and cook us our supper. The girl found in the kitchen abundance of everything and cooked a good supper, but had no thought of the animals. She carried the full dishes to the table, seated herself by the gray-haired man, ate, and satisfied her hunger. When she had had enough, she said, But now I am tired. Where is there a bed in which I can lie down and sleep? The animals replied, Thou hast eaten with him. Thou hast drunk with him. Thou hast had no thought for us. So find out for yourself where thou canst pass the night. Then said the old man, just go upstairs, and thou wilt find a room with two beds. Shake them up, and put white linen on them, and then I too will come and lie down to sleep. The girl went up, and when she had shaken the beds out, put clean sheets on, she lay down in one of them, without waiting any longer for the old man. After some time, however, the gray-haired man came up, took his candle, looked at the girl, and shook his head. When he saw that she had fallen into a sound sleep, he opened a trap door and let her down into the cellar. Late at night the woodcutter came home and reproached his wife for leaving him to hunger all day. It is not my fault, she replied. The girl went out with your dinner and must have lost herself, but she is sure to come back tomorrow. The woodcutter, however, arose before dawn to go into the forest and requested that the second daughter should take him his dinner that day. I will take a bag of lentils, said he. The seeds are larger than millet. The girl will see them better, and can't lose her way. At dinner time, therefore, the girl took out the food, but the lentils had disappeared. The birds of the forest had picked them up as they had done the day before, and had left none. The girl wandered about in the forest until night, and then she too reached the house of the old man, was told to go in, and begged for food and a bed. The man with the white beard again asked the animals, Pretty little hen, pretty little cock, and pretty brindle cow, what say ye to that? The animals again replied, Ducks, and everything happened just as it had happened the day before. The girl cooked a good meal, ate and drank with the old man, and did not concern herself about the animals. And when she inquired about her bed, they answered, Thou hast eaten with him, thou hast drunk with him, thou hast had no thought for us, to find out for yourself where thou canst pass the night. When she was asleep, the old man came, looked at her, shook his head, and let her down into the cellar. On the third morning, Woodcutter said to his wife, Send our youngest child out with my dinner today. She has always been good and obedient, and will stay in the right path, and not run about after every wild humble bee, as her sisters did. The mother did not want to do it, and said, Am I to lose my dearest child as well? Have no fear, he replied. The girl will not go astray. She is too prudent and too sensible. Besides, I will take some peas with me, and strew them about. They are still larger than lentils, and will show her the way. But when the girl went out, with a basket on her arm, the wood pigeons had already got all the peas in their crops, and she did not know which way she was to turn. She was full of sorrow, and never ceased to think how hungry her father would be, and how her good mother would grieve if she did not go home. At length, when it grew dark, she saw the light and came to the house in the forest, 
She begged quite prettily to be allowed to spend the night there, and the man with the white beard once more asked his animals, Pretty little hen, pretty little cock, and beautiful brindled cow, what say ye to that? Ducks, they said. Then the girl went to the stove where the animals were lying and petted the cock and hen and stroked their smooth feathers with her hand and caressed the brindled cow between her horns. And when, in obedience to the old man's orders, she had made ready some good soup and the bowl was placed upon the table, she said, Am I to eat as much as I want and the good animals to have nothing? Outside is food in plenty. I will look after them first. So she went out and brought some barley and stewed it for the cock and hen and a whole armful of sweet-smelling hay for the cow. I hope you will take it, dear animal, said she, and you shall have a refreshing draught in case you are thirsty. Then she fetched in a bucket full of water and the cock and hen jumped on the edge of it and dipped their beaks in, and then held up their heads as the birds do when they drink, and the brindled cow also took a hearty draught. When the animals were fed, the girl seated herself at the table by the old man and ate what he had left. It was not long before the cock and the hen began to thrust their heads beneath their wings, and the eyes of the cow likewise began to blink. Then said the girl, Ought we not to go to bed? Pretty little hen, pretty little cock, and pretty brindled cow. What say ye to that? The animals answered, Ducks, thou hast eaten with us, thou hast drunk with us, thou hast had kind thought for all of us. We wish thee good night. Then the maiden went upstairs, shook the feather beds, and laid clean sheets on them. And when she had done it, the old man came and lay down on one of the beds, and his white beard reached down to his feet. The girl lay down on the other side, said her prayers, and fell asleep. She slept quietly till midnight, and then there was such a noise in the house that she awoke. There was a sound of cracking and splitting in every corner, and the door sprang open and beat against the walls. The beams groaned as if they were being torn out of their joints. It seemed as if the staircase were falling down, and at length there was a crash, as if the entire roof had fallen in. As, however, all grew quiet once more, and the girl was not hurt, she stayed quietly laying where she was, and fell asleep again. But when she woke up in the morning, with the brilliancy of the sunshine, what did her eyes behold? She was lying in a vast hall and everything around her shone with royal splendor. On the walls, golden flowers grew up on a ground of green silk. The bed was of ivory and the canopy of red velvet, and on the chair close by was a pair of shoes embroidered with pearls. The girl believed that she was in a dream, but three richly clad attendants came in and asked what orders she would like to give. If you will go, she replied, I will get up at once and make ready some soup for the old man, and then I will feed the pretty little hen and the cock and the beautiful brindled cow. She thought the old man was up already and looked round at his bed. He, however, was not lying in it, but a stranger, and while she was looking at him and becoming aware that he was young and handsome, he awoke, sat up in bed and said, I am a king's son, and was bewitched by a wicked witch and made to live in this forest as an old gray-haired man. No one was allowed to be with me but my three attendants in the form of a cock, a hen, and a brindled cow. The spell was not to be broken until a girl came to us whose heart was so good that she showed herself full of love, not only towards mankind, but toward animals, and that thou hast done, and by thee at midnight we were all set free, and the old hut in the forest was changed back again into my royal palace. And when they had arisen, the king's son ordered the three attendants to set out and fetch the father and mother of the girl to the marriage feast. But where are my two sisters? inquired the maiden. 
I have locked them in the cellar, and tomorrow they shall be led into the forest, and shall live as servants to a charcoal burner, until they have grown kinder, and do not leave poor animals to suffer hunger. End of Story 169「Story 170 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Sharing Joy and Sorrow. There once was a tailor, who was a quarrelsome fellow, and his wife, who was good, industrious and pious never could please him whatever she did he was not satisfied but grumbled and scolded and knocked her about and beat her as the authorities at last heard of it they had him summoned and put in prison in order to make him better he was kept for a while on bread and water and then set free again he was forced however to promise not to beat his wife any more but to live with her in peace and share joy and sorrow with her as married people ought to do all went on well for a time but then he fell into his old ways and was surly and quarrelsome and because he dared not beat her he would seize her by the hair and tear it out the woman escaped from him and sprang out into the yard but he ran after her with his yard measure and scissors and chased her about and threw the yard measure and scissors at her and whatever else came his way when he hit her he laughed and when he missed her he stormed and swore this went on so long that the neighbors came to the wife's assistance the tailor was again summoned before the magistrates and reminded of his promise dear gentlemen said he i have kept my word i have not beaten her but have shared joy and sorrow with her how can that be said the judge when she continually brings such heavy complaints against you i have not beaten her but just because she looked so strange i wanted to comb her hair with my hand she however got away from me and left me quite spitefully then i hurried after her and in order to bring her back to her duty i threw at her as a well-meant admonition whatever came readily to hand i have shared joy and sorrow with her also for whenever i hit her i was full of joy and she of sorrow and if i missed her then she was joyful and i sorry the judges were not satisfied with this answer, but gave him the reward he deserved. End of Story 170 Story number 171 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gareth Goodison. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Willow Wren. In former days, every sound still had its meaning and application. When the smith's hammer resounded, it cried, Strike away! Strike away! When the carpenter's plane grated, it said, Here goes! Here goes! If the mill wheel began to clack, it said, Help! Lord God! Help! Lord God! And if the miller was a cheat, and happened to leave the mill, it spoke high German, and first asked slowly, Who is there? Who is there? And then answered quickly, The miller! The miller! And at last, quite in a hurry, he steals bravely, he steals bravely, three pecks in a bushel. At this time, the birds also had their own language, which everyone understood. Now it only sounds like chirping, screeching, and whistling, and to some, like music without words. It came into the bird's mind, however, that they would no longer be without a ruler, and would choose one of themselves to be their king. One alone amongst them, the green plover, was opposed to this. He lived free, and would die free. And anxiously flying hither and thither, he cried, Where shall I go? Where shall I go? He retired into a solitary and unfrequented marsh, 
and showed himself no more among his fellows. The birds now wished to discuss the matter, and on a fine May morning they all gathered together from the woods and fields. Eagles and chaffinches, owls and crows, larks and sparrows. How can I name them all? Even the cuckoo came, and the hoopoe, his clerk, who is so called because he is always heard a few days before him, and a very small bird which as yet had no name mingled with the band. The hen, which by some accident had heard nothing of the whole matter, was astonished at the great assemblage. What? What? What is going to be done? she cackled. But the cock calmed his beloved hen, and said, Only rich people, and told her what they had on hand. It was decided, however, that the one who could fly the highest should be king. A tree frog, which was sitting among the bushes, when he heard that, cried a warning. No, 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 because he thought that many tears would be shed because of this. But the crow said, Caw, caw, and that all would pass off peaceably. It was now determined that on this fine morning he should at once begin to ascend, so that hereafter no one should be able to say, I could easily have flown much higher, but the evening came on, and I could do no more. On a given signal, therefore, the whole troop rose up in the air. The dust ascended from the land, and there was a tremendous fluttering and whirring and beating of wings, and it looked as if a black cloud was rising up. The little birds were, however, soon left behind. They could go no farther and fell back to the ground. The larger birds held out longer, but none could equal the eagle, who mounted so high that he could have picked the eyes out of the sun. And when he saw that the others could not get up to him, he thought, Why shouldst thou fly still higher? Thou art the king, and began to let himself down again. The birds beneath him at once cried to him, Thou must be our king. No one has flown so high as thou. Except me screamed the little fellow without a name, who had crept into the breast feathers of the eagle. And as he was not at all tired, he rose up and mounted so high that he reached heaven itself. When, however, he had gone as far as this, he folded his wings together and called down with clear and penetrating voice, I am king! I am king! Thou art king! cried the birds angrily. Thou hast compassed it by trick and cunning! So they made another condition. He should be king who could go down lowest in the ground. How the goose did flap about with its broad breast when it was once more on the land. How quickly the cock scratched a hole. The duck came off the worst of all, for she leapt into a ditch, but sprained her legs and waddled away to a neighboring pond, crying, Cheating! Cheating! The little bird without a name, however, sought out a mouse hole, slipped down into it, and cried out with his small voice, I am king! I am king! Thou art king, cried the bird still more angrily. Dost thou think thy cunning shall prevail? They determined to keep him a prisoner in the hole and starve him out. The owl was placed as sentinel in front of it, and was not to let the rascal out if she had any value for her life. When evening was come, all the birds were feeling very tired after exerting their wings so much, so they went to bed with their wives and children. The owl alone remained standing by the mouse hole, gazing steadfastly into it with her great eyes. In the meantime, she too had grown tired and thought to herself, You might certainly shut one eye. You will still watch with the other, and the little miscreant shall not come out of his hole. So she shut one eye, and with the other looked straight at the mouse hole. The little fellow put his head out and peeped, and wanted to slip away. But the owl came forward immediately, and he drew his head back again. Then the owl opened the one eye again and shut the other, intending to shut them in turn all through the night. But when she next shut the one eye, she forgot to open the other. And as soon as both her eyes were shut, 
she fell asleep. The little fellow soon observed that and slipped away. From that day forth, the owl has never dared to show herself by daylight, for if she does, the other birds chase her and pluck her feathers out. She only flies out by night, but hates and pursues mice, because they make such ugly holes. The little bird, too, is very unwilling to let himself be seen, because he is afraid it will cost him his life if he is caught. He steals about in the hedges, and when he is quite safe, he sometimes cries, I am king. And for this reason, the other birds call him in mockery, King of the Hedges. No one, however, was so happy as the lark at not having to obey the little king. As soon as the sun appears, she ascends high in the air and cries, Ah, how beautiful that is! Beautiful that is! Beautiful, beautiful, ah, how beautiful that is. End of story 171「because no order prevailed in their kingdom. None of them turned aside for the others, but all swam to the right or the left, as they fancied, or darted between those who wanted to stay together, or got into their way. And a strong one gave a weak one a blow with its tail, which drove it away, or else swallowed it up without more ado. "'How delightful it would be,' said they, "'if we had a king who enforced law and justice among us.' and they met together to choose for their ruler, the one who could cleave through the water most quickly, and give help to the weak ones. They placed themselves in rank and file by the shore, and the pike gave the signal with his tail, on which they all started. Like an arrow, the pike darted away, and with him the herring, the gudgeon, the perch, the carp, and all the rest of them. Even the soul swam with them, and hoped to reach the winning place. All at once the cry was heard. "'The herring is first! "'Who is first? screamed angrily the flat, envious soul, who had been left far behind. "'Who is first? "'The herring! "'The herring!' was the answer. "'The naked herring?' cried the jealous creature. "'The naked herring?' Since that time the soul's mouth has been at one side for a punishment." End of story 172 Story 173 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt the bittern and the hoopoe. "'Where do you like best to feed your flocks?' said a man to an old cowherd. "'Yes, sir, where the grass is neither too rich nor too poor, or else it is no use.' "'Why not?' asked the man. "'Do you hear that melancholy cry from the meadow there?' answered the shepherd. That is the bittern. He was once a shepherd, and so was the hoopoe also. I will tell you the story. The bittern pastured his flocks on rich green meadows where flowers grew in abundance, so his cows became wild and unmanageable. The hoopoe drove his cattle on to high barren hills, where the wind plays with the sand, and his cows became thin and got no strength. When it was evening, and the shepherds wanted to drive their cows homewards, the bittern could not get his together again. They were too high-spirited, 
and ran away from him. He called, Come, cows, come! But it was of no use. They took no notice of his calling. The hoopoe, however, could not even get his cows up on their legs. So faint and weak had they become. Up, up, up! screamed he. But it was in vain. They remained lying on the sand. That is the way when one has no moderation. And to this day, though they have no flocks now to watch, the bittern cries, Come, cows, come! And the hoopoe, up, up, up! End of story 173「An extraordinary event took place in a little town. By some mischance, one of the great owls, called Horned Owls, had come from the neighboring woods into the barn of one of the townsfolk in the night time, and when day broke, did not dare to venture forth again from her retreat for fear of the other birds, which raised a terrible outcry whenever she appeared. In the morning, when the manservant went into the barn to fetch some straw, he was so mightily alarmed at the sight of the owl sitting there in the corner that he ran away and announced to his master that a monster, the like of which he had never set eyes on in his life, and which could devour a man without the slightest difficulty, was sitting in the barn, rolling its eyes about in its head. "'I know you already,' said the master. "'You have courage enough to chase a blackbird about the fields.' But when you see a dead hen lying, you have to get a stick before you go near it. I must go and see for myself what kind of a monster it is, added the master, and went quite boldly into the granary and looked round him. When, however, he saw the strange grim creature with his own eyes, he was no less terrified than the servant had been. With two bounds, he sprang out ran to his neighbors, and begged them imploringly to lend him assistance against an unknown and dangerous beast, or else the whole town might be in danger if it were to break loose out of the barn, where it was shut up. A great noise and clamor arose in all the streets. The townsmen came armed with spears, hayforks, scythes, and axes, as if they were going out against an enemy. Finally the senators appeared with the burgomaster at their head. When they had drawn up in the marketplace, they marched to the barn and surrounded it on all sides. Thereupon one of the most courageous of them stepped forth, and entered with his spear lowered, but came running out immediately afterwards with a shriek, and as pale as death, and could not utter a single word. Yet two others ventured in, but they fared no better. At last one stepped forth, a great strong man who was famous for his warlike deeds, and said, You will not drive away the monster by merely looking at him. We must be in earnest here, but I see that you have all turned into women, and not one of you dares to encounter the animal. He ordered them to give him some armor, had a sword and spear brought, and armed himself. All praised his courage though many feared for his life. The two barn doors were opened, and they saw the owl, which in the meantime had perched itself on the middle of a great cross-beam. He had a ladder brought, and when he raised it, and made ready to climb up, they all cried out to him that he was to bear himself bravely, and commended him to St. George, who slew the dragon. When he had just got to the top, and the owl perceived that he had designs on her, and was also bewildered by the crowd and the shouting, and knew not how to escape, she rolled her eyes, ruffled her feathers, flapped her wings, snapped her beak, and cried, Do it, 
to woo in a harsh voice strike home strike home screamed the crowd outside to the valiant hero anyone who is standing where i am standing answered he would not cry strike home he certainly did plant his foot one rung higher on the ladder but then he began to tremble and half fainting went back again and now there was no one left who dared to put himself in such danger the monster they said has poisoned and mortally wounded the very strongest man among us by snapping at him and just breathing on him are we too to risk our lives they took counsel as to what they ought to do to prevent the whole town being destroyed for a long time everything seemed to be of no use but at length the burgomeister found an expedient my opinion said he is that we ought out of the common purse to pay for this barn and whatsoever corn straw or hay it contains and thus indemnify the owner and then burn down the whole building and the terrible beast with it thus no one will have to endanger his life this is no time for thinking of expense and niggardliness will be ill applied all agreed with him so they set fire to the barn at all four corners and with it the owl was miserably burnt let any one who will not believe it go thither and inquire for himself end of story 174「Story number 175 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Moon. In days gone by, there was a land where the nights were always dark and the sky spread over it like a black cloud, for there the moon never rose, and no star shone in the obscurity. At the creation of the world, the light at night had been sufficient. Three young fellows once went out of this country on a traveling expedition, and arrived in another kingdom where, in the evening when the sun had disappeared behind the mountains, a shining globe was placed on an oak tree, which shed a soft light far and wide. By means of this, everything could be very well seen and distinguished, even though it was not so brilliant as the sun. The traveler stopped and asked a countryman who was driving past with his cart what kind of a light that was. That is the moon, he answered. Our mayor bought it for three thalers and fastened it to the oak tree. He has to pour oil into it daily, and to keep it clean, so that it may always burn clearly. He receives a thaler a week from us for doing it. When the countryman had driven away, one of them said, We could make some use of this lamp. We have an oak tree at home, which is just as big as this, and we could hang it on that. What a pleasure it would be not to have to feel about at night in the darkness. I'll tell you what we'll do, said the second. We will fetch a cart and horses, and carry away the moon. The people here may buy themselves another. I am a good climber, said the third. I will bring it down. The fourth brought a cart and horses, and the third climbed a tree, bored a hole in the moon, passed a rope through it, and let it down. When the shining ball lay in the cart, they covered it over with a cloth, that no one might observe the theft. They conveyed it safely into their own country, and placed it on a high oak old and young rejoiced when the new lamp let its light shine over the whole land and bedrooms and sitting-rooms were filled with it the dwarfs came forth from their caves in the rocks and the tiny elves in their little red coats danced in rings on the meadows the four took care that the moon was provided with oil cleaned the wick and received their weekly thaler but they became old men and when one of them grew ill and saw that he was about to die, he appointed that one quarter of the moon should, as his property, be laid in the grave with him. When he died, the mayor climbed up the tree and cut off a quarter with the hedge shears, 
and this was placed in his coffin. The light of the moon decreased, but still not visibly. When the second died, the second quarter was buried with him, and the light diminished. It grew weaker still after the death of the third, who likewise took his part of it away with him. And when the fourth was born to his grave, the old state of darkness recommenced, and whenever the people went out at night without their lanterns, they knocked their heads together. When, however, the pieces of the moon had united themselves together again in the world below, where darkness had always prevailed, it came to pass that the dead became restless and awoke from their sleep. They were astonished when they were able to see again. The moonlight was quite sufficient for them, for their eyes had been so weak that they could not have borne the brilliance of the sun. They rose up and were merry and fell into their former ways of living. Some of them went to play and to dance. Others hastened to the public houses, where they asked for wine, got drunk, brawled, quarreled, and at last took up cudgels and belabored each other. The noise became greater and greater, and at last reached even to heaven. St. Peter, who guards the gate of heaven, thought the lower world had broken out in revolt, and gathered together the heavenly troops, which are to drive back the evil one when he and his associates storm the abode of the blessed. As these, however, did not come, he got onto his horse and rode through the gate of heaven, down into the world below. There he reduced the dead to subjection, bade them lie down in their graves again, took the moon away with him, and hung it up in heaven. End of Story 175「Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm and translated by Margaret Hunt The Duration of Life when God had created the world and was about to fix the length of each creature's life, the ass came and asked, Lord, how long shall I live? Thirty years, replied God, does that content thee? Ah, Lord, answered the ass, that is a long time. Think of my painful existence. To carry heavy burdens from morning to night, to drag sacks of corn to the mill that others may eat bread, to be cheered and refreshed with nothing but blows and kicks relieve me of a portion of this long time then god had pity on him and relieved him of eighteen years the ass went away comforted and the dog appeared how long wouldst thou like to live said god to him thirty years are too many for the ass but thou wilt be satisfied with that lord answered the dog is that thy will consider how i shall have to run my feet will never hold out so long and when i have once lost my voice for barking and my teeth for biting what will be left for me to do but run from one corner to another and growl god saw that he was right and released him from twelve years of life then came the monkey thou wilt certainly live thirty years willingly said the lord to him Thou hast no need to work as the ass and the dog have to do, and wilt always enjoy thyself. Ah, Lord, he answered, it may seem as if that were the case, but it is quite different. When it rains porridge, I have no spoon. I am always to play merry pranks and make faces which force people to laugh, and if they give me an apple and I bite into it, why, it is sour. How often sadness hides itself behind mirth. I shall never be able to hold out for thirty years. God was gracious and took off ten. At last man appeared, joyous, healthy, and vigorous, and begged God to appoint his time for him. Thirty years shalt thou live, said the Lord. Is that enough for thee? What a short time, cried man, when I have built my house and my fire burns on my own hearth, when I have planted trees which blossom and bear fruit and am just intending to enjoy my life, I am to die? O oh Lord, lengthen my time. 
I will add to it the asses eighteen years, said God. That is not enough, replied the man. Thou shalt also have the dogs twelve years. Still too little. Well then, said God, I will give thee the monkeys ten years also, but more thou shalt not have. The man went away, but was not satisfied. So man lives seventy years. The first thirty are his human years, which are soon gone. Then is he healthy, merry, works with pleasure, and is glad of his life. Then follow the asses eighteen years, when one burden after another is laid on him. He has to carry the corn which feeds others, and blows and kicks are the reward of his faithful services. Then come the dogs twelve years, when he lies in the corner and growls, and has no longer any teeth to bite with. And when this time is over, the monkeys ten years form the end. Then man is weak-headed and foolish, does silly things, and becomes the jest of the children. End of story 176Story 177 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Death's Messengers. In ancient times, a giant was once traveling on a great highway, when suddenly an unknown man sprang up before him and said, Halt, not one step farther. What, cried the giant, a creature whom I can crush between my fingers wants to block my way? Who art thou, that thou darest to speak so boldly? I am death, cried the other. No one resists me and thou also must obey my commands. But the giant refused, and began to struggle with death. It was a long, violent battle. At last the giant got the upper hand, and struck death down with his fist, so that he dropped by a stone. The giant went his way, and death lay there conquered, and so weak that he could not get up again. What will be done now, said he, if I stay lying here in a corner, no one will die in the world, and it will get so full of people that they won't have room to stand beside each other. In the meantime, a young man came along the road who was strong and healthy, singing a song and glancing around on every side. When he saw the half-fainting one, he went compassionately to him, raised him up, poured a strengthening draught out of his flask for him, and waited till he came round. Dost thou know, said the stranger, while he was getting up, who I am, and who it is whom thou hast helped on his legs again? No, answered the youth, I do not know thee. I am death, said he, I spare no one, and can make no exception with thee. But, that thou mayest see that I am grateful, I promise thee that I will not fall on thee unexpectedly but will send my messengers to thee before I come and take thee away. Well, said the youth, it is something gained, that I shall know when thou comest, and at any rate be safe from thee for so long. Then he went on his way, and was light-hearted, and enjoyed himself, and lived without thought. But youth and health did not last long. Soon came sickness and sorrow, which tormented him by day, and took away his rest by night. Die I shall not, said he to himself, for death will send his messengers before that. But I do wish these wretched days of sickness were over. As soon as he felt himself well again, he began once more to live merrily. Then one day someone tapped him on the shoulder. He looked round, and death stood behind him and said, Follow me, the hour of thy departure from this world has come. What, replied the man, wilt thou break thy word? Didst thou not promise me that thou wouldst send thy messengers to me before coming thyself? I have seen none. Silence, answered death. Have I not sent one messenger to thee after another? Did not fever come and smite thee 
and shake thee and cast thee down has dizziness not bewildered thy head has not gout twitched thee in all thy limbs did not thine ears sing did not toothache bite into thy cheeks was it not dark before thine eyes and besides all that has not my own brother sleep reminded thee every night of me didst thou not lie by night as if thou wert already dead the man could make no answer he yielded to his fate and went away with death end of story 177「Master Pfriem was a short, thin, but lively man who never rested a moment. His face, of which his turned-up nose was the only prominent feature, was marked with smallpox and pale as death. His hair was grey and shaggy, his eyes small, but they glanced perpetually about on all sides. He saw everything, criticised everything, knew everything best, and was always in the right. When he went into the streets, he moved his arms about as if he were rowing, and once he struck the pail of a girl who was carrying water so high in the air that he himself was wetted all over by it. "'Stupid thing!' cried he to her while he was shaking himself. "'Couldst thou not see that I was coming behind thee?' By trade he was a shoemaker, and when he worked he pulled his thread out with such force that he drove his fist into every one who did not keep far enough off. No apprentice stayed more than a month with him, for he had always some fault to find with the very best work. At one time it was that the stitches were not even, at another that one shoe was too long, or one heel higher than the other, or the leather not cut large enough. Wait, said he to his apprentice, I will soon show thee how we make skin soft, and he brought a strap and gave him a couple of strokes across the back. He called them all sluggards. He himself did not turn much work out of his hands, for he never sat still for a quarter of an hour. If his wife got up very early in the morning and lighted the fire, he jumped out of bed and ran barefooted into the kitchen, crying, "'Wilt thou burn my house down for me? That is a fire one could roast an ox by. Does wood cost nothing?' If the servants were standing by their wash-tubs and laughing, and telling each other all they knew, he scolded them and said, There stand the geese cackling, and forgetting their work to gossip, and why fresh soap? Disgraceful extravagance, and shameful idleness into the bargain. They want to save their hands, and not rub the things properly. And out he would run and knock a pail full of soap and water over, so that the whole kitchen was flooded. Someone was building a new house, so he hurried to the window to look on. There, they are using that red sandstone again that never dries, cried he. No one will ever be healthy in that house. And just look how badly the fellows are laying the stones. Besides, the mortar is good for nothing. It ought to have gravel in it, not sand. I shall live to see that house tumble down on the people who are in it. He sat down put a couple of stitches in, and then jumped up again, unfastened his leather apron, and cried, I will just go out and appeal to those men's consciences. He stumbled on the carpenters. What's this? cried he. You are not working by the line. Do you expect the beams to be straight? One wrong will put all wrong. He snatched an axe out of a carpenter's hand, and wanted to show him how he ought to cut, but as a cart loaded with clay came by, he threw the axe away and hastened to the peasant who was walking by the side of it. "'You are not in your right mind,' said he. "'Who yokes young horses to a heavily laden cart? The poor beast will die on the spot!' The peasant did not give him an answer, and Friem, in a rage, ran back into his workshop. When he was setting himself to work again, the apprentice reached him a shoe. "'Well, what's that again?' 
screamed he. Haven't I told you you ought not to cut shoes so broad? Who would buy a shoe like this, which is hardly anything else but a sole? I insist on my orders being followed exactly. Master, answered the apprentice, you may easily be quite right about the shoe being a bad one, but it is the one which you yourself cut out and yourself set to work at. When you jumped up a while since, you knocked it off the table, and I have only just picked it up. An angel from heaven, however, would never make you believe that. One night, Master Pfriem dreamed he was dead and on his way to heaven. When he got there, he knocked loudly at the door. I wonder, said he to himself, that they have no knocker on the door. One knocks one's knuckles sore. The apostle Peter opened the door and wanted to see who demanded admission so noisily. Ah, it's you, Master Pfriem, said he. Well, I'll let you in, but I warn you that you must give up that habit of yours and find fault with nothing you see in heaven, or you may fare ill. You might have spared your warning, answered Pfriem. I know already what is seemly, and here, God be thanked, everything is perfect and there is nothing to blame as there is on earth so he went in and walked up and down the wide expanses of heaven he looked around him to the left and to the right but sometimes shook his head or muttered something to himself then he saw two angels who were carrying away a beam it was the beam which someone had had in his own eye whilst he was looking for the splinter in the eye of another they did not however carry the beam lengthways but obliquely did any one ever see such a piece of stupidity thought master pfriem but he said nothing and seemed satisfied with it it comes to the same thing after all whichever way they carry the beam straight or crooked if they only get along with it and truly i do not see them knock against anything soon after this he saw two angels who were drawing water out of a well into a bucket but at the same time he observed that the bucket was full of holes and that the water was running out of it on every side they were watering the earth with rain hang it he exclaimed but happily recollected himself and thought perhaps it is only a pastime if it is an amusement then it seems they can do useless things of this kind even here in heaven where people as i have already noticed do nothing but idle about he went farther and saw a cart which had stuck fast in a deep hole it's no wonder said he to the man who stood by it who would load so unreasonably what have you there good wishes replied the man i could not go along the right way with it but still i have pushed it safely up here and they won't leave me sticking here in fact an angel did come and harness two horses to it that's quite right thought pfriem but two horses won't get that card out it must at least have four to it another angel came and brought two more horses she did not however harness them in front of it but behind that was too much for master pfriem clumsy creature he burst out with what are you doing there has any one ever since the world began seen a car drawn in that way but you in your conceited arrogance think that you know everything best he was going to say more but one of the inhabitants of heaven seized him by the throat and pushed him forth with irresistible strength beneath the gateway master pfriem turned his head round to take one more look at the cart and saw that it was being raised into the air by four winged horses at this moment master pfriem awoke things are certainly arranged in heaven otherwise than they are on earth said he to himself and that excuses much but who can see horses harnessed both behind and before with patience to be sure they had wings but who could know that it is besides great folly to fix a pair of wings to a horse that has four legs to run with already but i must get up or else they will make nothing but mistakes for me in my house it is a lucky thing for me though that i am not really dead end of story 178
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Story 179 The Goose Girl at the Well. There was once upon a time a very old woman who lived with her flock of geese in a waste place among the mountains, and there had a little house. The waste was surrounded by a large forest, and every morning the old woman took her crutch and hobbled into it. There, however, the dame was quite active, more so than anyone would have thought, considering her age, and collected grass for her geese, picked all the wild fruit she could reach, and carried everything home on her back. Anyone would have thought that the heavy load would have weighed her to the ground, but she always brought it safely home. If anyone met her, she greeted him quite courteously. Good day, dear countryman. It is a fine day. Ah, you wonder that I should drag grass about, but everyone must take his burthen on his back. Nevertheless, people did not like to meet her if they could help it, and took by preference a roundabout way and when a father with his boys passed her, he whispered to them, Beware of the old woman. She has claws beneath her gloves. She is a witch. One morning a handsome young man was going through the forest. The sun shone bright, the birds sang, a cool breeze crept through the leaves, and he was full of joy and gladness. He had as yet met no one, when he suddenly perceived the old witch kneeling on the ground, cutting grass with a sickle. She had already thrust a whole load into her cloth, and near it stood two baskets, which were filled with wild apples and pears. But good little mother, said he, how canst thou carry all that away? I must carry it, dear sir, answered she. Rich folks' children have no need to do such things, but with the peasant folk, the saying goes, don't look behind you. You will only see how crooked your back is. Will you help me? She said, as he remained standing by her. You still have a straight back and young legs. It would be a trifle to you. Besides, my house is not so very far from here. It stands there on the heath behind the hill. How soon you would bound up thither. The young man took compassion on the old woman. My father is certainly no peasant, replied he, but a rich count. Nevertheless, that you may see that it is not only peasants who can carry things, I will take your bundle. If you will try it, said she, I shall be very glad. You will certainly have to walk for an hour, but what will that signify to you? Only you must carry the apples and pears as well. It now seemed to the young man just a little serious when he heard of an hour's walk, but the old woman would not let him off, packed the bundle on his back, and hung the two baskets on his arm. See, it is quite light, said she. No, it is not light, answered the count, and pulled a rueful face. Verily the bundle weighs as heavily as if it were full of cobblestones, and the apples and pears are as heavy as lead. I can scarcely breathe. He had a mind to put everything down again, but the old woman would not allow it. Just look, said she mockingly. The young gentleman will not carry what I, an old woman, have so often dragged along. You are ready with fine words, but when it comes to be earnest, you want to take to your heels. Why are you standing loitering there? She continued. Step out. No one will take the bundle off again. As long as he walked on level ground, it was still bearable. But when they came to the hill and had to climb, and the stones rolled under his feet as if they were alive, it was beyond his strength. The drops of perspiration stood on his forehead and ran hot and cold down his back. Dame, said he, I can go no farther. I want to rest a little. Not here, answered the old woman. When we have arrived at our journey's end, you can rest. But now you must go forward. 
Who knows what good it may do you? Old woman, thou art becoming shameless, said the Count, and tried to throw off the bundle, but he labored in vain. It stuck as fast to his back as if it grew there. He turned and twisted, but he could not get rid of it. The old woman laughed at this and sprang about quite delighted on her crutch. Don't get angry, dear sir, said she. You are growing as red in the face as a turkey cock. Carry your bundle patiently. I will give you a good present when we get home. What could he do? He was obliged to submit to his fate and crawl along patiently behind the old woman. She seemed to grow more and more nimble, and his burden still heavier. All at once she made a spring, jumped onto the bundle, and seated herself on the top of it. And however withered she might be, she was yet heavier than the stoutest country lass. The youth's knees trembled, but when he did not go on, the old woman hit him about the legs with a switch and with stinging nettles. Groaning continually, he climbed the mountain and at length reached the old woman's house, when he was just about to drop. When the geese perceived the old woman, they flapped their wings, stretched out their necks, ran to meet her, cackling all the while. Behind the flock walked, stick in hand, an old wench, strong and big, but ugly as night. Good mother, she said to the old woman, has anything happened to you? You have stayed away so long. By no means, my dear daughter, answered she. I have met with nothing bad, but on the contrary, with this kind gentleman who has carried my burthen for me. Only think, he even took me on his back when I was tired. The way, too, has not seemed long to us. We have been merry and have been cracking jokes with each other all the time. At last the old woman slid down, took the bundle off the young man's back and the baskets from his arm, looked at him quite kindly and said, now seat yourself on the bench before the door and rest. You have fairly earned your wages, and they shall not be wanting. Then she said to the goose girl, Go into the house, my dear daughter. It is not becoming for thee to be alone with a young gentleman. One must not pour oil onto the fire. He might fall in love with thee. The count knew not whether to laugh or to cry. Such a sweetheart as that, thought he, could not touch my heart even if she were thirty years younger. In the meantime, the old woman stroked and fondled her geese as if they were children, and then went into the house with her daughter. The youth lay down on the bench under a wild apple tree. The air was warm and mild. On all sides stretched a green meadow, which was set with cowslips, wild thyme, and a thousand other flowers. Through the midst of it rippled a clear brook on which the sun sparkled, and the white geese went walking backwards and forwards, or paddled in the water. It is quite delightful here, said he, but I am so tired that I cannot keep my eyes open. I will sleep a little, if only a gust of wind does not come and blow my legs off my body, for they are as rotten as tinder. When he had slept a little while, the old woman came and shook him till he woke up. Sit up, said she. Thou canst not stay here. I have certainly treated thee hardly, still it has not cost thee thy life. Of money and land the house no need, so here is something else for thee. Thereupon she thrust a little book into his hand, which was cut out of a single emerald. Take great care of it, she said. It will bring thee good fortune. The count sprang up, and as he felt he was quite fresh and had recovered his vigor, he thanked the old woman for her present and set off without even once looking back at the beautiful daughter. When he was already some way off, he still heard in the distance the noisy cry of the geese. For three days the count had to wander in the wilderness before he could find his way out. He then reached a large town, and as no one knew him, he was led into the royal palace, where the king and queen were sitting on their throne. The count fell on one knee, drew the emerald book out of his pocket, and laid it at the queen's feet. She bade him rise and hand her the little book. Hardly, however, had she opened it and looked therein, than she fell as if dead to the ground. The count was seized by the king's servants, and was being led to prison, 
when the queen opened her eyes and ordered them to release him, and everyone was to go out, as she wished to speak with him in private. When the queen was alone, she began to weep bitterly and said, Oh, of what use to me are the splendors and honors with which I am surrounded? Every morning I awake in pain and sorrow. I had three daughters, the youngest of whom was so beautiful that the whole world looked on her as a wonder. She was as white as snow, as rosy as apple blossom, and her hair as radiant as sunbeams. When she cried, not tears fell from her eyes, but pearls and jewels only. When she was fifteen years old, the king summoned all three sisters to come before his throne. You should have seen how all the people gazed when the youngest entered. It was as just as if the sun were rising. Then the king spoke. My daughters, I know not when my last day may arrive. I will today decide what each shall receive at my death. You all love me, but the one of you who loves me best shall fare the best. Each of them said she loved him best. Can you not express to me, said the king, how much you do love me, and thus I shall see what you mean? The eldest spoke. I love my father as dearly as the sweetest sugar. The second. I love my father as dearly as my prettiest dress. But the youngest was silent, and then the father said, And thou, my dearest child, how much dost thou love me? I do not know and can compare my love with nothing. But her father insisted that she should name something. So she said at last, The best food does not please me without salt. Therefore, I love my father like salt. When the king heard that, he fell into a passion and said, Thou lovest me like salt. Thy love shall also be repaid thee with salt. Then he divided the kingdom between the two elder, but caused a sack of salt to be bound on the back of the youngest, and two servants had to lead her forth into the wild forest. We all begged and prayed for her, said the queen, but the king's anger was not to be appeased. How she cried when she had to leave us. The whole road was strewn with the pearls which flowed from her eyes. The king soon afterwards repented of his great severity, and had the whole forest searched for the poor child, but no one could find her. When I think that the wild beasts have devoured her, I know not how to contain myself for sorrow. Many a time I console myself with the hope that she is still alive, and may have hidden herself in a cave, or has found shelter with compassionate people. But picture to yourself when I opened your little emerald book. A pearl lay therein, of exactly the same kind as those which used to fall from my daughter's eyes, and then you can also imagine how the sight of it stirred my heart. You must tell me how you came by that pearl. The Count told her that he had received it from the old woman in the forest, who had appeared very strange to him, and must be a witch. But he had neither seen nor heard anything of the queen's child. The king and the queen resolved to seek out the old woman. They thought that where the pearl had been, they would obtain news of their daughter. The old woman was sitting in that lonely place at her spinning wheel, spinning. It was already dusk, and a log which was burning on the hearth gave a scanty light. All at once there was a noise outside. The geese were coming home from the pasture and uttering their hoarse cries. Soon afterwards the daughter also entered, but the old woman scarcely thanked her and only shook her head a little. The daughter sat down beside her, took her spinning wheel, and twisted the threads as nimbly as a young girl. Thus they both sat for two hours and exchanged never a word. At last something rustled at the window and two fiery eyes peered in. It was an old night owl which cried, Woohoo! three times. The old woman looked up just a little, and then she said, Now, my little daughter, it's time for thee to go out and do thy work. She rose and went out, and where did she go? Over the meadows, ever onward into the valley. At last she came to a well, with three old oak trees standing beside it. Meanwhile the moon had risen large and round over the mountain, and it was so light that one could have found a needle. 
she removed a skin which covered her face, then bent down to the well and began to wash herself. When she had finished, she dipped the skin also in the water, and then laid it on the meadow so that it should bleach in the moonlight and dry again. But how the maiden was changed! Such a change as that was never seen before. When the gray mask fell off, her golden hair broke forth like sunbeams and spread about like a mantle over her whole form. Her eyes shone out as brightly as the stars in heaven, and her cheeks bloomed a soft red like apple blossom. But the fair maiden was sad. She sat down and wept bitterly. One tear after another forced itself out of her eyes and rolled through her long hair to the ground. There she sat, and would have remained sitting a long time, if there had not been a rustling and cracking in the boughs of the neighboring tree. She sprang up like a roe which has been overtaken by the shot of the hunter. Just then the moon was obscured by a dark cloud, and in an instant the maiden had put on the old skin and vanished, like a light blown out by the wind. She ran back home, trembling like an aspen leaf. The old woman was standing on the threshold and the girl was about to relate what had befallen her. But the old woman laughed kindly and said, I already know all. She led her into the room and lighted a new log. She did not, however, sit down to her spinning again, but fetched a broom and began to sweep and scour. All must be clean and sweet, she said to the girl. But mother, said the maiden, why do you begin to work at so late an hour? What do you expect? "'Dost thou know when what time it is?' asked the old woman. "'Not yet midnight,' answered the maiden, "'but already past eleven o'clock.' "'Dost thou not remember,' continued the old woman, "'that it is three years to-day since thou camest to me? "'Thy time is up. "'We can no longer remain together.' "'The girl was terrified and said, "'Alas, dear mother, will you cast me off? "'Where shall I go?' I have no friends and no home to which I can go. I have always done as you bade me, and you have always been satisfied with me. Do not send me away. The old woman would not tell the maiden what lay before her. My stay here is over, she said to her, but when I depart, house and parlor must be clean. Therefore, do not hinder me in my work. Have no care for thyself. Thou shalt find a roof to shelter thee and the wages which I will give thee shall also content thee. But tell me what is about to happen, the maiden continued to entreat. I tell thee again, do not hinder me in my work. Do not say a word more. Go to thy chamber, take the skin off thy face, and put on the silken gown which thou hadst on when thou camest to me, and then wait in thy chamber until I call thee. But I must once more tell of the king and queen, who had journeyed forth with the count in order to seek out the old woman in the wilderness. The count had strayed away from them in the wood by night, and had to walk onwards alone. Next day it seemed to him that he was on the right track. He still went forward until darkness came on. Then he climbed a tree, intending to pass the night there, for he feared that he might lose his way. When the moon illumined the surrounding country, he perceived a figure coming down the mountain. She had no stick in her hand, but yet he could see that it was the goose girl, whom he had seen before in the house of the old woman. Ho, ho, cried he, there she comes, and if I once get hold of one of the witches, the other shall not escape me. But how astonished he was when she went to the well, took off the skin and washed herself, when her golden hair fell down all about her, and she was more beautiful than any one whom he had ever seen in the whole world. He hardly dared to breathe, but stretched his head as far forward through the leaves as he dared, and stared at her. Either he bent over too far, or whatever the case might be, the bough suddenly cracked, and that very moment the maiden slipped into the skin, sprang away like a roe, and as soon as the moon was suddenly covered, disappeared from his eyes. Hardly had she disappeared before the count descended from the tree and hastened after her with nimble steps. He had not been gone long before he saw in the twilight two figures coming over the meadow. It was the king and queen, 
who had perceived from a distance the light shining in the old woman's little house, and were going to it. The Count told them what wonderful things he had seen by the well, and they did not doubt that it had been their lost daughter. They walked onwards full of joy, and soon came to the little house. The geese were sitting all round it, and had thrust their heads under their wings and were sleeping, and not one of them moved. The king and queen looked in at the window. The old woman was sitting there, quite quietly spinning, nodding her head and never looking around. The room was perfectly clean, as if the little mist men who carry no dust on their feet lived there. Their daughter, however, they did not see. They gazed at all this for a long time. At last they took heart and knocked softly at the window. The old woman appeared to have been expecting them. She rose and called out quite kindly, Come in, I know you already. When they had entered the room, the old woman said, You might have spared yourself the long walk if you had not three years ago unjustly driven away your child, who is so good and lovable. No harm has come to her. For three years she has had to tend the geese. With them she has learnt no evil, but has preserved her purity of heart. You, however, have been sufficiently punished by the misery in which you have lived. Then she went to the chamber and called, Come out, my little daughter. Thereupon the door opened, and the princess stepped out in her silken garments, with her golden hair and her shining eyes, and it was as if an angel from heaven had entered. She went up to her father and mother, fell on their necks, and kissed them. There was no help for it. They all had to weep for joy. The young count stood near them, and when she perceived him, she became as red in the face as a moss rose. She herself did not know why. The king said, My dear child, I have given away my kingdom. What shall I give thee? She needs nothing, said the old woman. I give her the tears that she has wept on your account. They are precious pearls, finer than those that are found in the sea, and worth more than your whole kingdom. And I give her my little house as payment for her services. When the old woman had said that, she disappeared from their sight. The walls rattled a little, and when the king and queen looked around, the little house had changed into a splendid palace. A royal table had been spread, and the servants were running hither and thither. The story goes still further, but my grandmother, who related it to me, had partly lost her memory and had forgotten the rest. I shall always believe that the beautiful princess married the count, and that they remained together in the palace and lived there in all happiness so long as God willed it. Whether the snow-white geese, which were kept near the little hut, were verily young maidens, no one need take offense, whom the old woman had taken under her protection, and whether they now received their human form again and stayed as handmaids to the young queen, I do not exactly know, but I suspect it. This much is certain, that the old woman was no witch, as people thought, but a wise woman who meant well. Very likely it was she who, at the princess's birth, gave her the gift of weeping pearls instead of tears. That does not happen nowadays, or else the poor would soon become rich. End of story 179「Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Household Tales by Jacob and William Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Eve's Various Children when Adam and Eve were driven out of paradise, they were compelled to build a house for themselves on an unfruitful ground, and eat their bread in the sweat of their brow. Adam dug up the land, and Eve span. Every year Eve brought a child into the world, but the children were unlike each other, some pretty and some ugly. After a considerable time had gone by, God sent an angel to them to announce that he was coming to inspect their household. Eve, delighted that the Lord should be so gracious, cleaned her house diligently, decked it with flowers, and strewed reeds on the floor. 
then she brought in her children but only the beautiful ones she washed and bathed them combed their hair put clean raiment on them and cautioned them to conduct themselves decorously and modestly in the presence of the lord they were to bow down before him civilly hold out their hands to answer his questions modestly and sensibly the ugly children were however not to let themselves be seen one hid himself beneath the hay and another under the roof a third in the straw the fourth in the stove the fifth in the cellar the sixth under a tub the seventh beneath the wine cask the eighth under an old fur cloak the ninth and tenth beneath the cloth out of which she always made their clothes and the eleventh and twelfth under the leather out of which she cut their shoes she had scarcely got ready before there was a knock at the house door adam looked through a chink and saw that it was the lord adam opened the door respectfully and the heavenly father entered there in a row stood the pretty children and bowed before him held out their hands and knelt down the lord however began to bless them laid his hands on the first and said thou shalt be a powerful king and to the second thou a prince and to the third thou a count to the fourth thou a knight to the fifth thou a nobleman to the sixth thou a burgher to the seventh thou a merchant to the eighth thou a learned man he bestowed upon them all his richest blessings when eve saw that the lord was so mild and gracious she thought i will bring hither my ill-favored children also it may be that he will bestow his blessing on them likewise so she ran and brought them out of the hay the straw the stove and wherever else she had concealed them then came the whole coarse dirty shabby sooty band the lord smiled looked at them and said i will bless thee also he laid his hands on the first and said to him thou shalt be a peasant to the second thou a fisherman to the third thou a smith to the fourth thou a tanner to the fifth thou a weaver to the sixth thou a shoemaker to the seventh thou a tailor to the eighth thou a potter to the ninth thou a wagoneer to the tenth thou a sailor to the eleventh thou an errand boy to the twelfth thou a scullion all the days of thy life when eve had heard all this she said lord how unequally thou dividest thy gifts after all they are all of them my children whom i have brought into the world thy favours should be given to all alike but god answered eve dost thou not understand it is right and necessary and the entire world should be supplied from thy children if they were all princes and lords who would grow corn thresh it grind and bake it who would be blacksmiths weavers carpenters masons laborers tailors and seamstresses each shall have his own place so that one shall support the other and all shall be fed like the limbs of one body then eve answered ah lord forgive me i was too quick in speaking to thee have thy divine will with my children end of story number 180story 181 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by kurt from tucson arizona household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm and translated by margaret hunt the nix of the mill pond there was once upon a time a miller who lived with his wife in great contentment they had money and land and their prosperity increased year by year more and more but ill luck comes like a thief in the night as their wealth had increased so did it again decrease year by year and at last the miller could hardly call the mill in which he lived his own he was in great distress, and when he lay down after his day's work found no rest, but tossed about in his bed full of care. One morning he rose before daybreak, and went out into the open air, thinking that perhaps there his heart might become lighter. As he was stepping over the mill dam, the first sunbeam was just breaking forth, and he heard a rippling sound in the pond. 
he turned round and perceived a beautiful woman rising slowly out of the water. Her long hair, which she was holding off her shoulders with her soft hands, fell down on both sides and covered her white body. He soon saw that she was the nix of the mill pond, and in his fright did not know whether he should run away or stay where he was. But the nix made her sweet voice heard, called him by name, and asked him why he was so sad. The miller was at first struck dumb, but when he heard her speak so kindly, he took heart and told her how he had formerly lived in wealth and happiness, but that now he was so poor that he did not know what to do. Be easy, answered the nix. I will make thee richer and happier than thou hast ever been before. Only thou must promise to give me the young thing which has just been born in thy house. What else can that be, thought the miller, but a young puppy or kitten? And he promised her what she desired. The nix descended into the water again, and he hurried back to his mill, consoled and in good spirits. He had not yet reached it, when the maidservant came out of the house and cried to him to rejoice, for his wife had given birth to a little boy. The miller stood as if struck by lightning. He saw very well that the cunning Nix had been aware of it and had cheated him. Hanging his head, he went up to his wife's bedside, and when she said, Why dost thou not rejoice over the fine boy? He told her what had befallen him, and what kind of promise he had given to the Nix. Of what use to me are riches and prosperity, he added, if I am to lose my child. But what can I do? Even the relations who had come thither to wish them joy did not know what to say. In the meantime, Prosperity again returned to the miller's house. All that he undertook succeeded. It was as if presses and coffers filled themselves of their own accord, and as if money multiplied nightly in the cupboards. It was not long before his wealth was greater than it had ever been before. But he could not rejoice over it untroubled, for the bargain which he had made with the nix tormented his soul. Whenever he passed the mill-pond, he feared she might ascend and remind him of his debt. He never let the boy himself go near the water. Beware, he said to him, if thou dost but touch the water, a hand will rise, seize thee, and draw thee down. But as year after year went by, and the nix did not show herself again, the miller began to feel at ease. The boy grew up to be a youth, and was apprenticed to a huntsman. When he had learnt everything, and had become an excellent huntsman, the lord of the village took him into his service. In the village lived a beautiful and true-hearted maiden, who pleased the huntsman. And when his master perceived that, he gave him a little house, the two were married, lived peacefully and happily, and loved each other with all their hearts. One day the huntsman was chasing a roe, and when the animal turned aside from the forest into the open country, he pursued it and at last shot it. He did not notice that he was now in the neighborhood of the dangerous mill-pond, and went, after he had disemboweled the stag, to the water in order to wash his blood-stained hands. Scarcely, however, had he dipped them in than the nix ascended, smilingly wound her dripping arms around him, and drew him quickly down under the waves, which closed over him. When it was evening and the huntsman did not return home, his wife became alarmed. She went out to seek him, and as he had often told her that he had to be on his guard against the snares of the nix, and dared not venture into the neighborhood of the mill-pond, she already suspected what had happened. She hastened to the water, and when she found his hunting pouch lying on the shore, she could no longer have any doubt of the misfortune. Lamenting her sorrow and wringing her hands, she called on her beloved by name, but in vain. She hurried across to the other side of the pond and called him anew. She reviled the nix with harsh words, but no answer followed. The surface of the water remained calm. Only the crescent moon stared steadily back at her. The poor woman did not leave the pond. With hasty steps she paced round and round it without resting a moment, 
sometimes in silence, sometimes uttering a loud cry, and sometimes softly sobbing. At last her strength came to an end. She sank down to the ground and fell into a heavy sleep. Presently a dream took possession of her. She was anxiously climbing upwards between great masses of rock. Thorns and briars caught her feet, and the rain beat her in her face, and the wind tossed her long hair about. When she had reached the summit, quite a different sight presented itself to her. The sky was blue, the air soft, the ground sloped gently downwards, and on a green meadow gay with flowers of every color stood a pretty cottage. She went up to it and opened the door. There sat an old woman with white hair who beckoned to her kindly. At that very moment the poor woman awoke. Day had already dawned, and she at once resolved to act in accordance with her dream. She laboriously climbed the mountain. Everything was exactly as she had seen it in the night. The old woman received her kindly and pointed out a chair on which she might sit. Thou must have met with a misfortune, she said, since thou hast sought out my lonely cottage. With tears the woman related what had befallen her. Be comforted, said the old woman. I will help thee. Here is a golden comb for thee. Tarry till the full moon has risen, then go to the mill pond, seat thyself on the shore, and comb thy long black hair with this comb. When thou hast done, lay it down on the bank, and thou wilt see what will happen. The woman returned home, but the time till the full moon came passed slowly. At last the shining disk appeared in the heavens. Then she went out to the mill pond, sat down, and combed her long black hair with the golden comb. And when she had finished, she laid it down at the water's edge. It was not long before there was a movement in the depths. A wave rose, rolled to the shore, and bore the comb away with it. In not more than the time necessary for the comb to sink to the bottom, the surface of the water parted and the head of the huntsman arose. He did not speak, but looked at his wife with sorrowful glances. At the same instant, a second wave came rushing up and covered the man's head. All had vanished. The mill pond lay peacefully as before, and nothing but the face of the full moon shone on it. Full of sorrow, the woman went back, but again the dream showed her the cottage of the old woman. Next morning she again set out and complained of her woes to the wise woman. The old woman gave her a golden flute and said, Tarry till the full moon comes again, then take this flute, play a beautiful air on it, and when thou hast finished, lay it on the sand. Then thou wilt see what will happen. The wife did as the old woman told her. No sooner was the flute lying on the sand than there was a stirring in the depths, and a wave rushed up and bore the flute away with it. Immediately afterwards the water parted, and not only the head of the man, but half of his body also arose. He stretched out his arms longingly towards her, but a second wave came up, covered him, and drew him down again. Alas, what does it profit me, said the unhappy woman, that I should see my beloved only to lose him again? Despair filled her heart anew, but the dream led her a third time to the house of the old woman. She set out, and the wise woman gave her a golden spinning wheel, consoled her, and said, All is not yet fulfilled. Tarry until the time of the full moon, then take the spinning wheel, seat thyself on the shore, and spin the spool full. And when thou hast done that, place the spinning wheel near the water, and thou wilt see what will happen. The woman obeyed all she said exactly. As soon as the full moon showed itself, she carried the golden spinning wheel to the shore and span industriously until the flax came to an end, and the spool was quite filled with the threads. No sooner was the wheel standing on the shore than there was a more violent movement than before in the depths of the pond, and a mighty wave rushed up and bore the wheel away with it. Immediately the head and the whole body of the man rose into the air in a water spout. He quickly sprang to the shore, caught his wife by the hand, and fled. 
but they had scarcely gone a very little distance when the whole pond rose with a frightful roar and streamed out over the open country. The fugitives already saw death before their eyes when the woman in her terror implored the help of the old woman, and in an instant they were transformed, she into a toad, he into a frog. The flood which had overtaken them could not destroy them, but it tore them apart and carried them far away. When the water had dispersed and they both touched dry land again, they regained their human form, but neither knew where the other was. They found themselves among strange people who did not know their native land. High mountains and deep valleys lay between them. In order to keep themselves alive, they were both obliged to tend sheep. For many long years they drove their flocks through field and forest and were full of sorrow and longing. When spring had once more broken forth on the earth, they both went out one day with their flocks, and as chance would have it, they drew near each other. They met in a valley, but did not recognize each other. Yet they rejoiced that they were no longer so lonely. Henceforth they each day drove their flocks to the same place, they did not speak much, but they felt comforted. One evening, when the full moon was shining in the sky and the sheep were already at rest, the shepherd pulled the flute out of his pocket and played on it a beautiful but sorrowful air. When he had finished, he saw that the shepherdess was weeping bitterly. Why art thou weeping? he asked. Alas, answered she. Thus shone the full moon when I played this air on the flute for the last time, and the head of my beloved rose out of the water. He looked at her, and it seemed as if a veil fell from his eyes, and he recognized his dear wife, and when she looked at him, and the moon shone in his face, she knew him also. They embraced and kissed each other, and no one need ask if they were happy. End of story 181。Story 182 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. THE LITTLE FOLK'S PRESENCE A tailor and a goldsmith were traveling together, and one evening, when the sun had sunk behind the mountains, they heard the sound of distant music, which became more and more distinct. It sounded strange, but so pleasant that they forgot all their weariness and stepped quickly onwards. The moon had already risen when they reached a hill on which they saw a crowd of little men and women, who had taken each other's hands and were whirling round in the dance with the greatest pleasure and delight. They sang to it most charmingly, and that was the music which the travellers had heard. In the midst of them sat an old man who was rather taller than the rest. He wore a party-coloured coat, and his iron-grey beard hung down over his breast. The two remained standing full of astonishment, and watched the dance. The old man made a sign that they should enter, and the little folks willingly opened their circle. The goldsmith, who had a hump, and, like all hunchbacks, was brave enough, stepped in. The tailor felt a little afraid at first, and held back. But when he saw how merrily all was going, he plucked up his courage and followed. The circle closed again directly, and the little folks went on singing and dancing with the wildest leaps. The old man, however, took a large knife which hung to his girdle, wetted it, and when it was sufficiently sharpened, he looked round at the strangers. They were terrified, but they had not much time for reflection, for the old man seized the goldsmith and, with the greatest speed, shaved the hair of his head clean off, and then the same thing happened to the tailor. But their fear left them when, after he had finished his work, the old man clapped them both on the shoulder in a friendly manner, as much as to say, they had behaved well to let all that be done to them willingly and without any struggle. He pointed with his finger to a heap of coals which lay at one side, 
and signified to the travelers by his gestures that they were to fill their pockets with them. Both of them obeyed, although they did not know of what use the coals would be to them, and then they went on their way to seek shelter for the night. When they had got into the valley, the clock of the neighboring monastery struck twelve, and the song ceased. In a moment all had vanished, and the hill lay in solitude in the moonlight. The two travelers found an inn, and covered themselves up on their straw beds with their coats, but in their weariness forgot to take the coals out of them before doing so. A heavy weight on their limbs awakened them earlier than usual. They felt in the pockets, and could not believe their eyes when they saw that they were not filled with coals, but with pure gold. Happily, too, the hair of their heads and beards was there again as thick as ever. They had now become rich folks, but the goldsmith, who, in accordance with his greedy disposition, had filled his pockets better, was as rich again as the tailor. A greedy man, even if he has much, still wishes to have more, so the goldsmith proposed to the tailor that they should wait another day, and go out again in the evening in order to bring back still greater treasures from the old man on the hill. The tailor refused, and said, I have enough, and I am content. Now I shall be a master, and marry my dear object, for so he called his sweetheart, and I am a happy man. But he stayed another day to please him. In the evening the goldsmith hung a couple of bags over his shoulders that he might be able to stow away a great deal, and took the road to the hill. He found, as on the night before, the little folks at their singing and dancing, and the old man again shaved him clean, and signed to him to take some coal away with him. He was not slow about sticking as much into his bags as would go, went back quite delighted, and covered himself over with his coat. Even if the gold does weigh heavily, said he, I will gladly bear that. And at last he fell asleep with the sweet anticipation of waking in the morning an enormously rich man. When he opened his eyes, he got up in haste to examine his pockets. But how amazed he was when he drew nothing out of them but black coals, and that howsoever often he put his hands in them. The gold I got the night before is still there for me, thought he and went and brought it out. But how shocked he was when he saw that it likewise had again turned into coal. He smote his forehead with his dusty black hand, and then he felt that his whole head was bald and smooth, as was also the place where his beard should have been. But his misfortunes were not yet over. He now remarked for the first time that in addition to the hump on his back, a second, just as large, had grown in front on his breast. Then he recognized the punishment of his greediness, and began to weep aloud. The good tailor, who was wakened by this, comforted the unhappy fellow as well as he could, and said, Thou hast been my comrade in my traveling time. Thou shalt stay with me, and share in my wealth. He kept his word, but the poor goldsmith was obliged to carry the two humps as long as he lived, and to cover his bald head, with a cap. End of 182。Story 183 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. THE GIANT AND THE TAILOR A certain tailor, who was great at boasting, but ill at doing, took it into his head to go abroad for a while and look about the world. As soon as he could manage it, he left his workshop and wandered on his way, over hill and dale, sometimes hither, sometimes thither, but ever on and on. Once, when he was out, he perceived in the blue distance a steep hill, and behind it a tower, reaching to the clouds, which rose up out of a wild, dark forest. "'Thunder and lightning!' cried the tailor. "'What is that?' And as he was strongly goaded by curiosity, he went boldly towards it. 
but what made the tailor open his eyes and mouth when he came near it was to see that the tower had legs and leapt in one bound over the steep hill and was now standing as an all-powerful giant before him what dost thou want here thou tiny fly's leg cried the giant with a voice as if it were thundering on every side the tailor whimpered i want just to look about and see if i can earn a bit of bread for myself in this forest if that is what thou art after said the giant thou mayest have a place with me if it must be why not what wages shall i receive thou shalt hear what wages thou shalt have every year three hundred and sixty-five days and when it is leap year one more into the bargain does that suit thee all right replied the tailor and thought in his own mind a man must cut his coat according to his cloth i will try to get away as fast as i can on this the giant said to him go little ragamuffin and fetch me a jug of water had i not better bring the well itself at once in the spring too asked the boaster and went with the pitcher to the water what the well and the spring too growled the giant in his beard for he was rather clownish and stupid and began to be afraid that knave is not a fool he has a wizard in his body be on thy guard old hans this is no serving man for thee when the tailor had brought the water the giant bade him go into the forest and cut a couple of blocks of wood and bring them back why not the whole forest at once with one stroke the whole forest young and old with all that is there both rough and smooth asked the little tailor and went to cut the wood what the whole forest young and old with all that is there both rough and smooth and the well and its spring too growled the credulous giant in his beard and was still more terrified the knave can do much more than bake apples and has a wizard in his body be on thy guard old hans this is no serving man for thee when the tailor had brought the wood the giant commanded him to shoot two or three wild boars for supper why not rather a thousand at one shot and bring them all here inquired the ostentatious tailor what cried the timid giant in great terror let me alone to-night and lie down to rest the giant was so terribly alarmed that he could not close an eye all night long for thinking what would be the best way to get rid of this accursed saucer of a servant time brings counsel next morning the giant and the tailor went to a marsh round which stood a number of willow trees then said the giant hark thee tailor seat thyself on one of the willow branches i long of all things to see if thou art big enough to bend it down all at once the tailor was sitting on it holding his breath and making himself so heavy that the bow bent down when however he was compelled to draw a breath it hurried him for unfortunately he had not put his goose in his pocket so high into the air that he never was seen again and this to the great delight of the giant if the tailor has not fallen down again he must be hovering about in the air end of story 183story 184 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the nail a merchant had done good business at the fair 
he had sold his wares and lined his money bags with gold and silver. Then he wanted to travel homewards and be in his own house before nightfall. So he packed his trunk with the money on his horse and rode away. At noon he rested in a town, and when he wanted to go farther, the stable boy brought out his horse and said, A nail is wanting, sir, in the shoe of its left hind foot. Let it be wanting, answered the merchant. The shoe will certainly stay on for the six miles I have still to go. I am in a hurry. In the afternoon, when he once more alighted and had his horse fed, the stable boy went into the room to him and said, Sir, a shoe is missing from your horse's left hind foot. Shall I take him to the blacksmith? Let it still be wanting, answered the man. The horse can very well hold out for the couple of miles which remain. I am in haste. He rode forth, but before long the horse began to limp. It had not limped long before it began to stumble, and it had not stumbled long before it fell down and broke its leg. The merchant was forced to leave the horse where it was and unbuckle the trunk take it on his back and go home on foot. And there he did not arrive until quite late at night. And that unlucky nail, said he to himself, has caused all this disaster. Hasten slowly. End of story 184。There was once a poor shepherd boy whose father and mother were dead, and he was placed by the authorities in the house of a rich man, who was to feed him and bring him up. The man and his wife had, however, bad hearts, and were greedy and anxious about their riches, and vexed whenever anyone put a morsel of their bread in his mouth. The poor young fellow might do what he liked, he got little to eat but only so many blows the more. One day he had to watch a hen and her chickens, but she ran through a quick-set hedge with them, and a hawk darted down instantly and carried her off through the air. The boy called, Thief! Thief! Rascal! with all the strength of his body. But what good did that do? The hawk did not bring its prey back again. The man heard the noise, and ran to the spot, and as soon as he saw that his hen was gone, he fell in a rage, and gave the boy such a beating that he could not stir for two days. Then he had to take care of the chickens without the hen, but now his difficulty was greater, for one ran here and the other there. He thought he was doing a very wise thing when he tied them all together with a string because then the hawk would not be able to steal any of them away from him. But he was very much mistaken. After two days, worn out with running about and hunger, he fell asleep. The bird of prey came, and seized one of the chickens, and as the others were tied fast to it, it carried them all off together, perched itself on a tree, and devoured them. The farmer was just coming home, and when he saw the misfortune, he got angry and beat the boy so unmercifully that he was forced to lie in bed for several days. When he was on his legs again, the farmer said to him, Thou art too stupid for me, I cannot make a herdsman of thee, thou must go as errand boy. Then he sent him to the judge, to whom he was to carry a basketful of grapes, and he gave him a letter as well. On the way, hunger and thirst tormented the unhappy boy so violently that he ate two of the bunches of grapes. 
he took the basket to the judge but when the judge had read the letter and counted the bunches he said two clusters are wanting the boy confessed quite honestly that driven by hunger and thirst he had devoured the two which were wanting the judge wrote a letter to the farmer and asked for the same number of grapes again these also the boy had to take to him with a letter as he again was so extremely hungry and thirsty he could not help it and again ate two bunches but first he took the letter out of the basket put it under a stone and seated himself thereon in order that the letter might not see and betray him the judge however again made him give an explanation about the missing bunches ah said the boy how have you learnt that the letter could not know about it for i put it under a stone before i did it the judge could not help laughing at the boy's simplicity and sent the man a letter wherein he cautioned him to keep the poor boy better and not let him want for meat and drink and also that he was to teach him what was right and what was wrong i will soon show thee the difference said the hard man if thou wilt eat thou must work and if thou dost anything wrong thou shalt be quite sufficiently taught by blows the next day he set him a hard task he was to chop two bundles of straw for food for the horses and then the man threatened in five hours said he i shall be back again and if the straw is not cut to chaff by that time i will beat thee until thou canst not move a limb the farmer went with his wife the manservant and the girl to the yearly fair and left nothing behind for the boy but a small bit of bread the boy seated himself on the bench and began to work with all his might as he got warm over it he put his little coat off and threw it on the straw in his terror lest he should not get done in time he kept constantly cutting and in his haste without noticing it he chopped his little coat as well as the straw he became aware of the misfortune too late there was no repairing it ah cried he now all is over with me the wicked man did not threaten me for nothing if he comes back and sees what i have done he will kill me rather than that i will take my own life the boy had once heard the farmer's wife say i have a pot with poison in it under my bed she however had only said that to keep away greedy people for there was honey in it the boy crept under the bed brought out the pot and ate all that was in it i do not know said he folks say death is bitter but it tastes very sweet to me it is no wonder that the farmer's wife has so often longed for death he seated himself in a little chair and was prepared to die but instead of becoming weaker he felt himself strengthened by the nourishing food it cannot have been poison thought he but the farmer once said there was a small bottle of poison for flies in the box in which he keeps his clothes that no doubt will be the true poison and bring death to me it was however no poison for flies but hungarian wine the boy got out the bottle and emptied it this death tastes sweet too said he but shortly after when the wine began to mount into his brain and stupefy him he thought his end was drawing near i feel that i must die said he i will go away to the churchyard and seek a grave he staggered out reached the churchyard and laid himself in a newly dug grave he lost his senses more and more in the neighbourhood was an inn where a wedding was being kept when he heard the music he fancied he was already in paradise until at length he lost all consciousness the poor boy never awoke again the heat of the strong wine and the cold night dew deprived him of life and he remained in the grave in which he had laid himself when the farmer heard the news of the boy's death he was terrified 
and afraid of being brought to justice indeed his distress took such a powerful hold of him that he fell fainting to the ground his wife who was standing on the hearth with a pan of hot fat ran to him to help him but the flames darted against the pan the whole house caught fire in a few hours it lay in ashes and the rest of the years they had to live they passed in poverty and misery tormented by the pangs of conscience end of story number 185「Story 186 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The True Sweethearts. There was once on a time a girl who was young and beautiful, but she had lost her mother when she was quite a child and her stepmother did all she could to make the girl's life wretched whenever this woman gave her anything to do she worked at it indefatigably and did everything that lay in her power still she could not touch the heart of the wicked woman by that she was never satisfied it was never enough the harder the girl worked the more work was put upon her and all that the woman thought of was how to weigh her down with still heavier burdens and make her life still more miserable one day she said to her here are twelve pounds of feathers which thou must pick and if they are not done this evening thou mayest expect a good beating dost thou imagine thou art to idle away the whole day the poor girl sat down to the work but tears ran down her cheeks as she did so for she saw plainly enough that it was quite impossible to finish the work in one day whenever she had a little heap of feathers lying before her and she sighed or smote her hands together in her anguish they flew away and she had to pick them out again and begin her work anew then she put her elbows on the table laid her face in her two hands and cried is there no one then on god's earth to have pity on me then she heard a low voice which said be comforted my child i have come to help thee the maiden looked up and an old woman was by her side she took the girl kindly by the hand and said only tell me what is troubling thee as she spoke so kindly the girl told her of her miserable life and how one burden after another was laid upon her and she never could get to the end of the work which was given to her if i have not done these feathers by this evening my stepmother will beat me she has threatened she will and i know she keeps her word her tears began to flow again but the good old woman said do not be afraid my child rest a while and in the meantime i will look to thy work the girl lay down on her bed and soon fell asleep the old woman seated herself at the table with the feathers and how they did fly off the quills which she scarcely touched with her withered hands the twelve pounds were soon finished and when the girl awoke great snow-white heaps were lying piled up and everything in the room was neatly cleared away but the old woman had vanished the maiden thanked god and sat still till evening came when the stepmother came in and marvelled to see the work completed just look you awkward creature said she what can be done when people are industrious and why couldst thou not set about something else there thou sittest with thy hands crossed when she went out she said the creature is worth more than her salt i must give her some work that is still harder next morning she called the girl and said there is a spoon for thee with that thou must empty out for me the great pond which is beside the garden and if it is not done by night thou knowest what will happen the girl took the spoon and saw that it was full of holes but even if it had not been she never could have emptied the pond with it she set to work at once knelt down by the water into which her tears were falling and began to empty it but the good old woman appeared again and when she learnt the cause of her grief she said be of good cheer my child go into the thicket and lie down and sleep i will soon do thy work as soon as the old woman was alone she barely touched the pond and a vapour rose up on high from the water and mingled itself with the clouds gradually the pond was emptied and when the maiden awoke before sunset and came thither she saw nothing but the fishes which were struggling in the mud she went to her stepmother and showed her that the work was done it ought to have been done long before this said she and grew white with anger but she meditated something new on the third morning she said to the girl thou must build me a castle on the plain there and it must be ready by the evening the maiden was dismayed and said 
how can i complete such a great work i will endure no opposition screamed the stepmother if thou canst empty a pond with a spoon that is full of holes thou canst build a castle too i will take possession of it this very day and if anything is wanting even if it be the most trifling thing in the kitchen or cellar thou knowest what lies before thee she drove the girl out and when she entered the valley the rocks were there piled up one above the other and all her strength would not have enabled her even to move the very smallest of them she sat down and wept and still she hoped the old woman would help her the old woman was not long in coming she comforted her and said lie down there in the shade and sleep and i will soon build the castle for thee if it would be a pleasure to thee thou canst live in it thyself when the maiden had gone away the old woman touched the gray rocks they began to rise and immediately moved together as if giants had built the walls and on these the buildings arose and it seemed as if countless hands were working invisibly and placing one stone upon another there was a dull heavy noise from the ground pillars arose of their own accord on high and placed themselves in order near each other the tiles laid themselves in order on the roof and when noonday came the great weathercock was already turning itself on the summit of the tower like a golden figure of the virgin with fluttering garments the inside of the castle was being finished while evening was drawing near how the old woman managed it i know not but the walls of the rooms were hung with silk and velvet embroidered chairs were there and richly ornamented armchairs by marble tables crystal chandeliers hung down from the ceilings and mirrored themselves in the smooth pavement green parrots were there in gilt cages and so were strange birds which sang most beautifully and there was on all sides as much magnificence as if a king were going to live there the sun was just setting when the girl awoke and the brightness of a thousand lights flashed in her face she hurried to the castle and entered by the open door the steps were spread with red cloth and the golden balustrade beset with flowering trees when she saw the splendor of the apartment she stood as if turned to stone who knows how long she might have stood there if she had not remembered the stepmother alas she said to herself if she could but be satisfied at last and would give up making my life a misery to me the girl went and told her that the castle was ready i will move into it at once said she and rose from her seat when they entered the castle she was forced to hold her hand before her eyes the brilliancy of everything was so dazzling thou seest said she to the girl how easy it has been for thee to do this i ought to have given thee something harder she went through all the rooms and examined every corner to see if anything was wanting or defective but she could discover nothing now we will go down below said she looking at the girl with malicious eyes the kitchen and the cellar still have to be examined and if thou hast forgotten anything thou shalt not escape that punishment but the fire was burning on the hearth and the meat was cooking in the pans the tongs and shovel were leaning against the wall and the shining brazen utensils all arranged in sight nothing was wanting not even a coal box and water pail which is the way to the cellar she cried if that is not abundantly filled it shall go ill with thee she herself raised up the trap-door and descended but she had hardly made two steps before the heavy trap-door which was only laid back fell down the girl heard a scream lifted up the door very quickly to go to her aid but she had fallen down and the girl found her lying lifeless at the bottom and now the magnificent castle belonged to the girl alone she at first did not know how to reconcile herself to her good fortune beautiful dresses were hanging in the wardrobes the chests were filled with gold or silver or with pearls and jewels and she never felt a desire that she was not able to ratify and soon the fame of the beauty and riches of the maiden went over all the world wooers presented themselves daily but none pleased her at length the son of the king came and he knew how to touch her heart and she betrothed herself to him in the garden of the castle was a lime tree under which they were one day sitting together when he said to her i will go home and obtain my father's consent to our marriage i entreat thee to wait for me here under this lime tree i shall be back with thee in a few hours the maiden kissed him on his left cheek and said keep true to me and never let any one else kiss thee on this cheek i will wait here under the lime tree until thou returnest the maid stayed beneath the lime tree until sunset 
but he did not return she sat three days from morning till evening waiting for him but in vain as he still was not there by the fourth day she said some accident has assuredly befallen him i will go out and seek him and will not come back until i have found him she packed up three of her most beautiful dresses one embroidered with bright stars the second with silver moons the third with golden suns tied up a handful of jewels in her handkerchief and set out she inquired everywhere for her betrothed but no one had seen him no one knew anything about him far and wide did she wander through the world but she found him not at last she hired herself to a farmer as a cowherd and buried her dresses and jewels beneath a stone and now she lived as a herdswoman guarded her herd and was very sad and full of longing for her beloved one she had a little calf which she taught to know her and fed it out of her own hand and when she said little calf little calf kneel by my side and do not forget thy shepherd maid as the prince forgot his betrothed bride who waited for him neath the lime tree's shade the little calf knelt down and she stroked it and when she had lived for a couple of years alone and full of grief a report was spread over all the land that the king's daughter was about to celebrate her marriage the road to the town passed through the village where the maiden was living and it came to pass that once when the maiden was driving out her herd her bridegroom travelled by he was sitting proudly on his horse and never looked round but when she saw him she recognized her beloved and it was just as if a sharp knife had pierced her heart alas said she i believed him true to me but he has forgotten me next day he again came along the road when he was near her she said to the little calf little calf little calf kneel by my side and do not forget thy shepherd maid as the prince forgot his betrothed bride who waited for him neath the lime tree's shade when he was aware of the voice he looked down and reined in his horse he looked into the herd's face and then put his hands before his eyes as if he were trying to remember something but he soon rode onwards and was out of sight alas said she he no longer knows me and her grief was ever greater soon after this a great festival three days long was to be held at the king's court and the whole country was invited to it now will i try my last chance thought the maiden and when evening came she went to the stone under which she had buried her treasures she took out the dress with the golden suns put it on and adorned herself with the jewels she let down her hair which she had concealed under a handkerchief and it fell down as long curls about her and thus she went into the town and in the darkness was observed by no one when she entered the brightly lighted hall every one started back in amazement but no one knew who she was the king's son went to meet her but he did not recognize her he led her out to dance and was so enchanted with her beauty and he thought no more of the other bride when the feast was over she vanished in the crowd and hastened before daybreak to the village where she once more put on her herd's dress next evening she took out the dress with the silver moons and put a half-moon made of precious stones in her hair when she appeared at the festival all eyes were turned upon her but the king's son hastened to meet her and filled with love for her danced with her alone and no longer so much as glanced at any one else before she went away she was forced to promise him to come again to the festival on the last evening when she appeared for the third time she wore the star dress which sparkled at every step she took and her hair ribbon and girdle were starred with jewels the prince had already been waiting for her for a long time and forced his way up to her do but tell who thou art said he i feel just as if i had already known thee a long time dost thou not know what i did when you leftest me then she stepped up to him and kissed him on his left cheek and in a moment it was as if scales fell from his eyes and he recognized the true bride come said he to her here i stay no longer gave her his hand and led her down to the carriage the horses hurried away to the magic castle as if the wind had been harnessed to the carriage the illuminated windows already shone in the distance when they drove past the lime tree countless glowworms were swarming about it it shook its branches and sent forth their fragrance on the steps flowers were blooming and the room echoed with the song of strange birds but in the hall the entire court was assembled and the priest was waiting to marry the bridegroom to the true bride end of story one hundred and eighty six
story one hundred and eighty seven of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the hare and the hedgehog this story my dear young folks seems to be false but it really is true for my grandfather from whom i have it used always when relating it to say complacently it must be true my son or else no one could tell it to you the story is as follows one sunday morning about harvest time just as the buckwheat was in bloom the sun was shining brightly in heaven the east wind was blowing warmly over the stubble fields the larks were singing in the air the bees buzzing among the buckwheat the people were all going in their sunday clothes to church and all creatures were happy and the hedgehog was happy too the hedgehog however was standing by his door with his arms akimbo enjoying the morning breezes and slowly trilling a little song to himself which was neither better nor worse than the songs which hedgehogs are in the habit of singing on a blessed sunday morning whilst he was thus singing half aloud to himself it suddenly occurred to him that while his wife was washing and drying the children he might well take a walk into the field and see how his turnips were going on the turnips were in fact close beside his house and he and his family were accustomed to eat them for which reason he looked upon them as his own no sooner said than done the hedgehog shut the house door behind him and took the path to the field he had not gone very far from home and was just turning round the slow bush which stands there outside the field to go up into the turnip field when he observed the hare who had gone out on business of the same kind namely to visit his cabbages when the hedgehog caught sight of the hare he bade him a friendly good morning but the hare who was in his own way a distinguished gentleman and frightfully haughty did not return the hedgehog's greeting but said to him assuming at the same time a very contemptuous manner how do you happen to be running about here in the field so early in the morning i am taking a walk said the hedgehog a walk said the hare with a smile it seems to me that you might use your legs for a better purpose the answer made the hedgehog furiously angry for he can bear anything but an attack on his legs just because they are crooked by nature so now the hedgehog said to the hare you seem to imagine that you can do more with your legs than i with mine that is just what i do think said the hare that can be put to the test said the hedgehog i wager that if i run a race i will outstrip you that is ridiculous you with your short legs said the hare but for my part i am willing if you have such a monstrous fancy for it what shall we wager a golden louis d'or and a bottle of brandy said the hedgehog done said the hare shake hands on it and then we may as well come off at once nay said the hedgehog there is no such great hurry i am still fasting i will go home first and have a little breakfast in half an hour i will be back again at this place hereupon the hedgehog departed for the hare was quite satisfied with this on his way the hedgehog thought to himself the hare relies on his long legs but i will contrive to get the better of him he may be a great man but he is a very silly fellow and he shall pay for what he has said so when the hedgehog reached home he said to his wife wife dress thyself quickly thou must go out to the field with me what is going on then said his wife i have made a wager with the hare for a gold louis d'or and a bottle of brandy i am to run a race with him and thou must be present good heavens husband the wife now cried art thou not right in thy mind hast thou completely lost thy wits what can make thee want to run a race with the hare hold thy tongue woman said the hedgehog that is my affair don't begin to discuss things which are matters for men be off dress thyself and come with me what could the hedgehog's wife do she was forced to obey him whether she liked it or not so when they had set out on their way together the hedgehog said to his wife now pay attention to what i am going to say look you i will make the long field our race course the hare shall run in one furrow and i in another and we will begin to run from the top now all that thou hast to do is to place thyself here below in the furrow and when the hare arrives at the end of the furrow on the other side of thee thou must cry out to him i am here already then they reached the field 
and the hedgehog showed his wife her place and then walked up the field when he reached the top the hare was already there shall we start said the hare certainly said the hedgehog then both at once so saying each placed himself in his own furrow the hare counted once twice thrice and away and went off like a whirlwind down the field the hedgehog however only ran about three paces and then he stooped down in the furrow and stayed quietly where he was when the hare therefore arrived in full career at the lower end of the field the hedgehog's wife met him with the cry i am here already the hare was shocked and wondered not a little he thought no other than that it was the hedgehog himself who was calling to him for the hedgehog's wife looked just like her husband the hare however thought to himself that has not been done fairly and cried it must be run again let us have it again and once more he went off like the wind in a storm so that he seemed to fly but the hedgehog's wife stayed quietly in her place so when the hare reached the top of the field the hedgehog himself cried out to him i am here already the hare however quite beside himself with anger cried it must be run again we must have it again all right answered the hedgehog for my part we'll run as often as you choose so the hare ran seventy-three times more and the hedgehog always held out against him and every time the hare reached the, either the top or the bottom either the hedgehog or his wife said i am here already at the seventy-fourth time however the hare could no longer reach the end in the middle of the field he fell to the ground blood streamed out of his mouth and he lay dead on the spot but the hedgehog took the louis d'or which he had won and the bottle of brandy called his wife out of the furrow and both went home together in great delight and if they are not dead they are living there still this is how it happened that the hedgehog made the hare run races with him on the bucks to hooter heath till he died and since that time no hare has ever had any fancy for running races with a bucks to hooter hedgehog the moral of this story however is firstly that no one however great he may be should permit himself to jest at any one beneath him even if he be only a hedgehog and secondly it teaches that when a man marries he should take a wife in his own position who looks just as himself looks so whosoever is a hedgehog let him see to it that his wife is a hedgehog also and so forth end of story one hundred and eighty seven story one hundred and eighty eight of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the spindle the shuttle and the needle there was once a girl whose father and mother died while she was still a little child all alone in a small house at the end of the village dwelt her godmother who supported herself by spinning weaving and sewing the old woman took the forlorn child to live with her kept her to her work and educated her in all that is good when the girl was fifteen years old the old woman became ill called the child to her bedside and said dear daughter i feel my end drawing near i leave thee the little house which will protect thee from wind and weather and my spindle shuttle and needle with which thou canst earn thy bread then she laid her hands on the girl's head blessed her and said only preserve the love of god in thy heart and all will go well with thee thereupon she closed her eyes and when she was laid in the earth the maiden followed the coffin weeping bitterly and paid her the last mark of respect and now the maiden lived quite alone in the little house and was industrious and span wove and sewed and the blessing of the good old woman was on all that she did it seemed as if the flax in the room increased by its own accord and whenever she wove a piece of cloth or carpet or had made a shirt she at once found a buyer who paid her amply for it so that she was in want of nothing and even had something to share with others about this time the son of the king was travelling about the country looking for a bride he was not to choose a poor one and did not want to have a rich one so he said she shall be my wife who is the poorest and at the same time the richest when he came to the village where the maiden dwelt he inquired as he did wherever he went who was the richest and also the poorest in the place they first named the richest the poorest 
they said was the girl who lived in the small house quite at the end of the village the rich girl was sitting in all her splendor before the door of her house and when the prince approached her she got up went to meet him and made him a low curtsy he looked at her said nothing and rode on when he came to the house of the poor girl she was not standing at the door but sitting in her little room he stopped his horse and saw through the window on which the bright sun was shining the girl sitting at her spinning wheel busily spinning she looked up and when she saw that the prince was looking in she blushed all over her face let her eyes fall and went on spinning i do not know whether just at that moment the thread was quite even but she went on spinning until the king's son had ridden away again then she went to the window opened it and said it is so warm in this room but she still looked after him as long as she could distinguish the white feathers on his hat then she sat down to work again in her own room and went on with her spinning and a saying which the old woman had often repeated when she was sitting at her work came into her mind and she sang these words to herself spindle my spindle haste haste thee away and here to my house bring the wooer i pray and what do you think happened the spindle sprang out of her hand in an instant and out of the door and when in her astonishment she got up and looked after it she saw that it was dancing out merrily into the open country and drawing a shining golden thread after it before long it had entirely vanished from her sight as she had now no spindle and the girl took the weaver's shuttle in her hand sat down to her loom and began to weave the spindle however danced continually onwards and just as the thread came to an end reached the prince what do i see he cried the spindle certainly wants to show me the way turned his horse about and rode back with the golden thread the girl was however sitting at her work singing shuttle my shuttle weave well this day and guide the wooer to me i pray immediately the shuttle sprang out of her hand and out by the door before the threshold however it began to weave a carpet which was more beautiful than the eyes of man had ever yet beheld lilies and roses blossomed on both sides of it and on a golden ground in the centre green branches ascended under which bounded hares and rabbits stags and deers stretched their heads in between them brightly coloured birds were sitting in the branches above they lacked nothing but the gift of song the shuttle leapt hither and thither and everything seemed to grow of its own accord as the shuttle had run away the girl sat down to sew she held the needle in her hand and sang needle my needle sharp pointed and fine prepare for a wooer this house of mine then the needle leapt out of her fingers and flew everywhere about the room as quick as lightning it was just as if invisible spirits were working they covered tables and benches with green cloth in an instant and the chairs with velvet and hung the windows with silken curtains hardly had the needle put in the last stitch than the maiden saw through the window the white feathers of the prince whom the spindle had brought thither by the golden thread he alighted stepped over the carpet into the house and when he entered the room there stood the maiden in her poor garments but she shone out from within like a rose surrounded by leaves thou art the poorest and also the richest said he to her come with me thou shalt be my bride she did not speak but she gave him her hand then he gave her a kiss led her forth lifted her on to his horse and took her to the royal castle where the wedding was solemnized with great rejoicings the spindle shuttle and needle were preserved in the treasure chamber and held in great honor end of story one hundred and eighty eight Story 189 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Peasant and the Devil. There was once on a time a far sighted, crafty peasant whose tricks were much talked about the best story is however how he once got hold of the devil and made a fool of him the peasant had one day been working in his field and as twilight had set in was making ready for the journey home when he saw a heap of burning coals in the middle of his field and when full of astonishment he went up to it a little black devil was sitting on the live coals thou dost indeed sit upon a treasure 
said the peasant yes in truth replied the devil on a treasure which contains more gold and silver than thou hast ever seen in thy life the treasure lies in my field and belongs to me said the peasant it is thine answered the devil if thou wilt for two years give me the half of everything thy field produces money i have enough of but i have a desire for the fruits of the earth the peasant agreed to the bargain in order however that no dispute may arise about the division said he everything that is above ground shall belong to thee and what is under the earth to me the devil was quite satisfied with that but the cunning peasant had sown turnips now when the time for harvest came the devil appeared and wanted to take away his crop but he found nothing but the yellow withered leaves while the peasant full of delight was digging up his turnips thou hast had the best of it for once said the devil but the next time that won't do what grows above ground shall be thine and what is under it mine i am willing replied the peasant but when the time came to sow he did not again sow turnips but wheat the grain became ripe and the peasant went into the field and cut the full stalks down to the ground when the devil came he found nothing but the stubble and went away in a fury down into a cleft in the rocks that is the way to cheat the devil said the peasant and went and fetched away the treasure end of story one hundred and eighty nine story one hundred and ninety of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by kathleen household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the crumbs on the table a countryman one day said to his little puppies come into the parlor and enjoy yourselves and pick up the bread crumbs on the table your mistress has gone out to pay some visits then the little dog said no no we will not go if the mistress gets to know it she will beat us the countryman said she will know nothing about it do come after all she never gives you anything good then the little dogs again said nay nay we must let it alone we must not go but the countryman let them have no peace until at last they went and got on the table and ate up the bread crumbs with all their might but at that very moment the mistress came and seized the stick in great haste and beat them and treated them very hardly and when they were outside the house the little dog said to the countryman dus 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 thou see then the countryman laughed and said didn't 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 you expect it so they just had to run away end of story one hundred and ninety Story number 191 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Sea Hare. There was, once upon a time, a princess, who, high under the battlements in her castle, had an apartment with twelve windows, which looked out in every possible direction, and when she climbed up to it and looked around her, she could inspect her whole kingdom. When she looked out of the first, her sight was more keen than that of any other human being. From the second, she could see still better. From the third, more distinctly still and so it went on until the twelfth from which she saw everything above the earth and under the earth and nothing at all could be kept secret from her moreover as she was haughty and would be subject to no one but wished to keep the dominion for herself alone she caused it to be proclaimed that no one should ever be her husband who could not conceal himself from her so effectually that it should be quite impossible for her to find him he who tried this however and was discovered by her was to have his head struck off and stuck on a post ninety-seven posts with the heads of dead men were already standing before the castle and no one had come forward for a long time the princess was delighted 
and thought to herself now i shall be free as long as i live then three brothers appeared before her and announced to her that they were desirous of trying their luck the eldest believed he would be quite safe if he crept into a lime pit but she saw him from the first window made him come out and had his head cut off the second crept into the cellar of the palace but she perceived him also from the first window and his fate was sealed his head was placed on the nine and ninetieth post then the youngest came to her and entreated her to give him a day for consideration and also to be so gracious as to overlook it if she should happen to discover him twice but if he failed the third time he would look on his life as over as he was so handsome and begged so earnestly she said yes i will grant thee that but thou wilt not succeed next day he meditated for a long time how he should hide himself but all in vain then he seized his gun and went out hunting he saw a raven took a good aim at him and was just going to fire when the bird cried don't shoot i will make it worth thy while not he put his gun down went on and came to a lake where he surprised a large fish which had come up from the depths below to the surface of the water when he had aimed at it the fish cried don't shoot and i will make it worth thy while he allowed it to dive down again went onwards and met a fox which was lame he fired and missed it and the fox cried you had much better come here and draw the thorn out of my foot for me he did this but then he wanted to kill the fox and skin it the fox said stop and i will make it worth thy while the youth let him go and then as it was evening returned home next day he was to hide himself but howsoever much he puzzled his brains over it he did not know where he went into the forest to the raven and said i let thee live on so now tell me where i am to hide myself so that the king's daughter shall not see me the raven hung his head and thought it over for a long time at length he croaked i have it he fetched an egg out of his nest cut it into two parts and shut the youth inside it then made it whole again and seated himself on it when the king's daughter went to the first window she could not discover him nor could she from the others and she began to be uneasy but from the eleventh she saw him she ordered the raven to be shot and the egg to be brought and broken and the youth was forced to come out she said for once thou art excused but if thou dost not do better than this thou art lost next day he went to the lake called the fish to him and said i suffered thee to live now tell me where to hide myself so that the king's daughter may not see me the fish thought for a while and at last cried i have it i will shut thee up in my stomach he swallowed him and went down to the bottom of the lake the king's daughter looked through her windows and even from the eleventh did not see him and was alarmed but at length from the twelfth she saw him she ordered the fish to be caught and killed and then the youth appeared every one can imagine what a state of mind he was in she said twice thou art forgiven but be sure that thy head will be set on the hundredth post on the last day he went with a heavy heart into the country and met the fox thou knowest how to find all kinds of hiding places said he i let thee live now advise me where i shall hide myself so that the king's daughter shall not discover me that's a hard task answered the fox looking very thoughtful at length he cried i have it and went with him to a spring dipped himself in it and came out as a stall-keeper in the market and dealer in animals the youth had to dip himself in the water also and was changed into a small sea hare 
the merchant went into the town and showed the pretty little animal and many persons gathered together to see it at length the king's daughter came likewise and as she liked it very much she bought it and gave the merchant a good deal of money for it before he gave it over to her he said to it when the king's daughter goes to the window creep quickly under the braids of her hair and now the time arrived when she was to search for him she went to one window after another in turn from the first to the eleventh and did not see him when she did not see him from the twelfth either she was full of anxiety and anger and shut it down with such violence that the glass in every window shivered into a thousand pieces and the whole castle shook she went back and felt the sea hair beneath the braids of her hair then she seized it and threw it on the ground exclaiming away with thee get out of my sight it ran to the merchant and both of them hurried to the spring wherein they plunged and received back their true forms the youth thanked the fox and said the raven and the fish are idiots compared with thee thou knowest the right tune to play there is no denying that the youth went straight to the palace the princess was already expecting him and accommodated herself to her destiny the wedding was solemnized and now he was king and lord of all the kingdom he never told her where he had concealed himself for the third time and who had helped him so she believed that he had done everything by his own skill and she had a great respect for him for she thought to herself he is able to do more than i end of story number 191「Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Master Thief One day, an old man and his wife were sitting in front of a miserable house resting a while from their work. Suddenly, a splendid carriage with four black horses came driving up, and a richly dressed man descended from it. The peasant stood up, went to the great man, and asked what he wanted, and in what way he could be useful to him. The stranger stretched out his hand to the old man, and said, I want nothing but to enjoy for once a country dish. Cook me some potatoes, in the way you always have them, and then I will sit down at your table and eat them with pleasure. The peasant smiled and said, You are a count, or a prince, or perhaps even a duke. Noble gentlemen often have such fancies, but you shall have your wish. The wife went into the kitchen and began to wash and rub the potatoes, and to make them into balls, as they are eaten by the country folks. Whilst she was busy with this work, the peasant said to the stranger, Come into my garden with me for a while. I have still something to do there. He had dug some holes in the garden, and now wanted to plant some trees in them. Have you no children? asked the stranger, who could help you with your work. No, answered the peasant. I had a son, it is true, but it is long since he went out into the world. He was a ne'er-do-well, sharp and knowing, but he would learn nothing and was full of bad tricks. At last he ran away from me, and since then I have heard nothing of him. The old man took a young tree, put it in a hole, drove in a post beside it, and when he had shoveled in some earth and had trampled it firmly down, he tied the stem of the tree above, below, and in the middle fast to the post by a rope of straw. But tell me, said the stranger, why you don't tie that crooked knotted tree, which is lying in the corner there, bent down almost to the ground, to a post also, that it may grow straight as well as these? The old man smiled and said, Sir, you speak according to your knowledge. It is easy to see that you are not familiar with gardening. 
That tree there is old and misshapen. No one can make it straight now. Trees must be trained while they are young. That is how it was with your son, said the stranger. If you had trained him while he was still young, he would not have run away. Now he too must have grown hard and misshapen. Truly, it is a long time since he went away, replied the old man. He must have changed. Would you know him again if he were to come to you? asked the stranger. Hardly by his face, replied the peasant. But he has a mark about him, a birthmark on his shoulder that looks like a bean. When he had said that, the stranger pulled off his coat, bared his shoulder, and showed the peasant the bean. Good God, cried the old man. Thou art really my son. And love for his child stirred in his heart. But, he added, how canst thou be my son? Thou hast become a great lord, and livest in wealth and luxury. How hast thou contrived to do that? Ah, father, answered the son, the young tree was bound to no post and has grown crooked. Now it is too old. It will never be straight again. How have I got all that? I have become a thief. But do not be alarmed. I am a master thief. For me, there are neither locks nor bolts. Whatsoever I desire is mine. Do not imagine that I steal like a common thief. I only take some of the superfluity of the rich. Poor people are safe. I would rather give to them than take anything from them. It is the same with anything which I can have without trouble, cunning, and dexterity. I never touch it. Alas, my son, said the father, it still does not please me. A thief is still a thief. I tell thee, it will end badly. He took him to his mother, and when she heard that was her son, she wept for joy. But when he told her that he had become a master thief, two streams flowed down over her face. At length, she said, Even if he has become a thief, he is still my son, and my eyes have beheld him once more. They sat down to table, and once again he ate with his parents the wretched food which he had not eaten for so long. The father said, If our lord, the count up there in the castle, learns who thou art, and what trade thou followest, he will not take thee in his arms and cradle thee in them, as he did when he held thee at the font, but will cause thee to swing from a halter. Be easy, father. He will do me no harm, for I understand my trade. I will go to him myself this very day. When evening drew near, the master thief seated himself in his carriage and drove to the castle. The count received him civilly, for he took him for a distinguished man. When, however, the stranger made himself known, the count turned pale and was quite silent for some time. At length he said, Thou art my godson, and on that account mercy shall take the place of justice, and I will deal leniently with thee. Since thou pridest thyself on being a master thief, I will put thy art to the proof. But if thou dost not stand the test, Thou must marry the rope-maker's daughter, and the croaking of the raven must be thy music on the occasion. Lord Count, answered the master thief, think of three things, as difficult as you like, and if I do not perform your tasks, do with me what you will. The Count reflected for some minutes, and then said, Well, then, in the first place, thou shalt steal the horse I keep for my own riding, out of the stable. In the next, thou shalt steal the sheet from beneath the bodies of my wife and myself when we are asleep, without our observing it, and the wedding ring of my wife as well. Thirdly, and lastly, thou shalt steal away out of the church the parson and clerk. Mark what I am saying, for thy life depends on it. The master thief went to the nearest town. There he bought the clothes of an old peasant woman and put them on. Then he stained his face brown and painted wrinkles on it as well, so that no one could have recognized him. Then 
he filled a small cask with old hungry wine, in which was mixed a powerful sleeping drink. He put the cask in a basket, which he took on his back, and walked with slow and tottering steps to the Count's castle. It was already dark when he arrived. He sat down on a stone in the courtyard, and began to cough like an asthmatic old woman, and to rub his hands as if he were cold. In front of the door of the stable, some soldiers were lying round a fire. One of them observed the woman, and called out to her, Come nearer, old mother, and warm thyself beside us. After all, thou hast no bed for the night, and must take one where thou canst find it. The old woman tottered up to them, begged them to lift the basket from her back, and sat down beside them at the fire. "'What hast thou gotten thy little cask, old lady?' asked one. "'A good mouthful of wine,' she answered. "'I live by trade. For money and fair words I am quite ready to let you have a glass.' "'Let us have it here, then,' said the soldier. And when he had tasted one glass, he said, "'When wine is good, I like another glass,' and had another poured out for himself, and the rest followed his example." "'Hello, comrades,' cried one of them to those who were in the stable. "'Here is an old goody who has wine that is as old as herself. "'Take a draught. "'It will warm your stomachs far better than our fire.' "'The old woman carried her cask into the stable. "'One of the soldiers had seated himself on the saddled riding horse. "'Another held its bridle in his hand. "'A third had laid hold of its tail.' She poured out as much as they wanted until the spring ran dry. It was not long before the bridle fell from the hand of the one, and he fell down and began to snore. The other left hold of the tail, lay down, and snored still louder. The one who was sitting in the saddle did remain sitting, but bent his head almost down to the horse's neck, and slept and blew with his mouth like the bellows of a forge. The soldiers outside had already been asleep for a long time, and were lying on the ground motionless, as if dead. When the master thief saw that he had succeeded, he gave the first a rope in his hand instead of the bridle, and the other, who had been holding the tail, a wisp of straw. But what was he to do with the one who was sitting on the horse's back? He did not want to throw him down, for he might have awakened and have uttered a cry. He had a good idea. He unbuckled the girds of the saddle, tied a couple of ropes which were hanging to a ring on the wall fast to the saddle, and drew the sleeping rider up into the air on it. Then he twisted the rope round the posts and made it fast. He soon unloosed the horse from the chain, but if he had ridden over the stony pavement of the yard, they would have heard the noise in the castle. So he wrapped the horse's hooves in old rags led him carefully out, leapt upon him, and galloped off. When day broke, the master galloped to the castle on the stolen horse. The count had just got up, and was looking out of the window. "'Good morning, Sir Count,' he cried to him. "'Here is the horse, which I have got safely out of the stable. Just look how beautifully your soldiers are lying there sleeping. And if you will but go into the stable, you will see how comfortable your watchers have made it for themselves. The Count could not help laughing. Then he said, For once thou hast succeeded, but things won't go so well the second time, and I warn thee that if thou comest before me as a thief, I will handle thee as I would a thief. When the Countess went to bed that night, she closed her hand with the wedding ring tightly together, and the Count said, All the doors are locked and bolted. I will keep awake and wait for the thief. But if he gets in by the window, I will shoot him. The master thief, however, went in the dark to the gallows, cut a poor sinner who was hanging there down from the halter, and carried him on his back to the castle. Then he set a ladder up to the bedroom, put the dead body on his shoulders, and began to climb up. When he had got so high that the head of the dead man showed at the window, the count who was watching in his bed, fired a pistol at him, and immediately the master let the poor sinner fall down, and hid himself in one corner. 
The night was sufficiently lighted by the moon for the master to see distinctly how the count got out of the window, onto the ladder, came down, carried the dead body into the garden, and began to dig a hole in which to light it. Now, thought the thief, the favorable moment has come, stole nimbly out of his corner, and climbed up the ladder straight into the countess's bedroom. Dear wife, he began in the count's voice, the thief is dead, but after all, he is my godson, and has been more of a scapegrace than a villain. I will not put him to open shame. Besides, I am sorry for the parents. I will bury him myself before daybreak, in the garden that the thing may not be known. So give me the sheet, I will wrap up the body in it, and bury him as a dog buries things by scratching. The countess gave him the sheet. I tell you what, continued the thief, I have a fit of magnanimity on me. Give me the ring, too. The unhappy man risked his life for it, so he may take it with him into his grave. She would not gainsay the count, and although she did it unwillingly, she drew the ring from her finger and gave it to him. The thief made off with both these things and reached home safely before the count in the garden had finished his work of burying. What a long face the count did pull when the master came next morning, and brought him the sheet and the ring. Art thou a wizard? said he. Who has fetched thee out of the grave in which I myself laid thee, and brought thee to life again? You did not bury me, said the thief, but the poor sinner on the gallows. And he told him exactly how everything had happened, and the count was forced to own to him, that he was a clever, crafty thief. But thou hast not reached the end yet, he added. Thou hast still to perform the third task, and if thou dost not succeed in that, all is of no use. The master smiled and returned no answer. When night had fallen, he went with a long sack on his back, a bundle under his arms, and a lantern in his hand to the village church. In the sack, he had some crabs, and in the bundle, short wax candles. He sat down in the churchyard, took out a crab, and stuck a wax candle on his back. Then he lighted the little light, put the crab on the ground, and let it creep about. He took a second out of the sack, and treated it in the same way, and so on until the last was out of the sack. Hereupon he put on a long black garment that looked like a monk's cowl, and stuck a gray beard on his chin. When at last he was quite unrecognizable, he took the sack in which the crabs had been, went into the church, and ascended the pulpit. The clock in the tower was just striking twelve. When the last stroke had sounded, he cried with a loud and piercing voice, Hearken, sinful men! The end of all things has come. The last day is at hand. Hearken, hearken. Whosoever wishes to go to heaven with me must creep into the sack. I am Peter, who opens and shuts the gate of heaven. Behold how the dead outside there in the churchyard are wandering about collecting their bones. Come, come, and creep into the sack. The world is about to be destroyed. The cry echoed through the whole village. The parson and clerk who lived nearest to the church heard it first, and when they saw the lights which were moving about the churchyard, they observed that something unusual was going on, and went into the church. They listened to the sermon for a while, and then the clerk nudged the parson and said, It would not be amiss if we were to use the opportunity together and before the dawning of the last day, find an easy way of getting to heaven. To tell the truth, answered the parson, that is what I myself have been thinking. So, if you are inclined, we will set out on our way. Yes, answered the clerk, but you, the pastor, have the precedence. I will follow. So, the parson went first and ascended the pulpit where the master opened his sack. The parson crept in first and then the clerk. The master immediately tied up the sack tightly, seized it by the middle, and dragged it down the pulpit steps. And whenever the heads of the two fools bumped against the steps, he cried, We are going over the mountains. Then 
he drew them through the village in the same way, and when they were passing through puddles, he cried, Now we are going through wet clouds. And when at last he was dragging them up the steps of the castle, he cried, Now we are on the steps of heaven, and will soon be in the outer court. When he had got to the top, he pushed the sack into the pigeon house, and when the pigeons fluttered about, he said, Hark how glad the angels are, and how they are flapping their wings. Then he bolted the door upon them and went away. Next morning he went to the count and told him that he had performed the third task also, and had carried the parson and clerk out of the church. Where hast thou left them? asked the Lord. They are lying upstairs in a sack in the pigeon house, and imagine that they are in heaven. The count went up himself and convinced himself that the master had told the truth. When he had delivered the parson and clerk from their captivity, he said, Thou art an arch thief, and hast won thy wager. For once thou escapest with a whole skin, but see that thou leavest my land, for if ever thou settest foot on it again, thou mayst count on thy elevation to the gallows. The arch thief took leave of his parents, once more went forth into the wide world, and no one has ever heard of him since. End of 192